Welcome back to day two of the International Women's Sports Summit. Thank you for being here. Um, before I talk a little bit about what's going to happen this morning, just a few logistics. Lunch today was left blank <laughs> so that everyone could get a break from the room and stretch their legs. There are some restaurants relatively nearby, but out of convenience and because some of those restaurants do require a car, uh, we have pre-purchased some sandwiches, so you can uh, pre those. Some of you prepaid; those will be set aside. There will be some available for purchase, and you can take them outside to eat wherever you want, or come back in the room. But uh, those will be available at lunch. There is a breakout session, so after you get your lunch, you can join. Kara Dansky is going to be hosting a breakout session: progressive women, progressive politics. How do we talk about this? Um, it's going to be in the room that's blocked off. I don't know what you call those. The small room right outside the door on the left, and you'll find your way in there. Um, if you signed up for it, please go. But if the, there's room, then you know, you're welcome to join as well. Finally, we've this, we're at altitude, and it is dry, so please drink water. It's a little bit hidden, but in the open area back there on the far left, keep yourself hydrated, okay? Um, so taking today, we're going to kick off with a powerhouse of speakers uh, discussing governing body roles in policy, including how ethics, data, and science need to inform good policy in, in our sports. We have split this session in half, so there will be a break around 10.15, but our whole morning is dedicated to the issues around um, good sports policy and the information that should be used to inform them. So with that, I'd like to welcome Pat Edom to introduce our first speakers. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see you all. Thank you for being here. My name is Pat Spratlin Edom, and I had the privilege of rowing at a Div Division I university due to the passage and the implementation of Title IX in the 1970s. Rowing taught me an advanced level of discipline, competitive excellence, coachability, and teamwork, all skills that advanced my selection to two Olympic teams and three world championship teams, and induction into the University of California Athletes Hall of Fame. Our society owes so much to policy-driven fairness. What are a few of the many harmful impacts to women and girls in a disenfranchising policy landscape? Silencing women and girls rather than enabling us to voice opposition to unfair or unsafe treatment. Creating unsafe spaces, reducing the opportunity to be seen by college recruiters and others as a result of being unfairly knocked off of limited podium spots, thus reducing access to college, scholarships, and economic opportunities, leaving us to reverberate in very heartbreaking stories of girls and families hurt by these policies. I joined ICONS with Cal and national teammates to learn and to support athletes, families, and federations uh, challenging the above mentioned policy changing outcomes negatively impacting women and girls in sport. It is therefore a pleasure to introduce Jen Say and John Pike to illuminate the importance of sound policies and policy advocacy. Jen Say is a USA Gymnastics National Champion and a seven-time US National Team member. She's also an author, Emmy Award-winning producer, and former global brand president for Levi's. Her 2008 bestseller, Chalked Up, explores how our athletic institutions can go awry and why they need to step up. The award-winning movie Athlete A, which um, connected the crimes of Larry Nassar to broader abuses in the Olympic movement, brought much needed attention to crises facing female athletes in gymnastics. Jen continues to speak out fearlessly and stand up for the rights of women and girls in sport. Thank you, Jen. Alongside Jen is British philosophy and ethics professor John Pike. 
He is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the UK's Open University, where he specializes in the ethics of sport and moral conflicts in sport policy. John has been a consultant to the International Olympic Committee, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, and the World Anti-Doping Agency to help them inform their positions. This morning, John will examine what happens when policies become distorted and when harms to women and girls are overlooked. We much appreciate your presence here, Jen and John. Now, now Jen. How's everyone this morning? Can you hear? Yeah, good. All right. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, you may or may not know who I am um, from that. Uh, I'm going to tell you my story because I think it's relevant to why we're all here. Um, and if you do have an idea of my story, it might be driven by headlines, which, as you all know, can often be misleading. Uh, my headline on me is that I tend to say things that are true that get me into a lot of trouble with people in positions of power. I've, I've done it two times in two different decades, two different subjects, and yes, I have found myself in a heap of trouble for it. In fact, I lost my job in uh, the spring of 2022, but now... I don't have to be afraid of anyone reporting me to my employer, and I, I don't have one, so I can say whatever, whatever I want. That, that comes with pros and cons, as you might imagine. Uh, everyone has a story, and this is mine, and I'm telling my story because I believe in storytelling. I've written two books. I've made a film. I'm making another film. Can you hear me this way? Better? Oh, okay. Ah, sorry. You don't want to have that in front of my face. Um, I think people remember stories, and I think people are inspired by stories. Facts and data are great, and we're going to hear from amazing, and I'm sure you did yesterday, incredible academics and scientists. I am not that. I am a storyteller. Um, and I think there's value in telling stories. That's what we remember. That's what we pass on. Uh, and hopefully my story uh, resonates with you. My story is an exhortation to you to speak up to not be silent, to not whisper, to stop whispering to your friends. And I think a lot of you probably already have done that, but it, you need to encourage your friends to do the same. Uh, because when we whisper in the shadows, nothing changes, and we concede the truth. You have to do the right thing. You have to speak the truth, even when there's a cost. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you there is no cost. I've certainly borne the cost of that. Um, as I said, I've lost my job. Uh, not only did I lose the job I had, I seem unable to get another one <laughs> because I am deemed pretty toxic at this point in time. Uh, but I will tell you, it hasn't been easy, but it, it is worth it. I can look myself in the mirror, and I do believe change will come. And I'm going to tell you the story about my first sort of mini, more mini cancellation. And I was ultimately redeemed. Now, it took a decade. Um, it took a long time. Uh, but, it, but it did happen. And I'm here to just say we need you, all of you, to stand up and speak the truth. And you need to encourage your friends to do it as well. I'm a former elite gymnast, as Pat mentioned. I had a very unusual childhood. Um, I, was the, uh, I, I certainly benefited from Title IX when Nadia Comaneci won gold in the 1976 Olympics. I begged my mother to take me to the nearest gym, and gyms were sprouting up all over the country. And that is, in fact, in part due to the passage of Title IX. Um, I quickly uh, learned that I loved it and that I had an aptitude for it. And by 1980, I made my first national team at just 10 years old. But it all turned <laughs> kind of south relatively quickly. Uh, my childhood was unusual. As I said, I trained six, seven, sometimes 10 hours a day. Um, for those of you who were elite athletes, competitive athletes, maybe that doesn't sound so weird. But for normal people, that's pretty bizarre. And I certainly sacrificed a childhood. But in 1986, I became the national champion. And I was an eight-time national team member. And in many ways, it was, it was worth it. Um, in many ways, it wasn't. And it got really, really tough uh, in 1986, right after I won. Why? Because of the abuse that was happening in the sport. Abusing athletes was par for the course. I would argue in many ways it still is because it hasn't changed enough yet, though it is, there is awareness of the subject, and that's what I'm going to talk about because I was certainly part of that. 
I endured a forced starvation diet of less than 400 calories a day. I was fat shamed at 98 pounds and 18 years old, did not get my period until I was 19. I trained on a broken ankle for over two years, which as you might guess, does not work so well <laughs> to this day. I limp around, you might see me limping around. Um, I was called lazy, I was called a piece of garbage, I was called a piece of, you know, expletive, all kinds of, all kinds of words. And the thing is, you start to believe that about yourself, right? Um, if, if, if you think you're working really hard and you're dragging your broken ankle around and you're told there's nothing wrong with you, you're a piece of garbage, you start to believe that about yourself. That's what's insidious. If you are starving because you have eaten nothing but an apple cut into four pieces spaced throughout the day and you're told you're fat and you eat too much and it's your fault that you're getting yelled at, you believe that about yourself as a child and you carry that into adulthood. You can only imagine how damaging that is, right? It's a pretty self-annihilating way to grow up and I struggled with that for more than 20 years. Um, I broke my femur at the 1985 World Championships. You can watch it on YouTube if you want, but I, you know, I wouldn't recommend it. I have not ever watched it, in fact, but my dad called me recently one day, having watched it for the first time, crying. I said, well, I don't know why you did that. Um, nine months later, I was sort of expected to be down and out. Uh, it's a pretty devastating injury, as you might imagine. Doctors thought it was a car accident when I was delivered to the hospital in Montreal. But nine months later, I came back and I won the USA Championships. The reason I came back so fast is because the cast was taken off too soon, and that is the reason I broke the opposing ankle. It was brave. It, it was, it sounds brave, uh, and it was to some extent, as I said, but it was also self-annihilating and incredibly damaging. When I left the sport, just a few months before the Olympic trials in 1988, I left feeling ashamed and defeated. I had PTSD, I had terrible nightmares, I thought very little of myself, I was depressed and sometimes suicidal, and I really saw felt that I had no value in the world beyond the sport that I was done with and I could no longer do, and that was clearly done with me. You know, there was no space for me in the sport anymore. I lost my ability to do it. I achieved a great deal, and I should have been proud, and I wasn't. I felt like a loser. I felt like a loser. That is because abusive athletes in my sport, gymnastics, but I think we know even beyond gymnastics, that's been exposed at this point, and that is emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. It was par for the course. And to some extent, sadly, I believe it still is. At my gym that I trained in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, two of the eight staff members were known to be sexually abusing athletes in the gym, underage athletes. Eight of the eight were emotionally and physically abusing the athletes. But we didn't have a word for that. That was just tough coaching. That's what they told us. It was tough coaching, and we believed their story. That was their story. That was not the truth. The national team coach at the time, before the Carolis took over, and I'm sure you've all heard of you know, Bella and Marta Caroli, was a man named Don Peters. He took the Olympic team in 1984 to gold, and for almost a decade, he was the coach of the national team. That's the coach I traveled around the country with. I went, not just the country, I'm sorry, the world. I went to Moscow with him, I went to France, I went to Italy, I went all over the world with this guy, and he was a sexual abuser. He was a pedophile. He coached at a club in the 70s in Connecticut. He was caught there, and he was sent packing and on his way, but welcomed to a club in California where he built the rest of his career. He was sent there sort of willingly, you know, to get him out of that club in, in Connecticut, but into another one. He went on to abuse other athletes there, one of whom was my closest friend and still is one of my closest friends to this day. It was whispered about, it was known, we all knew to stay away from this man, but you didn't speak of it because he was very well regarded. You couldn't say it out loud. He was respected in the sport as someone who was a technician. He was actually respected as the kinder, gentler coach, believe it or not, how crazy is that? And when I was sent away with him to Moscow, the athletes, we all whispered about it. Don't go alone in a room with Don. Don't, don't be left alone with Don. We knew, but you were not to speak of it out loud. And I don't know how we knew that, but we knew it. We just did. But when we whisper, the truth stays hidden and the abusers continue abusing. And he did for many, many years. We all stayed quiet, including my friend Doe, Doe Yamashiro, and in many ways, this defined 
her life for the next 20 or 30 years, that this man took advantage of her in the way that he did. We felt we didn't matter enough to speak up, and certainly you can understand that given the emotional abuse we were dealing with. We knew that the governing body and our club coaches were mostly interested in protecting the image of the sport, and the image of gymnastics then and to some extent now is shiny little happy pixies dancing around and we love it and it's fun and we have pin curls and powder puffs and you know that's the sport. Well, if you knew what was happening behind the scenes, that would be a difficult image to maintain, I would argue. It would be difficult to generate sponsorships. Uh, you know, women's gymnastics is the most watched sport in the Summer Olympics. Nobody watches it in between for whatever reason, but at the Summer Olympics, it is the most watched sport, or was last I checked. So a lot of those sponsorships become, come because of those eyeballs from women's gymnastics during the Summer Olympics. Not only did it drive sponsorships, it drove signups at the local clubs. So, you know, whether it was overtly agreed upon or just a silent agreement, Coaches, leaders at USAG, which was called USGF at the time, and leaders at the USOC all colluded to maintain this image of shiny, happy little gymnasts dancing around who were actually, by and large, at least at the elite level, but I would argue far deeper in, in, into the levels than that. Because you know what? My coaches, they coach class one, class two, class three. They didn't save the abuse for us. They coach the same way for everyone. You know, people like to say, oh, it's just an issue at the elite level. Not really. They coached everyone the same way. We felt we didn't matter enough to speak up, and so we didn't. We knew that we would not be heard, and so we didn't. And the leaders and coaches were so immersed in their way of operating, they called it tough coaching. Now, did they believe this or did they not? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I think many did. I think they, the line was so blurry. This is how athletes had been coached for so long. And let me be clear, it wasn't brought here by the Carolis. I started training in the U.S. in 1976. They didn't come for, you know, more, you know, quite a few years after that. It was already this way. Don was already coaching this way in the United States. It just wasn't as effective. We weren't winning. <laughs> Carillis brought it here, they intensified it, and then the U.S. started winning, which meant there was even less reason to change it. So maybe it was tough coaching. They, they told us it was tough coaching. It wasn't. It was abuse, but we came to believe their story. But here's the thing. We suffered as we left the sport, and then we felt shame for suffering because we left you know, we continued to suffer. Because here's the, this is what happened. We were told, if you suffer, it is because you're weak and you don't deserve to be on the national team and you don't deserve to be competing at this level. So we believed that about ourselves. So if we left the sport and we suffered and we were depressed and anxious and had PTSD and possibly suicidal, we believed it was our own weakness and our own failures that caused that. It's a vicious cycle. That is a pretty brutal way to start college, enter your 20s, enter adulthood. And that's exactly where I was. But here, even though we accepted their story, I do believe personally the truth always outs in the end. And it did eventually. It took a very long time. It took me a long time to come forward and say the truth. But I had to. I was suffering. It was a dereliction of duty by every single adult that let this happen. Let me be clear. The parents, the parents took a lot of blame at first. The parents are sort of inculcated into the way of thinking as well. They're lied to. They still have responsibility. They're the parents. These are your children. The coaches, the USAG leaders, the USOC leaders, the press, who wrote fawning puff pieces about Bella Caroli, who was abusing kids in his own gym. Their obligation was to protect children. I don't care if they actually believe the story or they just furthered the PR. It doesn't matter to me. It was a de dereliction of duty regardless, and the result was the same that children suffered. It's especially intense in gymnastics, as you know, because it is a very young person's sport. That's starting to change a little bit. But we really believed at the time that you had this narrow window of opportunity, and if you didn't make it, by the time you were 17, you were done. Uh, Olympic teams were you know, populated with 16 and 17-year-olds solely. And so that forces even more abusive behavior. If you didn't make a national team by the time you were 10, forget about it. So that meant you don't miss a season, you don't honor an injury, you don't let yourself heal, you keep going. That's a pretty <laughs> destructive way to train. So 20 years later, in 2008, I wrote a book called Chalked Up. 
It was the first first person account of abuse in the sport. I naively sort of sat down to write it in a room by myself, and it was really just to make sense of what had happened, because I was suffering still 20 years later. I was a normal person. I had two children. I had a really good job. I think I was a vice president at Levi's at the time already, and yet I suffered this crippling self-doubt. Hi, I'm just seeing you there, Nancy. Um, I wrote about Don Peters in that book. It was a one paragraph alluding to the fact that he had raped my friend, which I knew for a fact. It wasn't my story to tell. I made sure she was okay with it. When I wrote about when I, when I wrote about all this, I you know I did sort of convince myself that it was like an open secret, not a secret secret, and that it would be okay that I wrote it all down. I also didn't think I'd get it published, but I did. I was utterly unprepared for the backlash. Social media was new. I didn't really understand this notion of like trolling and dragging across the internet. It was 2008. You know, now I am very well familiar with it, but I didn't know at the time. But my naivete is what gets me in trouble. I did learn fast that it is brutal to go first and say a true thing. I was dragged in the press across the internet and across the internet for saying things that were patently true. These coaches were abusing kids on the competition floor. It was in plain sight, and yet I was called a liar and a grifter. The CEO of USAG at the time, Steve Penny, who has since been arrested but not indicted for the cover-up involving Larry Nasser, he would call me in my workplace to try to intimidate me. I didn't answer. He left messages several times. I was not going to be intimidated by this man. I worked in a you know, very large <laughs> corporate company. I was in boardrooms. I, he, he wasn't particularly scary to me at the age of 40. He would have been at the age of 16. I was also called a liar and a grifter by the head of Gymnastics Australia, who would become the head of UK Gymnastics, Jane Allen. Now, she would be pushed out in disgrace in 2020. So I was somewhat redeemed. Her name was Jane Allen. A few years after I wrote the book, Don Peters was banned from the sport. It encouraged young women who were abused by him to come forward. USAG tried to bat them away, but they eventually became too many and too loud, and they had to do a sort of internal hearing. And they had no choice because of the pressure. It got too great at a certain point, but to ban this man from the sport. Ten years after I wrote the book, Larry Nasser, who I'm sure you all heard of, the disgraced, I will say, doctor for USAG, for Team USA Gymnastics, went to prison for sexually abusing hundreds, hundreds, we don't really know the real number, hundreds of young athletes. I was redeemed. It was very interesting. As soon as this happened, all of the gymnasts, because please keep in mind, I wasn't just criticized, smeared, and defamed by the coaches and the heads of the governing bodies. It was by the athletes themselves. That was the most hurtful part. People who I trained with, who experienced exactly what I did, came after me. Why? They wanted to protect the same image that the leaders were interested in protecting, and I think protect their own memory. It's very painful to kind of actually go down that rabbit hole and understand. Um, as soon as Larry Nasser, I, I, I think it was, it was even before he was convicted, so sometime around 2016 when the story started to break, all the athletes started coming to my defense and saying, oh, Jen Say said it. She said it. We stood with her all along. They did not. I remember. I welcome you to the fight now, but I remember you weren't there. And in fact, you said some pretty, really awful things. But I went from a pariah in gymnastics and the overall Olympic movement to a hero. Overnight, I was uncanceled, if that is a thing. I should note I am not especially brave. You have to understand what it is like to train in gymnastics. It is punishing. The obedience instilled in you is near total. It is not easy for me to screw up my courage and say a true thing and deal with this kind of dragging and pushback and vilification. It is very hard. I have to talk to myself. I have to force myself to do it. If I can do it, an obedient former elite gymnast, I know that you can do it. I'm not a contrarian either. I'm not a contrarian by nature either. I actually like being liked. I like to build bridges. I tend to be very diplomatic. I think this enabled me to be pretty successful in, in, in uh, the corporate world as a woman, which is not always easy and certainly wasn't easy coming up in the 90s. My husband, on the other hand, he's a fighter. He likes to fight with everyone. Uh, that's not me. I hate it. 
Uh, but I will endure the slings and arrows of a vicious mob to stand by children and my right to say a true thing. He heck, my right to say a false thing. I get to say it. Free speech is a right guaranteed in the Constitution. In 2018, when I was redeemed with the Nasser conviction, I didn't realize, was, I realized that I was about to go through it all over again. I'm not going to get into that story. We're not, and that, that is a bit what I am more known for, and I saw my book out there. That is what that second book is about. But you know, this second time was far worse, but it's made me stronger. So that's good. <laughs> that's good. There's a silver lining. Um, what happened is, after 21 years at Levi's, 2020 came. Um, and in March 2020, the public schools in San Francisco and across the country shut down. My children, I have four children, um, all go or went to public schools, some are grown, public universities, and I was very outspoken about the harms that would be done to children from closed public schools. From the beginning, from March 13th, that was the date, 2020. Folks didn't like it, my peers didn't like it, though they were sending their own children to in-person private school, they wanted me to stop talking about this. We had an internal debate conflict <laughs> for two years, and eventually I was told there was no longer a place for me at the company. Um, so that was the second time that I stood up for truth, and we now know that was the truth. Closed public schools, they were closed in my city of San Francisco for 18 months, were going to be harmful to children. That is true. The learning loss, the isolation, the mental health impacts, all of that has borne itself out. I said a thing, I bore the brunt, and I was punished. I no longer have a job. But now I am free to say whatever I want. <laughs> in 2020, I made a film called Athlete A. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to watch it. It won an Emmy Award for Best Investigative Documentary. And it really connects the crimes of Larry Nassar to the broader culture of abuse. My, my concern, and it is, it is great that those crimes were exposed. Arguably, it should have happened way sooner. He did this for 30 years. But he was being dismissed as one bad apple. And the fact is, there is rot in that sport, and it is not the result of him being one bad apple. It's the result of the coaching condi conditions that allow for abuse to happen. When a child is emotionally and physically abused, they are more prone <clears throat> to experience and being vulnerable to sexual abuse. Excuse me. <clears throat> That is what I sought to do. And what happened with the release of the movie is that athletes, for the very first time, came forward. They saw themselves in this story, athletes who thought they'd never been abused, but had suffered once they finished the sport or while they were in it in the same way that I had. They saw themselves in it. They said, OK, I wasn't sexually abused, but I dealt with all that other stuff, that name calling, that fat shaming. I was forced to train on broken bones. That is abuse, too. They finally saw themselves in that story, and they came together across the world in 10 different countries to demand change. They used a hashtag gymnast alliance. They used a hashtag athlete alliance. Some athletes outside of gymnastics also responded. And change started to happen. It was a grassroots movement of athletes who finally found their voices. And they said, no more. Is it perfect? It certainly is not. The, 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 you know, this is a, a cultural rot. They have been doing it this way for 30, 40, 50 years. My coaches, they just celebrated the 50th anniversary of their gym. They don't know another way. We need those folks to leave, and we need new coaches to come in. But it is what needed to happen. We needed the athletes to demand change. Jane Allen at UK Gymnastics was forced out, finally, for allowing abuse in the UK for many, many years under her watch, for looking the other way and allowing it to happen. I would ask, though, what if in 2008, when my book first came out, chalked up my first book, rather than smearing me and vilifying me in the press, if USAG had listened and said, wait a minute, people have been talking about the Strausses, my coaches, for years. Maybe we need to look into this. Maybe we should not uh, silence the messenger, smear and demonize the messenger. Maybe we should investigate how many athletes would have been saved from abuse. Because it was another 10 years before investigations started to happen. How many more athletes would have been saved? We need to demand that they listen to us. Our voices matter. We need to start a movement, each one of us that cares about girls and women's sports. How do you start a movement? What do you call it? You don't. You just start. 
you just start to speak up. You don't brand it, you don't over strategize, you go, you start. That is on us to start and encourage our friends to do the same. We need to be brave and we need to stand up. And I will tell you, you have to ignore the names that they will call you. You have to compartmentalize it and you have to set it off to the side. When people started calling me names amongst my COVID dissenting, I, I at first tried to explain myself. The main name I was called was racist. And you might go, how is it racist to say public schools should be open? Well, the rationale was, if you want the public schools to open, you don't care if children of color die. When in reality, the fact is those were the children who were being harmed the most because the wealthy white children were going to private school in person. They were doing pods at home. So the, the reality of it was the opposite was true. But I was almost stopped in my tracks. I didn't want to be called that name. That's a horrible name. But it was not grounded in truth, and I had to coach myself through that. My two oldest children are mixed race. I was the executive sponsor of the Black Employee Resource Group at Levi's. I've marched for equality for 30 years. It wasn't true, and I had to coach myself through that, that the name calling is a way to silence you. And when they realize you won't be silenced, they realize it will silence others, because those people don't want to be called that. But we need to encourage them to come out. We need to laugh when they call us names, or at least bat them away and let it roll off your back because it's not the truth. I don't actually think anybody really thought I was a racist. I really don't. There was nothing about my life, the arc of my life, that would have made that true. But it's a, it's a horrible thing. And nobody wants an executive leading a team of thousands of people at a company who is known to be a racist, right? That's terrible. You can't have that. And so in a sense, it is very effective. But you still have to bat it away. And it didn't keep me quiet but it kept others quiet for far too long. Do not let them further these lies about you, about the truth in women's sports. Don't be afraid of being called names. You have to endure it. It sucks. I, you know, it does. I'm not going to lie. It really does. But if we deny biology, there is no other endpoint than the elimination of sex-based categories in sports. That's where this goes when you play this out. There will be no more girls in women's sports. That's what happens. There will be no more educational opportunities that come along with sports, which I was afforded because of Title IX. There will be no more medals. There will be no more competing for girls and women on a fair and even playing ground. Why would you sign up if you know it's not going to be fair? That's where this goes if we don't stand up. So you have a responsibility to protect children and to protect women's sports, every one of you. You have a responsibility. You cannot allow them to say there is no such thing as biological advantage for males. It's just not true. I don't need to be a doctor to know that. I don't need to be an academic. I don't need to be a researcher. I don't need to be a journalist. Just like I didn't need to be any of those things to say that if we shut children out of school, poor children in particular, because in San Francisco, 60% of the children in public schools were low income, are low income. I don't need to be, I don't need qualifications to know that, that that is going to be harmful. So don't be afraid, don't be careful. Please say a true thing, always be respectful, always be dignified, but do it now and do it with me. You have a responsibility not to forsake women and girls. You have a responsibility to allow them the same opportunities that you had when you were competing. Stop whispering to your friends encourage, exhort your friends to stop whispering as well, because I believe we are a majority, but people are afraid. People ask me all the time, why is this the hill you were willing to die on? They mean COVID and kids, not this. I will say I don't know that I would have spoken out on this if I hadn't been so completely, utterly canceled because of that. I have nothing to lose at this point. I got no job. I got no reputation. I am unemployable. Um, that's how difficult this issue is. But when people ask me, why is this the hill you were willing to die on? And I say, you mean free speech and children? That hill? <laughs> My response is simply, why weren't you? Do you even have one? <laughs> if you aren't willing to stand up for children, you simply have no hill. And you need to wrestle with that.
I can look myself in the mirror every day despite my unemployed status and know that I did the right thing. I know I speak the truth. I know I was always respectful. I know I spoke informed by data and facts. I was kind. I know the name calling is false and so I keep going and I would ask that you all keep going with me. Thank you. Let me just, um, hi, um, thanks first of all, sorry, I'm John Pike, I'm, um, I'm a philosopher of sport, um, and you may know me as Run Think Right on Twitter. Um, John, can I get you to move the microphone closer to you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, try that, is that better? Okay, so, um, what I'm going to talk about today is the IOC's theory of fairness in sport as it's uh, encapsulated in the framework document, the 2022 framework document. I suppose this is a know your enemy uh, presentation. Uh, they have a, an understanding of fairness in sport and I think it's wrong and I want to explain to you why I think it's wrong. Uh, it's called, or I have called it, the meaningful competition theory, and published a paper in it or on it earlier this earlier this year, uh, which is open access. Uh, anyone can read it online. So, although I've got quite a few slides with quite a lot of words on in that terrible academic way, don't worry too much you can go straight to the paper and have a look at it uh, if you wish. So it's, it's a critique of the framework document on fairness, inclusion, and non-discrimination. And if the IOC get to look at this, I think you should withdraw that paper because it doesn't make sense. Okay, so um, the account built into the IOC's position comes from Joanna Harper and uh, Yanis Pitsiladis, and it's f most fully worked out in uh, a paper called Implications of the Third Gender in Elite Sport, where they were trying to argue for something like an, a, a, a category of athletic woman. But you don't need to worry too much about the third gender stuff. This is what they say. Uh, and I can't. Uh, the, the intention for separating athletes into male and female categories is to provide women athletes with meaningful competition. It would therefore be uh, equally reasonable, equally to what, I don't know, uh, equally reasonable to allow transgender or intersex women to compete with other female athletes, if and only if, the inclusion of these athletes did not unduly alter the playing field for other women. If one can minimize the athletic advantages uh, potentially held by gender variant athletes, then one can satisfy this requirement. It may not be necessary or even possible to eliminate all individual advantages held by a transgender or intersex woman. So that's the position. It makes no sense. And I want to explain why it makes no sense. Uh, but look at a few features of it. First of all, we've got, we've got a name, meaningful competition. Uh, we've got the term intersex being used, which is a term I think we should avoid. We've got a comparison between trans 
women or gender variant women and other women or other female athletes. That is, there's an implicit ca uh, claim there that trans women are female, right? Now, if you take that, I mean, what, one of the reasons this, this document is so terrible is it doesn't build out, it doesn't follow through the logic of its own argument. Let's suppose something that's completely false. Let's suppose that trans women are female. Now, I am in favor of anyone who is, in, who is female being eligible for female sport. If trans women are female, which is the claim here, then trans women ought to be automatically eligible for female sport. But this is a paper arguing for testosterone level restrictions, which means they know that they're adding an additional barrier if they had the courage of their convictions, and to be fair, Rachel McKinnon sometimes argues this line, if trans women are women, if trans women are female, then they should be straightforwardly eligible for female sport. You don't need this additional step of testosterone level reduction. So they don't even, they, they lack the courage of their convictions here. It's a problematic theory. Um, whether, how much you can minimize athletic advantages is an empirical matter. It depends on certain sorts of treatment. Uh, fairness in sport for women, I argue, uh, depends on eliminating male advantages, not minimizing male advantages. And of course, they say it may not be necessary or even possible to eliminate all individual advantages held by a transgender or intersex woman. Um, any remaining advantages ought to be uh, considered as one component of their, uh, their unique makeup. Now, contrast this with the standard understanding of uh, fairness in sport. And that's that fair equality of opportunity requires a female category. The word fair is important here because equality of opportunity might be provided in some sense by uh, mixed competition. We might say, for example, if everyone competes in 100 meters, all you have to do, males and females, all you have to do is run 9.6 seconds and you'll win. Any woman who runs 9.6 seconds will win. Okay. There's an equal opportunity. Anyone, regardless of sex, who runs 9.6 seconds can win. So equality of opportunity is not quite enough. What we're after is what we in the trade call FEOPS, F-E-O-P-S, fair equality of opportunity. Fair equality of opportunity means that the opportunities of uh, sporting success are available equally to men and women, to males and females. So in this world, maybe in a different world where we had different bodies or there were three sexes or whatever, we'd organize, sex, uh, we'd organize sport differently. But in this world with the bodies that we have, we need a uh, separate female competition. Okay, and we don't present this as a kind of abstract capital F fairness account that we've just sucked out of the air. This is an account that comes from the institutions that we already have in the world, international federations, national governing bodies that all organize sport on a sex basis, that have female and male competition. And that's real, that realizes our idea of fairness. So our idea of fairness is exemplified, is made real in the fact that we already have male and female competition. What happens in this debate is people look, lose sight of the fact that we already have male and female competition and that male and female competition is justified by our idea of fairness. So we've got an idea. Let's run with it and let's see what the implications are. Okay, in order to, un here's a bit of philosophy of sport for a, for a Saturday morning. Is it Saturday morning? Whatever day it is. 
Here's a little bit of philosophy of sport for you. Okay, so consider two types of advantage. Category advantages and competitive advantages. Now, category advantages are advantages uh, that set up competition, and competitive advantages are the advantages that are realized in competition, that are kind of battled out on the field of play. Uh, if we are sufficiently precise, the same advantage cannot be both a category and a competitive advantage. We control for certain advantages, and we allow other advantages to play themselves out. So competitive advantages are advantages like height advantage in basketball, or the advantage of being born with a very high VO2 max in endurance sport, or a wide variety of generic advantages, genetic advantages, such as those held by Michael Phelps. This is the famous Phelps gambit. And this, my, my presentation should enable you to see precisely what's wrong with the Phelps gambit. Category advantages, on the other hand, are advantages that define what a sport is. So they define the nature of the sport. So why are e-bikes banned in the Tour de France? Well, because it's a bike race, <laughs> and it's about how fast you can pedal, not you know, how big your, mo your electric motor is. They define the nature of sport as a whole in that, standardly, and there's arguments about this, but standardly we think that it's a battle of uh, not pharmacists, but athletes. So we don't uh, think that the appropri it's appropriate to have uh, uh, performance-enhancing drugs fueling the competition. And they make real and express our understanding of fairness, as I've said. So these control for major, but not all, major um, inequalities that are athlete independent. So I did nothing to earn my male physiological advantage, such as it is. Therefore, I should not be rewarded for my male physiological advantage, such as it is. But this is, this is slightly a gray area because there are genetic advantages that we don't earn, that we do get rewarded for in, in sport. We just work out and play out a, a, an understanding of fairness here. Right, that's the background. I'm a philosopher and not a sports scientist, um, but I read the sports science and I work with people like Ross and Emma uh, to understand the sports science here. And here is the kind of data that, that gets us, that, that is where, that, that tells us where we are. Uh, the papers in 2020 um, that tell us that, that we have uh, after gender-affirming therapy, uh, there is residual male advantage. So there's remaining male advantage for trans women. And we know that this is uh, true of all those factors that are affected by reducing circulating testosterone, but we also know that there's residual male advantage in skeletal changes and long levers and so on and so on. So what I'm going to do now is put together the, uh, the, the science and the conceptual stuff about uh, category and competition advantages. Here's the standard picture that we control for in some sports. Well, we control for age advantage in just about every sport because we have junior and master competitions. We control for weight advantage in some sports, uh, rowing, uh, boxing, and so on. And we control for male sex advantage in just about every sport, every athletic sport. And we let other things work themselves out. So we have this division, these two columns, and you're going to get bored with these two columns because I'm going to bang on and on and on about them. Uh, these two columns of competitive and uh, uh, category advantage, and we can play about with this. And when we play about with this, we can see what 
uh, our theory of sport is, our theory of fairness of sport is. So here is a proposal that we turn everything into competitive advantage um, and we just have a one category sporting system. And what's the problem with this? It's that blokes in their late 20s who are generally fairly tall will win everything. Certainly fairly strong and it'll vary from sport to sport, uh, but it will be blokes in their, blokes in their late 20s um, winning pretty much everything. So we think that's probably a bad idea because no one else gets a look in. So we have categories. We have categories to close up uh, these inequalities that we're not responsible for and we shouldn't be rewarded for because, funnily enough, blokes in their late 20s are not the most important people in the world and not, you know, not the most deserving of applause. All right? But we do need uh, some competitive advantages. We do need this... It, this distinction is not plucked out of the air. We do need both distinctions because look what happens if we say, let's equalize for all advantages. Uh, right, that's back to the standard position. Uh, no, uh, I've gone the wrong way. Sorry. Competitive advantages. Let's make everything a category advantage. All the advantages that I have as John Pike are different, and all the disadvantages I have as John Pike are different to all the advantages that you have as each of you. So I need to be in my own category. There are eight billion of us, and so we need eight billion categories. Now, at some point, some smart aleck is going to come up with identical twins here, and I'm going to put that off as a <laughs> footnote. But you can see the idea here, right? We could say we'll equal, we will control for everything, in which case we have 8 billion categories. So we need to have some sort of mix of competition advantage and category advantage. Here is a standard one. A mate of mine uh, wants to be a, wanted to be, says he's a philosopher, so you can't trust anything he says. He says he wants to be um, a basketball player. Uh, the trouble is he's five foot three. So he proposes, and this actually won't solve his problem, he says, why not have a basketball uh, category for people uh, uh, shorter than five foot nine? And, you know, you could. You could mess around and have that, you, you could have that sort of competition. I don't have hugely strong views either way. But we can shift these, uh, shift these um, advantages from one side to the other. Um, here, uh, back to the beginning, and here is the proposal to eliminate women's sport, right? Which is the straightforward proposal, which isn't in the IOC document. The straightforward proposal to eliminate women's sport and have everyone competing uh, regardless of sex, which is argued by a couple of wacky philosophers of sport, right? Uh, but again, back to the beginning. So let's look at combining these two things that we know about, residual male advantage and this categorization theory. Well, residual male advantage is a form of male advantage. The clue is in the, in the, in the name. So we can stick residual male advantage under male advantage. So here's the standard picture. Right now, this allows us to see the crucial mistake that the IOC have made, and it goes like that, right? Which is to say that we keep the female category, but we allow residual male advantage in the female category, although we have established male advantage as a categorical advantage and not a competition advantage. So, I'll go back to my text just to make sure I'm being 
honest, uh, sorry, to honest to what is being said by Harper and Pizzolardis. Look at the last paragraph. Any remaining advantage, we're talking about uh, residual male advantage here, any remaining advantage held by a gender variant athlete is only one component of their unique makeup. So male advantage, residual male advantage, you just happen to have. It's just one of these competition advantages that, that athletes happen to have. So I think what the IOC have done is this. And of course, well, I think that's a contradiction. Now in philosophy, one grades arguments, well, I grade arguments in the following way. Interestingly true, boringly true, <laughs> interestingly false, boringly false, not even false, right? An argument that contains a contradiction like this is not even false. Right? So, so, some reasons like, like this is a mistake. Residual male advantage is a male advantage. It should be treated as sex advantage, that's, that is, as a categorical advantage. The question we need to ask ourselves is about kinds of advantage, whether they are categorical or competitive, not about their size. All this stuff, if you've read the framework document on fairness, inclusion, and non-discrimination, all this stuff about disproportionate and proportionate advantage is stuff about size of advantage, and it's not the size of the advantage that matters. The IOC account of proportionality is irrelevant to fairness. Now, the IOC document is supposed to act as guidance to international federations. I am very pleased that the international federations have not followed the IOC document, which is one reason why the IOC should withdraw it. Um, and it, it, it's almost impossible to, to follow that guidance because, like I say, it didn't make sense. So proportionality is irrelevant. Categorical advantages should be excluded regardless of their size. Competition advantages should be included regardless of their size. Dozen e-bikes uh, give a disproportionate, so here are, here are some dumb questions. Does an e-bike give a disproportionate or proportionate advantage in the Tour de France? A lot of philosophy is about asking the right question. That's a dumb question. Does it matter whether it's a 50 watt or a 100 watt e-bike? Uh, what about microdosing? You know, microdosing with performance enhancing drugs. One consequence of this is that the um, research program at Brighton and Loughborough Universities, led by uh, Yanis Pitsilardis, which seems to be in a bit of trouble, um, isn't even asking the right question. I am not against doing more research and more science. I don't want to give my fellow academics a hard time by saying uh, you shouldn't get grants for any more research funding. But you need to ask the right question, and you're not even doing that. Um, so, here's my argument in summary, which you can't read because it's too high. Uh, male advantage matters. Uh, this is the standard view. Male advantage matters. We could, here's a possibility, we could, eliminate, we could decide that male advantage doesn't matter. We have moved beyond sex to, you know, a glorious new uh, understanding in which our sexes are as important as our eye color, so we have unisex competition. This is a coherent, it's a terrible view, but it's a coherent view. It's the view that male advantage doesn't matter. This would be unfair. I am against the abolition of women's sport. The IOC paper, the Harper proposal of meaningful competition, means considering 
uh, an advantage as both a category advantage and a competitive advantage. This means that male advantage matters, so we have women's sport, and at the same time, male advantage doesn't matter. That's a contradiction. Uh, this is incoherent. Um, right, I'm going to click through the next bit, which is, well, I'll just say, if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. If you ask where should trans women compete, are they closest to the male category or the female category in terms of certain metrics, you will get the wrong answer to this question. What you need to ask yourself is what fairness in sport consists in. Trans women are not some amorphous group of people who are strangely sexless, floating, floating above the two uh, biological categories of male and female. If you ask yourself what is fair in sport with respect to sex, and you will come up with the answer, uh, a category for people without male advantage, then it's clear that trans women should be in an open category which allows male advantage and not a female category which excludes male advantage. So, to wind up, three takeaways. There is no concept of meaningful competition such that it is fair for trans women to compete in female sport. There is no clever philosophical argument that you've all missed that, allow, that makes it fair for trans women to compete in women's sport. Believe me, well, I, I suppose I mean trust me. I, do, I have read everything that Rachel McKinnon has said about this. Someone has to. Uh, I've read everything that Joanna Harper has said about this. There is no clever argument that you've missed. There is no kind of subtle, sophisticated understanding of fairness by which it's, you know, fair for uh, male-bodied people to compete in female sport. There isn't one there. It doesn't work. You haven't missed anything. Your, step, your, your, your view is, is substantiated. And what's the last one? So organizations, this is a message to international federations, national governing bodies, Organizations that allow trans women to compete in female sport fail in an obligation that I believe that they have, which is to allow, facilitate, organize fair competition for women. I don't think that the organizations are entitled to do that. I don't think it should be allowed that these organizations fail in that obligation, because that is what they're doing. They are failing to provide a service, provide fair competition for women. I don't think that's a choice that it's legitimate to make. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much to our presenters. We're going to take a short 15-minute break if you want to get up and stretch your legs. Now we'd like to introduce Ivy League champion, Ramey Jones. Hello, everybody. My name is Ramey Jones, um, and this spring I graduated from Yale University, where I swam on the varsity swim team for all four years. In my junior season, I swam against Leah Thomas at Yale's dual meet against the University of Pennsylvania, and then again at the Ivy League Championships. I remember feeling certain that the NCAA and the Ivy League would have the backs of their female athletes. I had a lot of trust in the people that were in power. I believed that they would see what I was seeing, that allowing a male competitor in the women's category 
was clearly a violation of Title IX and of the principle of fair competition. As the season progressed, it became clear that that was not the case. Leading up to Yale's competitions against the University of Pennsylvania, my coaches pulled my team into a meeting and issued a statement discouraging us from answering questions or speaking publicly about this topic or our experience. If we chose to, we would need to run our statements by the administration. It was implied that this was a rule that we were to follow for the season, and if we did not, there would be serious repercussions. This request led to an atmosphere amongst my teammates where people were afraid to discuss what we were seeing, even amongst ourselves. At the dual meet, I came in second to Leah, and at the Ivy League championships, Leah placed first, cutting me out of finals. At the time, I was terrified to say anything. I felt as though my entire world had been shaken. Here I was at Yale, where I came to learn from inspiring professors and have enlightening conversations, where I was told that I was surrounded by the leaders of tomorrow, but simultaneously I was instructed to remain silent in the midst of an issue that was grabbing the attention of headlines daily. I remember scrolling through endless streams of comments online, demanding to hear the Ivy League women's opinions questioning everything from our body language to our consideration for women. People were outraged at our silence, and the world was looking to us to start a conversation. I felt helpless. It had been communicated to me that my voice was not welcome and not a part of this conversation. It became clear to me that the priority of my university, the Ivy League, and the NCAA was to retain their images as inclusive and accepting rather than prioritizing the basic underlying principle of fairness for sports, for their women. Everything that we went through in the 2022 to 2023 NCAA season could have been avoided by good policies rooted in science. Our gut instincts and our lived experiences tell us that men competing against women is not fair, and sports science reflects exactly that. Our policymakers and governing bodies of sports need to understand this fundamental truth and I am deeply grateful to scientists like our next speakers who have compiled empirical evidence demonstrating the importance of sex-separated sports and who are working for fair policies for female athletes. I am very excited to introduce World Rugby Head Scientist Ross Tucker. <laughs> Ross has his doctorate in exercise physiology and he has long focused on player welfare and safety. In addition to World Rugby, Dr. Tucker has consulted with multiple governing bodies around the world and has been a part of many of the cases at the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Ross will explain how safe and sensible policies should result from data analysis and systemic policy reviews. Ross was expected to be joined by Dr. Emma Hilton, a prize-winning developmental biologist at the University of Manchester. Emma is a founder of Sex Matters and has been an expert consultant for governing bodies and legal challenges at every level of sports. She was slated to be here in person, but due to an injury this week, she is going to join us briefly by Zoom. Emma has worked with Dr. Tucker to make sure that we are still going to hear the latest on her research. After Emma and Ross speak, Jen and John will join them for a group Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Jamie. Hi, everyone. Um, fully expected Emma to be here, um, so, I'm, so I'm missing one of my partners in, in science and crime on this issue, so I want to extend her apologies. She really, really, really wanted to be here, but you will be hearing from her a little bit later. Um, we've got, is that happening now? Okay. Sorry. You're hearing from her now. Can everyone hear me? I don't have any feedback, so I'm just going to start talking and we'll see how we go. Um, so, hello everyone. I hope you're all having a really wonderful time in Denver. I am so sorry I couldn't join. I was looking forward to it so much, to meeting new people 
and catching up again with partners in crime <laughs> like Ross. Um, yeah, I've got a back injury. It stopped me flying. Um, and the only thing I can say is if it happens to you, don't go back to weightlifting until your physio says it's okay. Um, so last year in Las Vegas, I talked to you about biology, about being male, about what happens to a male body when it loses testosterone, and of course, what that means for sport. Those males, trans women, don't get shorter, they lose a bit of muscle, they gain a bit of fat, they lose a bit of CV capacity. And nothing has happened since Vegas to change that scientific consensus. And in fact, a couple of new studies only add to that consensus. Even when trans women have been suppressing testosterone for maybe 14 years, their skeleton resolutely refuses to shrink. Their muscle mass and CV capacity is still significantly higher than in females. So from my point of view, the biology is settled. We don't see anything coming in the future that will alter this increasingly clear picture that trans women retain male advantage as a result of their male development, as a result of their male sex, and sex matters in sport. Never quick to desert a clearly sinking ship, the arguments against this settled biology have ramped up. We are seeing outright dishonest manipulations around statistics, pound for pound, trans women match females, uh, from people who are ignoring that trans women have got a lot more pounds, and that being bigger is precisely the kind of male advantage that is excluded from the female category. The spectre of Michael Phelps still looms, <laughs> um, with many people, including scientists, um, and, and philosophers still unable to understand the difference between the types of advantage that require categories and the types of advantage that separate three athletes on a podium. Happily, sports federations are starting to cut through this. Many, including the big names, are taking a scientific approach. It is necessary to have evidence that male advantage is lost. They are falling, if not quite like dominoes, but they are falling. And they are, yay, um, doing so, citing Hilton and Lumberg in their policies and reviews. But while I and Tommy and Ross have had a hand in settling the biology, this has been and remains a joint effort. Academics have a role. Here is a paper. Here are some numbers. <laughs> Here are some definitions of fairness. But it is all of us who have shoved this pendulum hard back. It is you who have leafleted and shouted through megaphones, who have written endless letters, court papers, who have written books, who have made YouTube videos and written crazy songs, who've met with representatives, who have terrorized sports federations and demanded to be heard. And many of you there are the most significant voices of all, athletes, female athletes, current and former, who have seen harm and who have been harmed by unfair and irrational policies from the very top of sports and who I've been honoured to help out by talking a lot about testicles. Um, so on that, <laughs> I'll hand you back to Ross, I think. I'm going to go and watch the rest of this lying down on my couch. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, tech team, for making that happen. And thanks, Emma, for, for doing that. And we'll see you later when the panel discussion happens. So I'll just wait for my slides, but while I do that, I just wanted to reflect. Yesterday, sat in the back quietly listening and watching, and a couple of things struck me, and then a couple more things this morning. The one is that very few people got up here and said that they want to be in this discussion and in this fight. We heard, we heard from an aspirate dentist who's put root canals on hold. 
We heard from, we've heard from a journalist who happily left The Economist. We heard from an evolutionary biologist who less happily left an institution, but has taken up a, a struggle for something that matters a great deal. And I'm a physiologist, and I didn't do a PhD to try and persuade people that male advantage is real, and simply taking testosterone away is the way to create, to create fairness. And so I'm, I'm similar to the people you heard about yesterday. And so in developing the slides that I wanted to share with you today, which um, hopefully are on the way, yes? I wanted to frame this and also say that when Kim, Kim said, will you come and talk about the biology? And I d we did this, Emma and I, last year in Las Vegas. And it's, this, it's the same stuff. And I said to Kim, but there's not really anything new that's happening. Is this uh, able to advance? Yeah, the yeah I'm trying. Give us a second here, Ross. Okay. Where was I? I said, I said Kim, there's not, there's not really anything new. This is just going to be going back to the same. It's like watching a rerun. And, and Emma's actually pointed that out to you as well, is that there's really not much has happened on the science well, side. The there's been tremendous progress from some of the sports federations. But that's not because they've seen new science in the last 12 months. That's because they've been forced to look at the science that was on the table the whole time and why have they been forced to look at that is because they've been compelled to by the voices of women like yourselves who've asked them and insisted that they pay attention to it. So what I would very much like for this to become, this conference, I said to Kim, this is the last time I want to do this talk. <laughs> I want to do this talk one more, one more time. And then from then on, the next time we do it, we want to talk about the actual icons in women's sport, the athletes themselves. Tomorrow, the Tour de France farm starts in, in Clermont in France. The men's race finishes and the women's race starts. I'd far rather be spending my physiological time and expertise explaining to you about cycling performance. They even talk about doping ahead of the stuff we had to talk about here. The Women's World Cup, last night we had some drinks and dinner in the yard house and we watched the U.S. kick off their World Cup defense. Maybe in the next few weeks, the uh, women's title, well, that seems to potentially be working. Maybe in the next few weeks we can celebrate the actual on-field performances instead of discussing who shouldn't and should be on that field. That would be a real privilege to come back one day and be able to talk to you about that side of the physiology as opposed to this. But nevertheless, this is where we are. So this is a presentation in celebration of biological reality and sporting icons who I hope that we'll one day be able to talk about a little bit more, like Demi Vollering on the left, like the English lionesses, who perhaps will dethrone the US in New Zealand in a few weeks' time. Maybe not. I'm not from England, by the way. We have a team in the, in the tournament also, but we have no chance of dethroning anyone. And so this is... There we go. This is not working as smoothly as I'd hoped. So what I wanted to do was to talk to you a little bit, looking back through the lens of the scientific conversation over the last four years, to where we are today and then to, to what might happen next. And the journey starts in 2019, which is when all, all Olympic sports were pretty much under the existing IOC guideline. And Linda yesterday shared with you how that guideline had existed. This was the 2015 policy at the time. And basically, it amounted to testosterone suppression. And so, in hindsight, most of you would not have known what was happening behind the closed doors of the IOC as they were setting up those policies and creating these, these eligibility requirements into women's sport. And the concept at the time, the belief system at the time, was testosterone suppression works. And looking in hindsight now, this was very much like the dark ages. It was happening with no light on it. And slowly but surely, and you've heard from a couple of people, a door was being pushed open to let a little bit of light into that conversation. And at this point, it's worth acknowledging, powerlifting were the first sport that I saw stand up and say, we need a policy that keeps male advantage out of women's sport. No good deed going unpunished, powerlifting now in a big lawsuit. And so we knew potentially that that would happen. But they were the first. And so hat tip to powerlifting, sitting in the back right of the room for that. What, what has happened and started to happen was this emerging light. Now, for myself, I was in the darkness then. I hadn't gotten involved in this issue. But being from South Africa, the issue that had been in the headlines was the Castor Semenya DSD one, which has become 
well, at the time, from 2009 to 2019, became the main area in which I was involved in the concept of male advantage in women's sport, and which has, which has undermined and detracted from the trans conversation and continues to do, and perhaps we'll discuss that a little bit later on when we have the panel discussion. What happened next was we went into 2020, and that was kind of like my first foray into the trans issue in sport. And I was, as you've heard in the introduction, um, working with World Rugby on research. My main focus is concussion prevention and injury prevention and management in the sport. But World Rugby had just come into the Olympic family. Our first Olympics were in 2016. And we had begun to receive emails and calls from concerned parents and referees and some players about what we were doing around trans women who were playing women's rugby. And so we said, all right, we need, to, we need to organize a meeting. And that meeting was held in February 2020. We got it in just in time before the world sort of shut down. And this is a photograph of all the delegates who were at that meeting. Sorry, the click is not working as smoothly as I'd hoped. You'll see there, for instance, Emma's in that photograph. John Pike, who you've just heard from. We, we brought together a group of people. And I wanted to talk about the concept behind this meeting, because I think it was an important element of the scientific process, was how it was brought about. The guiding principle of that meeting was to hear all arguments from all sides without prejudice. Now, yesterday Helen spoke in response to a question about what it is that we need to ensure exists, and she spoke about how you need a culture. Rugby maybe serendipitously had created a culture that was encapsulated by something we reminded ourselves very often of, and that was evidence, not emotion. And that came about because, as you may know from your American football, there's a lot of pressure on contact sports around concussion and the later in life consequences. And rugby found itself squarely in the firing line for that issue. And then when we had to confront this one, we said, well, the same principle is true. We need evidence, not emotion. We, we understood that there's a ton of emotion around this issue, but what does the evidence actually say? And then we said, well, the best way to get that out is to bring a group of people who are going to share with us that evidence, not just from the world of science, but from the legal realm, the medical realm, the ethical realm, and so forth. And so it's, let's hear what you have to say, and then whatever we decide. Because I think everyone knew, even then, that you were going to ultimately make a choice, because it's obviously a colliding rights issue. And whether you can reconcile those colliding rights or not was the question. So we said, let's hear from everyone, and then we can be informed and know what we were doing and why we were choosing to do it. And so it was set up. Emma was one, as, as you've just seen in the photograph, one of the people who was invited. Uh, she represented science and medicine. We had Tommy Lundberg from Sweden. Uh, Joanna Harper presented at that. We had legal experts. We had a barrister. We had a human rights lawyer. We had ethical experts. John Pike was there for that reason. We had representation from the affected groups. Now, obviously, you can imagine very quickly, it split into two sides. There was the groups arguing for female-only sports, and then there were those who were arguing for trans women inclusion. And we set it up by design to function kind of like a court case where we, used, where we could hear from two opposing expert witnesses on a subject, science or medicine, whatever. And then the idea was to interrogate those questions and to try and ask them to respond to one another. So let's hear what happens when scientists debate it among themselves and we could be the onlookers watching a tennis match, in effect, about the scientific evidence. Let's watch the tennis match between the legal experts, one arguing for safety issues, one arguing for human rights issues. Let's hear from legal experts giving insights on science and vice versa. So it was meant, it was constructed as quite a dynamic engagement. And the reason I'm saying that is because I know that a lot of sports who have as yet not committed to a policy might be thinking about this. I think this was a really important thing for us to have done because it shone a light on el every element of the argument from multiple directions. Without that, you can only ever consider one argument at a time in isolation. And I don't think that we would have arrived at the understanding and the position that we did as a consequence. I'll tell you what the outcome of, the, the most profound outcome of that was in a moment. So let's just park that for now. Then the next thing that happened, if this eventually moves on, there we go, is the, the, the second principle behind that was transparency. We said to every single person that nothing in support of your position should be said if you're not happy to say it for everyone to hear. There's no reason. And we've seen 
subsequently documents produced without authors, people not willing to put their names to arguments. That's not good enough in a debate like this. If you're, can't, if you're not willing to say something and put it in publicly and stand behind it, then it's not really worth putting out there. That's how science works. It has to be transparent. And so every presentation was made on, available online. You can still find them now. We conducted a survey in the women's game and shared those results. What we couldn't get was permission for the video. We wanted to actually film every presentation and make it available. Couldn't happen, unfortunately. And we couldn't get agreement to have the media present. <laughs> Part of me wanted to just have this thing as a massive public debate with media in attendance and, and stream it live and so on. But people were reluctant to do that. But nevertheless, we managed to get some things done. And the main outcome is, and this is where I'm going to start getting into some data, is that it was recognized that male advantage was real and that it was significant. It can be divided and assessed in any number of ways, and I'm going to get into some of those. And most importantly, that when testosterone levels are suppressed, there is only limited reduction or removal of those male advantages. And here we are half a dozen such examples. So the way to read that is that the, the, the total length of the bar was the initial male advantage, 20 to 40 percent, for instance, in mass, lean mass, mass and volume strength, and then the dark blue is how much you could reverse it. And so unless, the principle being that unless this dark blue, this reversal runs all the way back to zero, there's residual male advantage. Now, we are a sport that has significant player welfare concerns. Player, player welfare is the number one priority. It's become almost a joke <laughs> within world rugby because it gets said so often, it's become a cliche. But that's because it's true. And so that what then happened was, and, and this was maybe one of the key turning points, is that John spoke at that um, meeting and introduced the concept of lexical ordering to us. Do you remember this, John? Do you, do you have a microphone? Get, can someone get John a microphone, please? Because it's far better you hear it from the expert than from me. And, and so what we'd, what we'd realized is that as a sport, and everyone knew this, we had, we had various responsibilities. We had to put on a sport that was fair, safe, and inclusive. Now, the word inclusive is loaded because it, it became owned by one side, not the other. We'll get to that a little bit later. And so it was quite clear that there was going to be this tension between those three imperatives. And John introduced a concept that helped us think about how we ranked those. So John, you tell us what lexical ordering is. Okay, so lexical ordering is the sort of ordering you have in a dictionary. So you rank everything by, you rank the words by their first letter. Uh, so A, all the words beginning with A come before all the words beginning with B, but then you rank aardvark before abacus. Uh, so you take the second criterion, the second kind of value, and you rank everything after the first value. I'm not explaining this terribly well. It's, it's in the paper. Um, it's a t t it derives from John Rawls, but it's, it's a bit like a decision tree. You do the first thing, then the second thing, then the third thing. So what I argued was, first of all, your obligation is to make rugby safe. Uh, so you wouldn't introduce a proposal that was fair but not safe. And of course, there's a question about you know, how safe and what people consent to and so on. Uh, but you, so rugby needs to be inclusive, but it needs to be inclusive as the third kind of variable, the third value, after we've ensured that it's safe and fair. Thank you. So, and, and, and it's difficult to, to put you in the frame of what it was like to hear that expressed, because you can imagine, we, we knew that we'd have to take this to a board and the executives and the councils and all the decision makers and then all the member unions of World Rugby around the world. And we'd have to say to them, look, this is why we've done what we've done and how we've chosen it. And as I just sort of semi-joked about, we, we have very much prioritized player welfare. Every meeting that happens at World Rugby at the executive or the board level starts with a session on player welfare. And myself and the chief medical officer go in first. It's the first item on the agenda. So for us to make the position to say that player welfare is the number one responsibility, and therefore if in this debate we have to think about how we order and rank priorities instead of balancing them, the, the, well, it's not the opportunity, it's the obligation to put safety first was, was obvious. And so, and so, we spent, so we spent a couple of days hearing from the experts and we said, well, 
the IOC has said the following, and this was from that IOC document at the time. This was what was in play. And you'll get an example of this weird tension and this irreconcilable balance that, was, that was people were trying to, trying to find. Um, struggling with the remote here, sorry. So it is necessary to ensure insofar as possible that trans athletes are not excluded from the opportunity to participate in sporting competition. That was the IOC's words. In the same document, the overriding sporting objective is and remains the guarantee of fair competition. So those, <laughs> those two things seem at odds with one another. And the, the bottom one seems to me to override the top one because it literally says the overriding sporting objective. So the IOC had given these, this very conflicted message, but when you start to put the two arguments, the scientific arguments for and against safety, inclusion, fairness up against one another, it becomes very clear and it was very clear to us that we couldn't balance those two things. We had to choose and we had to start making uh, decisions around what we were going to prioritize. And given that there was no scientific evidence at all that you could remove male biological advantages, only evidence for retention, even with its limitations. No one was pretending that that evidence was perfect or complete, but there were limitations. didn't make a difference to the concept or the suggestion then the conclusion was that we could not do anything but continue with a safety prioritization. Now, that's where we ended, and I'm going to come back to that, because our part of what we are then committed to do was review it in three years' time, and that comes up now in October. So we will sit down in October and have a discussion again, and I want to share, I'll, when I end this presentation, I'll tell you what we're going to consider at that point. But why does this tension exist in the first place? Now, this is the bit where I start telling you the obvious, because you all know this. I recognized it yesterday. You know this. And this is the bit where, you, in your gut, it's so obvious, yet it still had to be presented and explained. If we take one of the sports where the differences between males and females is the smallest, we see a range of performance differences between 9.5% and the marathons around 10%. On average, men's and women's running performances differ by about 12%. Now, there's a number of ways that you can frame this. This is a slide from one of Emma Hilton's presentations, which shows one argument or one illustration of it. Sorry, just going to head back there. So there on the left is Florence Griffith Joyner, who is the world record holder in the women's 100. That record has stood for an incredibly long time, multiple generations of athletes. But at the same time, there are 3,500 males who are faster than that performance, including a 15-year-old male who is much faster than that. That's 10.49. That male, the 15-year-old record is 10.20. That's this athlete here. And 157 have gone sub-10. On the right, yesterday, you were introduced to one of the uh, queens or princesses, goddesses of Jamaica. Here's another one of them, Elaine thompson Hera. 1,642 males faster than her in the year that she won that Olympic title. That includes masters, juniors, and so forth. So there's a number of ways that we can say, well, look, this is the implication of male performance advantage. You all know those. There's a site, boys versus women, which documents a number of other statistics. And it makes for a powerful argument for how large this advantage actually is. So we know that physiology drives performance. Tommy Lindberg, the aforementioned researcher from Sweden, earlier this week produced the following. It's a summary of differences in strength between males and females for different muscles or joints. Sorry. <laughs> so from the ankles all the way to the shoulders, you can see that there's a difference here, and this is the scale, m maps the percentage differences. So from about 40% at the, at the neck flexors, then you get ankle plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, you move through leg press and so forth all the way to the upper body where those strength differences are the largest. And so these are the strength, the muscle strength differences. And not surprisingly, they have significant performance implications, for example, in weightlifting, where even when matched, and this is an important point because it comes up regularly in the attempts to rebut male advantage, even when matched for mass and height, males outperform females. So 55 kilogram weight class, the men's combined world record is 294 which is 30% higher than that for women. In the 69 kilogram class, it's around 30.1% higher than for women. And then in the upper or the open category, this, the heavyweight category, it's larger because now you have a mass difference over and above the physiological strength difference per kilogram. So these are profound differences. Now, 
This, the reason I that bring this up, and this is so important, is because there have been attempts, and these are the more recent developments, Emma alluded to them, to try and argue against male advantage by adjusting for mass. And one of those arguments was made in a document that was produced by an organization called e Alliance on behalf of the Canadian Center for Ethics in Sport. That paper has been, well, a, a, a review article critiquing it has been written. I think Kathy Devine was the first author. Is that right, John? Or was it Miroslav? Was it Kathy? If you look for Divine et al., there's an article called Ideology Trump Science in which they go through this more systematically than I will in this presentation. But I did want to pick up one or two high-level points about this. So the, artic the, the, the document, this is, this is the nameless one. I, don't, I still don't know which scientists were responsible for producing it. But it, it put out a number of different concepts and ideas, one of which is shown here very shortly. Um, I need some tech issues. Is there, is there potentially another one of these available? Is this it? Okay. One, one of the arguments that was made is that bodies are systems, and there is not one discrete biomarker that allows easy comparison of athletes' bodies to each other in terms of performance. Well, exactly. That's the whole point. So this was offered in rebuttal to the idea that testosterone, no one at this point, in 2019, when we were all in a dark room, maybe there was a lot of people debating testosterone, but we've moved on a considerable amount since then. And so this is kind of the point, is that male advantage is not one thing. It's everything, all at once. And so that was the first thing that they said. Now, in, the, in that paper, there was a whole section on the biomedical considerations and issues, and it listed a couple of things, and I wanted to highlight those. Number one, biological data are severely flawed or limited and often methodologically flawed. I think it's true to say that the biological data are not perfect. There are limitations in studies because that's how studies are. There's no such thing as a perfect research study. I'm not sure I agree that they're severely limited, but we'll explore some of that in a moment. But the point, point number one underneath that is most studies do not adequately adjust for factors such as height or body mass. The questions I would ask is, if there was zero evidence at all, what would you do? If you were a decision maker in sports and there was nothing available to you and you suddenly found yourself receiving claims from people to enter into a category that existed and in theory you respected and protected and there was no evidence in support of their claim, would you allow that until that evidence was provided or would you say, no, let's wait for that evidence? Yesterday, Linda spoke to you about how in 2003 they made that decision based on one study. If that Canadian, if that CCS document is saying the, the, the date at the moment in 2022 is severely limited and methodologically flawed, what do you reckon they made of that paper in 2003 or 50, it, was, it was later then, it was 15. It was far worse. But I would argue that the point was that they should not have acted on the absence of evidence. They should have said, let's get the evidence before we make a decision. And then the second point on this is that it's actually sleight of hand to try and argue for adjustment of factors because if you're trying to adjust for the reasons for male advantage, you can make male advantage disappear. This is a statistical technique that has been used by many different people. So if you'll allow me a diversion, you're all fans and exercisers and athletes and you regularly run and so forth. You, you know, right, that there is a straight line between regular exercise and longer and healthier life. This has been, you know it. You know it to be true. We even know why it exists. We know it exists because exercise causes things like weight loss, reduced blood pressure, improved blood glucose regulation, cholesterol, and not smoking, for instance. It's a, it's a co-behavior. Yet, the literature is full of papers, and you can go and find them. Here's one example back from 2012, which will tell you that there is no evidence that regular exercise and more exercise increases lifespan. So, for example, this was from Leah's study finds that running more than 25 miles a week, faster than eight miles an hour, or for more than five days a week, has no benefit on mortality. And when you read, and this is a, this is a detail, but I'll, I'll come to why this is important. When you read how that study did that and found that, what you'll discover is they use a method called Cox, let me just move on to it. They use Cox regression to quantify the association between running and mortality after adjusting for, so you see what they do is they say, let's do some statistical adjustments. 
and control for things that could confound this, such as age, sex, examination year, body mass index, current smoking, heavy alcohol drinking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, parental CVD, and levels of other physical activities. What these studies basically amount to is the following, is if we ignore the reasons exercise is healthier and reduces mortality, then more exercise isn't healthier and doesn't reduce mortality. That's how illogical it is. That same, that same illogical approach is now being applied to male advantage by those in the CCS document who are arguing for controlling for male advantage. We know that male biology has sports performance differences. We know how they come about because of increased lean mass, because of increased total mass. The argument to control and correct and adjust for those things is to say, let's put a line through the things that make male biology real and then conclude that it doesn't exist. It's illogical. It's absurd. And it's a, as I say, it's a trick that's designed to make male advantage disappear. And the craziest thing of all is it doesn't even work. Because even when you do it, male advantage still exists. And so this is a study, this is a study called Sex Segregation in Strength Sports. Do equal sized muscles express the same levels of strength between sexes? It was published earlier this year. And what they basically did was they went back in all the studies in their lab and they conclude the following. We, our results would suggest that segregation based on muscle mass or surrogates of muscle mass might not be appropriate classification. To, might, might not be an appropriate classification to create for comp to competition within strength sports. And what they basically found is that in about 85% of instances, even when you go so far as to say what's the literal size of the muscle, the, the thickness, the cross-sectional area of the muscle, males still have overwhelming performance advantages compared to females. So that's, that's that argument anyway, the idea that you're supposed to somehow correct. And yes, there are some sports where being heavier is a disadvantage. The Tour de France is one such example. But it doesn't necessarily follow that being the lightest is the advantage. There's a complex interplay between how much power you can produce absol in absolute terms and how much you produce in relative terms. And that's why Many professional cycling teams now use a compound score where it's both. It's relative and absolute. And so this notion that we should just simply take away by correcting statistically is, is not accurate, not ground in reality, and it's entirely unnecessary. But it's done to make it look like something doesn't exist that does. So ultimately what we're left with is a whole set of advantages. This is another one of Emma's slides. And you can look at these physical differences once again, you, and, and it all the way down to the bottom, which is punching power, rugby scrum force, sorry, there's punching power here, this is rugby scrum force. So there are performance differences, there are functional differences, and then there's the underlying or underpinning physiology that causes those. So that's, that should be the start point in any decision-making process around the science. Now, the next thing to look at is what happens when testosterone levels are lowered. But before we get onto that, Remember, and I'm going to come back to this graph a few times because it's quite important. Remember that no matter what variable you're looking at, the existence of male advantage doesn't imply complete separation between male and female. There are many athletes, female athletes, who are way, way better than most male athletes. Yesterday in Monaco, the women's mile world record was broken. 4.07.64, I think was the time. Most, I would venture to say 99% of men will never come close to running 407 for the mile. That doesn't tell you that there's no advantage. It just tells you that that female performance is absolutely exceptional. So I'm amplifying a little bit the separation between the sexes. But let's say that was mile performances. What you have is an exceptional female performance that is better than many, many, many male performances. Most of them, in fact. But there will be some that are not, right? So there's overlap, which we must still respect. And that exists for height, for mass, for strength, for running speed, etc. An important concept to bear in mind. <laughs> and potentially the, the best example that I've seen of this was something that was shared at the Casta Semenya case in 2019 at the Court of Arbitration for Sport. It was produced by Dorian Coleman, or Lam Lamley Coleman. And what it shows is the 400 meter times from 2017 in males highlighted blue. And then what I've highlighted here with these circles as the best performing females that year. So you can see that that's the, that's, that's the world record, right? And then you look at all these blue points. Light, light blue is adults and dark blue is juniors. 
and you will look at how many thousands of male performances are better than these best female performances in that same period, right? And so this is really important because it makes a couple of important points. When we consider male and female as one population with overlap, the best females are ranked thousands of places behind the best males. But remember, this graph doesn't stop here. That's 50 seconds. There's still, a, there's still six, four billion, three billion people to the right of those women. So they beat most males, but the best male difference compared to females is enormous. And that's why we have categories in the first place, right? Now, the thing about this, and we're working towards a hypothesis, is that the reverse, if a male enters women's sport, their ranking will improve significantly. That's logical. This male here, pick any dot. Let's take this person here, ranked, I don't know, 6,500. If that person was allowed to race against females, even with the loss of a few percent, would still be ranked number one in that category. So that's an important hypothesis generating exercise that we'll get onto the implications of in a moment. But before that, let's consolidate that that is the very reason why women's sport exists. This is the biological basis for it. So for instance, at the Olympic Games, we crown champions in two different categories. We have a men's triathlon champion and a women's triathlon champion. We have a men's greatest ever swimmer and we have a women's greatest ever swimmer. Those who don't respect and appreciate the biological reality of sex would have to conclude that the fact that these female champions are 10 to 14% slower than these male champions is a consequence of them being mediocre athletes. I can't see how you can avoid that conclusion. I would ask them, why do you then give the medals? What are you rewarding? So that it's, it's an illogical position that they have to occupy the moment you start to deny these biological realities. And in truth, I don't think that they are denying those realities. And, and I think John has made a very good point to say they're arguing for male residual advantage, not against male advantage. But more, what you should be saying, I think, is that Duffy and, and Ledecky are equal to Blumenfeld and Phelps. They're worthy of the same recognition, the same reward, for having the same physiology that, ma that makes exceptional triathletes and swimmers. But there's one thing that they don't have, right? There's one key difference, and that is a set of advantages that is uniquely available to males. And that's the point. That's why the that female category has to exist. So when we take the world's population and we say, all right, this is everyone competing together, we've long since recognized that categories are necessary to ensure that there can be inclusion of as many people as possible. Not exclusion, inclusion. Categories are inclusive by nature. So the world's population can be split, for instance, into males and females. If it were not, and we rewarded only athletic ability in humans, this group would hardly be represented at all, if at all, in fact. What we then do, and we do this regularly, and I want to draw these analogies, is we say that males themselves can be split, for instance, in combat sports into middleweights and heavyweights. But then we do the same thing for females, right? We have, a, we have women's heavyweights and we have women's middleweight competitions. And we would never entertain the idea of allowing these two boxes to cross one another. Because the, the male-female advantage is so enormous that we need a weight category within each one, not separate from each one, right? So you would never allow those boxes to exist and to fight heavyweights versus heavyweights across the sex category, only ever within. So the point I'm trying to make is that categories exist to allow for maximal inclusion to occur. And once we have recognized that category, then we create boundaries around it that we absolutely must respect. So... The question is, do we need a category for a specific sport? There's one or two answers, no or yes. Right? If your answer is yes, then your simple question is why? And the answer is that there's a presumption of advantage. Now, in the case of male physiology, it's not presumption, it's knowledge of advantage, so we can get rid of that word. If you're the IOC, then you think maybe presumption of advantage shouldn't exist, this statement proudly brought to you by the latest document from the International Olympic Committee. No athlete should be precluded on the basis that there should be no presumption of advantage. That is completely contrary to everything we know about biology. Even with the argument that if you lower the testosterone, you can reduce it, this, there should still be a presumption or a knowledge that male advantage persists. If you go back to the yeses, then the next question is, can we identify who belongs in it? Is 
membership of that category possible to identify. If that's true, then the converse is true as well. We should be able to identify who does not belong in that category. And then the final thing that needs to be assessed is can we create an appropriate boundary around it? And the answers to all those questions is, in the case of male-female, is yes, of course we can. We can do that. We know. We have enough evidence. And once we create a boundary, then of course we have to protect that boundary. And that boundary protection means that a person's claim to membership of that category, in other words, my claim to cross that boundary and be part of that category, cannot be accepted if the very thing the category is meant to exclude is still present. And that, that's exactly what it is. It's a claim. So when, when an athlete says, I belong in that category, if that athlete weighed, okay, kilograms, 95 kilograms, let's call it 200 pounds, says, I want to be a middleweight athlete, that claim should be rejected because it violates the purpose of a middleweight category in the same way that when a biological male makes a claim unsubstantiated by any evidence other than a belief in gender identity that I belong in that category, we have to reject that claim because it invalidates the very existence of the category and the whole purpose of that boundary. So that's the fundamental issue that now needs to be addressed in women's sport. The, the way that that is then challenged, even if it's accepted, is that there's this overlap. And again, you've, I've shown you this graph before. You know that there's an overlap. Now, this overlap, just as an aside, th this has been offered. It's, this is a classic bimodal distribution. If you pretended that this was one line, you'd see two peaks, minimum, maximum, and so on. That is often put forward as an argument against the sex binary. People say, look, height, mass, strength, speed, These are, this is a spectrum. This is not a binary thing because there's overlap, right? So that, that bimodal distribution is often put forward as an argument against the sex binary. The thing about it is it's disingenuous because this pattern is exactly what you'd expect from a binary distribution of two populations. Like, it's exactly it. For example, and this is a great hat, hat tip to Emma, this purple line could be the size of rabbits, and this yellow line could be the size or the weight of dogs, and that's exactly what you'd get. But if you looked at that, you would not, in fact, and I quote from Emma, you would not be mapping a rap, rabbit dog spectrum. <laughs> I don't know. So a tiny dog is not a rabbit. You're not mapping a dogget. I don't know whether Emma made that. She can tell us in the Q&A. Emma, did you make this picture or did you find it or how did you come? But anyway, I saw this on Twitter and it was too, I try to use it every time I can. So that's, so anyway, that deals with the argument about the sex binary. The point I'm trying to make is that that bimodal distribution of performance is exactly confirmation that sex is binary. It's not disproving it, it's actually proving it. However, if we continue that argument and we apply it now to the argument against sport, the way that it has often been framed is, well, look at testosterone. Testosterone levels overlap. Yesterday in her presentation, Carol showed you an uh, image of a sh an article which I think was from the New York Times. Is that the one you showed? Caucasus, and I forget the second name. Yes. That, this is an argument that's gained quite a lot of momentum, is that because testosterone levels overlap between females and males, so you can see the females here, this is a frequency histogram, total testosterone on the x-axis, and because some of the females are in the male range and some of the males are in the female range, this disproves that testosterone is all that important for sports performance, along with, and again highlighted from that CCS document, is a statement that there is no evidence that testosterone levels in females is predictive or associated with performance. Both of these are false arguments. Both of these are part of testosterone denialism, if you want to call it that, for a couple of reasons. The first one is, so this, sorry, let me zoom in. There's no clear scientific evidence that high levels of naturally produced testosterone is predictive of athletic performance among, in, in their case, cis, cis woman. woman. Um, there is no reason to think that that would ever have been the case. This is a straw man. It was, a, it was set up to try and refute the biological realities of sex. And I want to explain that to you in a moment. But before we do that, let's come back to the other graph and explain why that one's flawed. It's flawed for a couple of reasons. It's, most of that data come from a paper by Songson et al. In, in which they tested the hormone, the testosterone levels of a variety of different uh, sports, athletes in a variety of different sports. The problem is... They had no control over doping. 
They had no knowledge over which of those cases were DSD cases. They had no control over the timing of the measure, and we know that there are fluctuations. And they also didn't use the gold standard measurement for how you assess testosterone. Now, just very briefly with respect to doping, when males use testosterone and dope, one of the consequences is that their bodies shut off natural production. And so a male athlete would dope during a period prior to competition and then stop long enough that the drug leaves the system by the time they compete. So they get the training benefits of extra male hormones, but they don't test positive at the time. The problem is at the time they're tested, their body's in that suppressed stage where it's no longer producing any of its own. And so that's why they might end up here. When females dope, of course, the opposite happens, although that's doping offenses, so you should be able to filter that. The DSD cases, you know enough about those. There have been probably half a dozen to a dozen in the last decade whose testosterone levels are naturally elevated, naturally normally in typical male ranges, yet they're classified in women, as women in these competitions. And then the timing of the measure, depending on whether you measure the testosterone just before or just after, high intensity competition, particularly endurance athletes, can affect that testosterone quite significantly. The biological reality is that in healthy populations, there is no overlap between the upper level of testosterone in women and the lower level of testosterone in, in, in men. And so this is, a, this is a, a red herring graph almost that has been used to try and argue against testosterone, which in itself is a red herring or a straw man argument for the following reasons. And this is an important principle to try and understand is when we look at how a variable x on the, y, uh, on, the, on the x axis predicts performance, we often find relationships in a large population. So for example, basketball performance, the highest level you play at, is a function of your height across the whole population in the same way that your VO2 max, which is effectively the size of your cardiovascular engine, is a predictor of your performance level in marathon running, Tour de France cycling, long distance swimming, etc. But when we take this population and we subdivide it into elite athletes and everyone else, in other words, we slice off the top, the highest performing group of these athletes, and we look at them, what we tend to find, sorry, is that that relationship no longer exists. And the reason it doesn't exist is fairly obvious. It's because everyone in that group already has it. And the moment everyone's already got the ticket, then it's actually no longer the differentiator. Now, all of a sudden, because sports performance is so complex and multifactorial, all the other things start to matter. Now running economy, efficiency, biomechanics, psychological factors, etc., start to play, uh, play an important role. And the best performing athlete might not necessarily be the one with the highest VO2 max. In the same way that the best performing NBA player is not the tallest one. Because everyone he's playing against is also tall. And so, in a narrow elite population, there should never have been an expectation that testosterone levels would be related to performance. And so that was a straw man that was set up by the likes of Caucasus, etc., to try and argue against testosterone and biological reality. It, what ra actually matters, and the way that it should have been framed, is that when everyone already has the thing, then it doesn't matter as much. And what is the thing? Now, for a long time, sport wanted the thing to be the level of testosterone in the body. And that's why the solution in 2019 and before that 2015, the thing was let's lower the testosterone and everything will be fine. But that wasn't the thing, you see. The thing, that w the thing was being male. <laughs> that was the thing. <laughs> and so when you look at the world's population, what you end up getting is two distinct populations. You get a female population that is an androgenized, let's, let's call that made male. That's literally what it means. Andro meaning male, gen, genesis, created, right? So a female population that has a performance level and a male population that has a performance level. And the difference between them is the biological sex and all the things that brings with it. Now we know, and you've seen these, is that the best performing females are better than most. This is obviously, there's a lot more males below that line. But the best performing females are, are good. They really are comparable. But the best performing males are, depending on what you're measuring, 10 to 50% better than the best performing females. And so, in the end, you have this concept where you've got two distinct populations, which you can see here, that differ with respect to all the things that being biologically male. Now, testosterone is uh, inarguably the most important one of those, but it might not be the only one. And we'll discuss in a bit a little bit of evidence for, for that. So we've got two populations. There's overlap in performance because it's multifactorial, but the differences are created between the populations. 
So anyone who says no evidence that testosterone plays a role in performance, yeah, but that's because you're asking it within men and within women. You should be asking it between them, and then it's so obvious. It's so obviously one of the differentiators, and there is then no overlap at all. Unless you go back to what Sharon had to encounter in her career, what Linda fought in her time as an athlete and coach, and that's the effect of doping on women. And it's really interesting. So that picture there, the oldest woman's world record is the 800-meter world record. It's set in 1983, 153.28, I think it was. That's Jamila Kratosvilova, who also had the second fastest 400 performance ever. Does I have that right, Linda? Sorry? Second fastest 400 ever, yeah. just behind Koch, and then the 800 record, which still stands to this day. So does the, so does the 400. They both do. And, that, and that, that, that's an argument. I mean, and, and Sha you, listen, I'm not going to tell you. You experienced it. You know this, right? You'll, you'll know why this happened. And so if you come back to this, I just want to make the point that what you're seeing there is an abnormal performance where the normal distribution is skewed by something artificial doping. So what doping did was it took good athletes, but not the best, and it made them better than the best. So Sharon's friend, who she mentioned yesterday, who came fourth, was beaten by three athletes who weren't the best but they had such a large boost as a consequence of doping that they were able to get ahead of the best without the doping. Now, that's, that's an important point because when you apply the same argument to, say, a mediocre male, that mediocre male will dope and will still not be better than the best female. And it's crazy that we have to bring this up because the argument always comes up, and, and fortunately I see it less and less frequently, is if trans women had an advantage, why don't they win everything? Well, it's because they started in the middle. <laughs> That's why. And you know, the first time I saw this argument come up by a sports organization, and they were almost forced to play this hand, was in the, in the submissions to the Court of Arbitration for Sports in the Casta Semenya case. Semenya's legal team made the same case. They said if Semenya's got male advantage, why isn't she running as fast as the males? And to their credit, the World Athletics legal team said, because Casta Semenya's mediocre. And I was, I, was, I was amazed because everyone had like tap danced around that issue. And look, she's not mediocre. Semenya is not mediocre. She's still better than most males. But comparatively, yes, that's true actually. So that male advantage, in the same way that if, that, if that's me on my bicycle with a 150 watt motor, I'm still not beating Jonas Vinegar in the Tour de France. Because, and this is the key point, advantage is not assessed across two populations. It's assessed within a person along the line. So in other words, did I get better? Did I move to the right on this particular line as I got faster, as my performance improved? My pre versus my post. That's how you assess advantage. You don't ask whether a person's better because they beat or lose to someone else. It's a ridiculous argument. And I'm glad to see that that one at least has started to fade away. But you'll still see it. You'll still see it made. Is that if there can't be an advantage because if there were, then they'd be winning races. And in fact, I think we'll get to some case studies in a moment that I think prove that. So, right, let's continue now. So all of that was going on in about 2020, 2021. That was the early days of scientific debate, discourse, tensions, disputes, right? Then in 2021 and 2022, I think if I had to describe it as anything, it would, be, it would almost be the harvest. Because, and I'll show you in a moment, the, the biology that I've just explained to you made certain predictions. It was like putting seeds in the ground, and then you just wait and see. And the fact that the sports organizations didn't act on that biology meant that they were watering the seeds. They were just waiting for sprouts. And that's what we started to see in 2021 and 2022. We started to get the case studies that proved the theory. And we saw it for the first time in the Tokyo Olympic Games. And then we saw it uh, a little bit later on in 2022 when we had a number of different athletes. And, and, and sports federations were, at this point, recognizing, I think, the biological concepts. And so, for example, in 2022, we had uh, World Aquatics announce its policy. We had other case studies, again, predictions that were made by the biology were now basically coming true. Uh, hypotheses were being verified, as it were. This will move along eventually. This uh, click has been, I'm going to have an overuse injury in my thumb by the time I'm finished here. <laughs> We had, we had the case, and when, when I was introduced earlier, you heard the story of Leah Thomas and the NCAA swimming. That was at the beginning of that year. 
Uh, we then had Emily Bridges and the controversy in English cycling at the same time. This will eventually go, maybe it's the batteries. Switch it off and on again. And then, of course, we had the first of these conferences. And that was... And so that was in Vegas, and we all met and discussed, and, and we didn't have the data yet. But I wanted to share with you a little bit of the data at this point. So before we go into that, let's build the argument. And it has been strange for me to see that people haven't been able to understand these concepts until they literally see them come to fruition. Because you could have predicted everything I'm about to show you, but no one was reacting to it in theory. They needed to see it happen before they reacted. It was a reactive instead of a proactive approach. So this is, this is very much like the graph I showed you earlier that World Rugby produced, except it's more comprehensive by Emma. And it shows you from a range of different studies, the initial bit here in blue to the right of this line are the male advantages over females. And then the question is, how much do they change when the testosterone levels are suppressed? And you'll see that almost without exception, the purple bar is considerably smaller than the blue, which is an indication that there's residual advantage. Emma and Tommy produced a paper, and then Joanna Harper produced a paper that concluded very much the same thing, and then that, that was there was no evidence that testosterone suppression removed male biology, and therefore, by suggestion, male performance. So this is a, an important graph, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to go through it with you. It's, it's one of the graphs that Emma made to explain this. And what it shows you is the relative performance in whichever task it happens to be, so for instance, in some of these it's lean body mass, in some of these it's grip strength, in some of these it's leg extension strength. So those are the studies that you're looking at on the x-axis. And what Emma has done is she's made the trans woman before testosterone suppression equal to one. So that's your sort of reference point. So that orange line is the trans woman before suppression. Above it, you can see here's a line for non-trans women because these studies often have control groups which are biological male who are not about to undergo testosterone suppression. So that's an important point because a lot of the criticism that was leveled at Emma and Tommy Lindbergh in this paper was that they were making comparisons between males and trans women as if that wasn't actually valid. I mean, it's... But nevertheless, Emma said, well, all right, fine, let's actually, let's actually treat, for the sake of argument, trans women as a subcategory of biological male. There's no reason to do that biologically that is known, but that's what was being done in this particular instance. And what you're then looking at in these orange arrows is how much performance or lean muscle mass or male biology, whatever you want to call it, the biological element in question, dropped as a consequence of testosterone suppression. And what you will see is that that drop, on average across all these studies, was about 4%. Now the key comparison is what does that look like compared to the females against which those should now be compared afterwards, right, in this frame of reference. And the answer is, shown here by the light blue line at the bottom, is about 26% of that advantage remains. So where in the beginning, the difference between trans women, this cohort of biological males, and females was 30%, what is left after testosterone suppression is about 26%. That's almost 90% of the original difference. And these were all the studies. Since then, there have been a couple others. Roberts came out. There was a study that Emma alluded to over the 14-year period. But this, this was the data set that World Rugby saw. This is the data set that I'm sure World Aquatics has looked at, that World Athletics has looked at, uh, the UCI ignored for a long time. And eventually, I think, have recognized that this difference, the space between this red line and this blue line, is the residual male advantage. This is the bit that John wants to, John argued or explained to you the IC wants to shift across to one of all the other different advantages, right? So that's the point. The small point of male advantage is removed. Now, back to this. Remember that if this is what performance looks like between women and men, and we have this example of a graph, and we have this physiological gap, then any blue dot who retains even half, even 10% of the male advantage that exists in this physiological gap is going to parlay that retention of advantage into a ranking improvement into women's sport. So you could set a scientific hypothesis in 2019, 2020, 2021. This stuff was known then. Male biological differences are real, yes. Performance advantages are the result of this reality, yes. 
unless those differences are removed entirely, the leftover advantage will be evident in a significant improvement of ranking when someone enters the women's category. That was the obvious scientific hypothesis. What we had at the time, and even more in hindsight, was a really elegant scientific hypothesis, and then you just had to sit back and wait for it to see if it was true. The counter is, if you want to adopt like a null hypothesis way of scientific thinking, is that male advantage is removed, and therefore trans women in women's sports would not change ranking. That's what Jonah Harper tried to pitch to the IOC with her study of eight, the N equals eight. It was your website, n equals eight.com. Yeah. You can go and look at that there. I'm not gonna labor that point. But that was the, that's the counter argument, right? So now you've got, in effect, what's been set up as a pretty large experiment. And you say, all right, let's see what happens. And sure enough, cases started to emerge that allow us to test this hypothesis. And the first of those was Laurel Hubbard. Now, who, who was it who mentioned, was it Ro, Rowena Edge yesterday? You, you shared Laurel's story more. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the background and the context. I'm going to give you the data a little bit here. When Laurel Hubbard came back as a 40-year-old weightlifter and set a world record, the winning margin and the difference between first and second was 77%. The orange bars on this graph show you some comparisons for the open category, the women's 35, the men's, uh, and the, women's, uh, the men's 35 category. That's the typical difference, and that was Hubbard. So that's clearly an outlier. So much of an outlier that in actual fact, when you look in this next graph, I'll just try and explain it to you as we go through it, eventually. There we go. Right, this is the combined total lift of all the lifters in the competition over a period of time. The yellow bars are men's lifts. The orange squares and diamonds are women. The squares is the men's 35 category. The diamonds, men's 40. Squares, orange squares is women's 35. Diamonds is women's 40. And so what you can see here in, in this one graph is a sex difference between gold and orange. That's male, female. And also an age difference between squares and diamonds. And you're looking at the worst lifter here and the best lifter over on the right-hand side. And notice that there is no overlap between the weakest male men's lifter, th this diamond, and the strongest woman's lifter in either of the age categories, except for Laurel Hubbard, the blue. So that performance, that performance to break that record was so good that it was in the middle of the male range. Now, <laughs> well, the scientific hypothesis tells you why. It's because that's, like, it's, if, if, I can't, how else do you explain that other than hypothesis confirmed? Is that this is a case of an athlete who has carried through residual advantage, even after testosterone suppression for a period of time, to produce a performance that is so dominant that it's 77% better than everyone else's, which is almost an order of magnitude better than the average. And it's so good then that it allowed that performance to feature in the middle of the male range and allow an athlete to go to the Olympic Games as a 40-something year old in a sport that is dominated by 20-something year olds where we know peak strength. And you can see in the graph what the effect of age on performance is. So, case, case study one. Case study two came from swimming and it was really interesting to follow this and watch it develop, and it was the, obviously the example of Leah Thomas. Now, there's a scientific paper on this. It was published earlier this year by Snedeker et al. Uh, sorry, uh, Senefelt et al., 2023. And these, these charts and tables are going to come from that. So first of all, what this, graph, this chart plots is the different events that Thomas ended up competing in, and this was the times and the performances, the times and the rankings as Will Thomas in the men's category and then Leah Thomas in the women's category. And I want to highlight the key points, and we, we, we test our hypothesis once again. So these were the rankings pre, prior to conversion in men's sport, 550, 65th, and 32nd. The change in performance that was measured when you compare the times here to the times down below was in the range of, well, it varied between almost nothing and about 7 odd percent. Now we know, again, I've shown you the data on this, that the typical male-female difference in swimming events is between 10 and 12 percent, call it. And so when you look at the magnitude of these performance reductions, they are less than the typical performance differences between male and female, and so therefore your hypothesis would be the ranking will improve, and sure enough, that's exactly what happens. So the rankings go up all the way to, in one instance, first. 
when Senefelt et al. looked at this and they had a control group, what they found was this is the ranking of all the swimmers who were ranked between 45th and 85th in a given year, right? And Thomas's result is shown here in the blue triangle. And so this is the year that Thomas was ranked 65th. That's that data point here, right? So that's 65th in the 200 meter event. And then the year later, well, having not competed that year, two years after that, goes all the way to the top. Obviously, people's rankings change over time. It's possible that you can go from being 150th, whatever it is, to top. But look at the bo these boxes here tell you what is a typical improvement. And so you can see the outlier. And so this is another example of a hypothesis that is confirmed. So the performance advantages that are, the, sorry, the biological advantages that are attained parlay into a performance benefit that is manifest as an increase in ranking. And then the last one is a cyclist. This is one of the data points from the, well, it's the data point from the, the research study on Jana Harper. This is a tweet. Note the date. This was the 27th of February. It was at the same time here that the controversy was happening around participation of Emily Bridges in the women's cycling events in the UK. I think they were looking to qualify, or she was looking to qualify for the Commonwealth Games at that point. And you remember that the women of UK cycling protested and effectively stopped that from happening. In that same period, Bridges was riding in a team. In that same, in that same period, this photograph's a podium ceremony where Bridges was riding and winning a men's team time trial. And so it was literally shifting from men's to women's sports within a few weeks. Uh, and so, th anyway, that in itself was telling. But the data, the data that subsequently came out is really interesting. So I wanted to just take you through a little bit of that. These are the VO2 changes. So VO2 is a, it's a marker of cardiovascular performance. And what you're looking at here, the orange line is VO2 max. And there are a couple of landmarks here along this x-axis, which is the timeline. <clears throat> this red line is the moment at which the testosterone suppression begins. And what you will discover here is that from a period of three months post all the way to 12 months post, there's actually no effect of lower testosterone on VO2 max. That said, the VO2 max prior to a concussion, which happened eight months before the testosterone suppression, was considerably higher. And so there was this uh, drop. The highest point in this one-year period is lower than this, this point. But you must also just notice the training volumes. This is the hours of cycling per week. The, the training volume had been suppressed, and we'll see some interesting findings when you actually look at the performance metrics. This is power output. The, the blue line shows three minutes power output. The orange line is the 12 minutes, and the gray line is critical power. These are all metrics that cyclists would be very familiar with as tests for how good your performance is going to be. And again, you see the, 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 the moment at which the gender-affirming hormone treatment begins. So the testosterone level we assume to be, we don't know it because that wasn't, I don't think, shown, but we assume is lower in this period. So a couple of things. is the 12 months after the hormone suppression, the, the three-minute power, because Bridges is a track cyclist, so that's really the one that matters the most for, for Bridges, is 5.8 watts a kilogram. That's 5% higher than at the start of the period of hormone transition. So... Clearly, you can get better while your testosterone is suppressed. That said, it is 12% lower than the peak, which was before concussion, but the training volumes over the period of the testing were 27% lower than at peak. So it becomes quite difficult to interpret this because the, the training is not necessarily staying the same either. And unless you believe training has no bearing on performance, that kind of seems important. Just to make the point, though, the typical male-female gaps, this was a study that was published by Valenzuela in 2022. They've got literally hundreds of thousands of data points from cyclists in elite men's and women's competition. So those are the differences in power. Now, one of the things that has already come up is that people say, well, the performance difference between men and women in cycling is 10 to 12 percent, and that's true. But that performance difference is the outcome of a power difference that's actually about 20 percent. And I've already heard it said that Bridges lost 12% of her power output, and therefore we should allow this because that's complete loss. It's actually not. The difference creating the 12% is 20% because that's how power and speed work in a relationship with one another. So the losses in Emily Bridges versus all-time peak are 12 15 and 16%, which means that even there there is retention of male advantage with less training. 
And then the final one, just to show you the less training, even most, most obviously of all, is lower body strength with, uh, over the period. And what you'll notice here is that the counter movement jump is actually higher at any point during the period of testosterone suppression, much higher than it was even before. And that coincides with a period of intensive resistance training. And so as there was a major focus on training, the thing that you would expect to improve as a consequence of training improved. And so the net result of this, if you want it to be, I guess, a little bit uncharitable, is that this study has shown that performance changes as training changes. <laughs> so the IRC have contributed significantly to f exercise physiology in that respect. I do, I, do, I do want to just recognize that these studies would be really difficult to do, but they're so poorly planned and conceived that they're almost destined to look like this, and that's the problem. We, we invited research as part of the World Rugby Proposal, and we, we didn't get a single proposal that would stood up to any level of scientific scrutiny. So it's not that surprising that we're in this situation. So point is, Bridges, it's confounded significantly by changes in, cha changes in training. One of the points I'd make is that it does show that if you change your training, you can increase performance, muscle strength, power output, even while testosterone is suppressed. People argue that that wouldn't be the case, but it obviously is. There's no evidence that any element of performance is removed, and hence the indication is still retention of advantage. So the case study, again, doesn't change the, the, the physiological reality at the time. So where does all that leave us? That's just a couple of case studies. You can list, there are now dozens of them. It's really actually remarkable how many examples there are of athletes. Some of them don't have the data. For instance, it would be really interesting to analyze Killip's performances uh, before versus after. Don't know that there's data on that. I think that if I, if I was asked to look into it now, I would be mining Strava data. I think that would be probably one of the most powerful ways to do it. But then you've got to know when the medical interventions happen. So these things are difficult, and I don't know that they're going to come at any stage in, in the near future, particularly. So where are we now? Right, so that's, that, that brings us to 2023. And obviously World Athletics and the UCI have now also come on with policies that try to protect the female category, imperfect as they are. As I mentioned to you, World Rugby has to next assess its policy. I think what's, what, what, and I'm trying to conclude now at this point, is when those sports have made the, the decisions, whether it's World Athletics earlier this year or the UCI, they have recognized the principle of, rec of hearing everyone. You know, Riley yesterday when she introduced this conference spoke about what about us. I think one of the most significant changes from my perspective is that that voice has now been heard. Definitely wasn't being heard prior to about 2020. And so that's, that's the biggest change. And I think the athletics bodies, swimming, have started to listen because they, well, not so much they started to listen as they couldn't ignore any longer. That's more reality there. The other thing that's happened is that they have recognized that you can't balance this. And you know, for instance, when Sebastian Coe um, announced that policy, he used similar language, as you can't balance these imperatives. And so there are still other sports. Just this morning, incidentally, a paper came out. Um, one of the co-authors was from UK Fencing. You'll probably see it in the next while. It's been shared a little bit on Twitter. And it very systematically goes through what makes a good fencer what is the typical difference between male and female fences? How does performance look? What does testosterone suppression do therefore? And it's a very solid argument. So I would anticipate that fencing will soon have a policy. Maybe just UK fencing. Maybe Thomas Bach was a fencer. Maybe that's what it'll take for the IOC to pay attention. Who knows? I doubt it. But, the, but I guess the message that I want to put out there now at this point is, in 2019, there were, I think there was still a case to be made that there was a, a little bit of openness around the science. There was a dispute. There was a debate. That debate now seems to me, it's never, it's, science is never fully settled and done. You're never, you're never done. It's never 100%. So there's obviously some things that have to be explored in the future. But the bottom line is this, and this is for any sports um, decision makers that are potentially watching this online, is it's time that you made a choice. That's what it is. And as long as you stand behind that choice, at least that's honest. Sports will continue potentially to make choices that prioritize inclusion over, well, of one group over the inclusion of women. That will happen, I've got no doubt, because it's just decisions that people make. But it's fundamentally nowadays it's a choice. It's not a dilemma, it's a choice. And so you have to make that choice. That's the, that's the point at this, at this time. What about the world rugby process? We'll get to that very shortly. But what we know is this. We know that there's male-female differences. We know that they're physiological, functional, and performance. 
So that's real. We know, and this is a figure from a paper that Emma is uh, the senior author on, Tommy Lindbergh, I'm also on it. We've managed to finally persuade, I think it's about 20 odd sports scientists, to write a paper that will rebut and reject this IOC's notion of science with this respect. And that, that will be submitted and I hope published really soon. This is a figure from that particular paper. It exists because of biology, and this is a summary of all those biological differences. And then, of course, you've seen this. We know that it outlasts testosterone. So what was a scientific dispute in 2019 is now a question of choice. The science is no longer going to be the, the thing that is going to be debated. You, we know enough to make a decision at this point. No one should be paralyzed by a lack of knowledge. We should be empowered by what we do know and then make decisions and then live with the consequences of those decisions. That's, that's the message, I think, for sports. As for the World Rugby, we meet later this year again in October to discuss it. What remains for us to consider? A couple things that are on the table. Conceptually, women's sport has to exist, it has to be protected, and those boundaries around it have to be protected. So our answer to the questions I put to you earlier remains yes. We know we can identify who belongs, we can identify who doesn't belong, and therefore we respect and create a boundary around it. The question remains around whether we go open versus male. That was discussed in 2020, incidentally. Uh, John, again, had, pre had presented that to the group, this idea that we can have an open category and then a closed category for female. In the end, we've stayed with men's and women's. I think it needs to be put back on the table as to whether we go for open and women's. But that's, that's a conceptual argument that needs to be had. The second thing is scientifically. There's a few questions here. One of the things that I think will emerge more and more in the next few years is what is the effect of the testosterone suppression pre-puberty on, on sporting implications? The World Rugby Guideline was also argued as anything post-puberty. It was similar to FINA's, uh, or World Aquatics rather, sorry, where they said that if you suppress after puberty, then no eligibility into women's sports similar to the UCIs, and I think sports are going to have to start confronting that question, is whether the distinction should be irrespective of when testosterone suppression happens. There was one paper came out um, recently called Transgender Girls uh, at All, Adult Height is Unaffected by the, basically, similar the gender to the UCIs, UCIs. And, and I think sports are going to have to start so confronting that. It's not in and of itself enough to talk about sports performance, but it is maybe the first evidence that and you're going to hear tomorrow, incidentally. Where's Mara and Greg? Mara's there. Greg's somewhere. Yeah. There you are. They're going to present to you a little bit of data that shows that those performance differences that I've shared with you, graphs of in adults, those things exist before puberty happens. And so we framed this very much as puberty is the watershed beyond which that, that may need to be looked at. One of the reasons that may need to be looked at, incidentally, is practical, because I think there are issues. Yesterday it was raised as a question. At the moment, I don't know how any of the sports with these policies are able to actually identify and enforce either a testosterone reduction policy or an eligibility, uh, eligibility policy in terms of the, the, the policies of the UCI and athletics. I mean, how are they going to do it? I, don't, I honestly don't know what they will do. And if you allow cases in and exemptions for people who've suppressed before puberty, your, your challenge becomes even more complex because now you not only have to measure the levels now, you've got to actually understand when the puberty happened and when the intervention happened relative to that. And it's one of those cases where you're, you're trying to make allowances and every allowance you make adds exponentially to the challenge. And implementation wise, I'm not sure how sports are going to deal with this. So that needs to be assessed. And the other thing is that, can you imagine combat sport, boxing, mixed martial arts, where you have a category for middleweights and you don't have a weigh-in? Like, I, I, I can't see how it's tenable that you can have a category and have no mechanism by which to ensure that the category at compliance exists. And so I think that there is going to have to be discussion around screening. I think Colin is speaking on that tomorrow. Uh, again, imagine combat sports without screening. That's what, that's what women's sport would look like without some kind of screen. And Linda, I think, spoke a little bit about it yesterday. Colin will pick it up tomorrow. But those are things that World Rugby will have to discuss when we meet. But one thing that I will say is the, is the following, is that none of the progress of the last year, and I'm talking now the big three sports, because we had aquatics, we had track and field, and then we had cycling come in, let alone the last four, is the result of evolving science. The science seems to me to be actually quite stuck. 
it's not going to it's not going to move very quickly but what has changed to allow those policies to change is the recognition of the science it's not the existence of the science so the same stuff is on the table today as was on the table in 2019 it's just that it is now more attention has been drawn to it and that's that's you and so i would love to stand and say oh, you know we as scientists have really helped turn to help this thing turn the corner we haven't at all it's the advocacy and it's the voice of the woman and it's the pressure that you've applied to those sports federations and organizations that's what's changed it and that's why if i am pleased pleased to be invited back here kim and to not talk about this but instead instead to talk about actual issues in women's sport concussion and injuries and performance and like the real stuff when we can when we can have stimulating cool conversations about how amazing physiology is at the elite level performance that's what i'd love to come back to and talk about that's going to mean that you need to put more pressure on those sports so that we can deal with this issue and then go on to the fun stuff thank you thank you so we'll have a few minutes for q a can you try to pull emma back up if she's on We'll have a few minutes for Q&A, and then we'll break for lunch. Can someone help me move this a little bit? Can I pull Emma back up if she's gone? If she's not, if she's gone, then she'll, that's okay. Well, this. Push me off. There we go. Thank you, Jen. So first, I just want to thank our three speakers. This was incredible. <laughs> and Emma. Oh, Emma's back with us. Thank you, Emma, for rejoining us. All right, so let's take some time for questions. We, will, we planned to break at noon, but we will just go a little over because I know there's arms up. Can someone take the microphone and run? I think it's in my hand, so come get it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I have a question about Emily Bridges. On the table you showed, it said, there was a thing that said concussion slash coming out. Con did Emily Bridges have a concussion and then come out? I, 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 <laughs> I, I, yes, I think so, but I'm not sure that they're necessarily causal. Yes. I'm not sure that they're causal. Uh, John and Emma were actually at that presentation. Did, did she elaborate on that at all? I, I remember reading something about that there'd been a concussion and Emily Bridges hadn't cycled for a very long time. And it, it, in, it was in that period of, let's call it cycling dormancy, that announced it. But, yeah, but that's right. That's right. Um, it was, so this is the presentation by Joanna Harper in London. Yeah, uh, I think she, uh, Bridges crashed. Um, uh, yeah, there's a truck crash. Morgan's walking around. Uh, hi. Um, Ross, I have a question for you. Do you think that world rugby will eventually move into creating, uh, uh, protecting women's rugby, not only on the elite level, but helping unions? Because um, right now they're basically, what, what's going on around the world in rugby is some, they're letting the unions decide on a, um, a lower level, non-elite level, like for example, if it's a community game or a club game, some unions are allowing men to just show up, even with a five o'clock shadow, and there's no uh, test, there's no surgery or hormone requirement. And uh, um, I'm just wondering, do you know, do you think that they'll ever delve into creating policy worldwide, or they just can't do it legally? They can't do it. We can't. We can't do it. So we have no. We have no jurisdiction over the community, the amateur game in the various member unions. So the only thing that, and that was why when that document was produced in 2020, it was positioned as a guideline, as opposed to a policy. And I, I've, ac I've actually, in fact, wondered how the UCI and athletics and so on will get around that same issue, because most sports have that same problem where the governing body can control the laws of the game and the international game and what it sanctions. 
But what happens on the ground in England, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia is up to them to run. And there's also some legal issues around you can't create policy as a governing body for sport then contradicts the constitution of the country in which that policy would be applied. So all we can do is to continue to encourage and educate and explain why our guideline exists and then hope that the unions will adopt that guideline. And that, you know, when, when it was announced, <laughs> I don't think any union adopted it. And then it took, it took a while. Eventually, England came on, Ireland, Scotland, rugby have done it. Unfortunately, for instance, New Zealand haven't, right? Have I got that right? They've, they've drafted the policies and allowed it to sound like theirs, but we've had pressure on them about the implementation. They've kind of shelved it. They've still insisted on it. Mm. And now they've announced Yeah, and, and <laughs> I remember in the, in the months after the policy was announced, we had Zoom calls with all the major unions to try and discuss with them and so on. <laughs> One of the great ironies I'll never forget is one of the calls ended on the hour. It's called at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they said, sorry, we have to go now because we've got a safeguarding meeting. We have to go and discuss. We have to go discuss age-grade rugby because we have to make sure that children are playing in the appropriate age category. I said, why, why, why are you worried about that? The difference, do you know that the difference between a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old is way, 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 way smaller than the difference between male and female? Yet you're going to go there and you don't want to deal with this? So, so unfortunately, we haven't gotten, a, a, we, we don't have the scope, but it'll be advised in, in a guideline always. Morgan, Mary. Uh, she's in the back. Oh, oh. Cynthia, sorry. Oh. Mary's in the back. Go to Mary. <laughs> then we'll go to Cynthia. Lots of hands getting raised. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm proud of the um, work that swimming has done, but as you mentioned towards the end, we need to talk about pre-puberty. And I think last year I heard at this conference, and maybe it was Emma who said it, that there's actually two testosterone surges before puberty um, after conception. Is that, did I hear that right? And is that why, even if you catch it before puberty, is that why we need to protect it and say it's what's on your birth certificate? Because right away, um, from the moment of conception, males have an advantage over females in sport. Emma? Yeah, I mean, Emma, you're on the Emma. Do you want to answer, Emma? Can you hear? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, you're absolutely right that there has been a push for understanding what testosterone does at puberty, understandably. Um, and this is undeniably the biggest uh, cementing of the performance gap between males and females. But there are these peaks through <laughs> development that happen before puberty. And one of those is postnatally. So boys um, experience a surge of testosterone actually really quite similar to the levels that they see at puberty in the, the three to six month postnatal period. And that's been associated perhaps correlated with loosely things like imprinting growth trajectories and whether, um, you know, what your final adult height is going to be. Maybe we, Ross talked earlier about studies that are now showing that you can block puberty, but still height is maintained, that boys achieve male height that is, typical of, of their predicted male height. So, so this is important. And if you, well, I think it's important. If you look pre-puberty and again, Greg, hi Greg, sorry, I wanted to meet you. <laughs> Looking at children, you know, and how boys outperform girls quite systematically. And I think statistically significantly before puberty is really important. This is, part of a male development program. And it's in fact, I think lifelong. It starts in utero, boys come out of the womb, they're longer, they're, they've got thicker bones and spinal columns and those kinds of things. And then they're, you know, they can jump and run a little bit faster. It might not be the biggest gap, but it's very systematic a gap. So I think the concept of puberty blockers 
and whether we can mitigate male advantage fully there is going to be the big question that sports federations have to deal with. Thank you, Emma. Oh, John has a comment. Uh, just to put this into a bit of context, there's an argument, <coughs> there's an argument around that uh, what, what we're discussing, puberty blockers at 11 don't fully mitigate uh, male advantage, as if that's an issue for sporting institutions. And maybe, I, I can see that. I think puberty blockers at 11 is an issue for all of us and for adolescent <laughs> kids. So I, I, I don't have a huge insight on, you know, the introduction of puberty blockers in, in sport as a way of mitigating male advantage. I am opposed to prescribing puberty blockers and sterilizing kids when they don't have uh, <laughs> informed consent. I think it's a, a bio, I think it's a bioethical and a political issue beyond sport. Thank you, John. Another question? Morgan, uh, Cynthia still has her hand up. I think she's very this is Thank you. So I'm interested in um, entities, you know, whether they be institutions or journals, that put out information that's false about um, sports science. Sometimes I see Emma or Ross or other people battling on Twitter. And I was wondering um, if Ross or Emma could comment on that now. And has that changed? Has that landscape changed? Are you seeing that diminished? Um, you know, who are the main players and, and is the battle less than what it once was. There's a journal that published the, um, the, the when, when the IOC came out with their guideline, it was accompanied by a scientific paper that almost in effect gave the academic rationalization justification for the guideline. <laughs> it was published in a journal. We submitted a rebuttal to that journal, the same, the very same journal, and it was rejected in part because we used offensive terms like male and female. <laughs> so. So we couldn't get it published there. So we're trying to get it published somewhere else. Emma can talk a little bit more about that whole process. But does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> and it depends. It's ongoing. And so it depends who you get. Because the, the way the academic review process works is you submit it. And we work really hard. I, I know that sort of deputy editors, a South African doctor, we, Emma and Tommy went via the chief editor to say, listen, we're going to submit this. Are you happy? They said, no, we'll definitely give it a fair shot. But then it gets sent to reviewers. And if you get a reviewer who's, as it were, on the other side of the aisle, they'll just blow you up. And that's what happened in part because it was offensive because it implied male-female differences and so on. So, Emma, do you want to add to that a bit? No, other than to say the ridiculousness of... One of, one of the things we were blasted for was using the term trans woman. And we were told off quite heavily <laughs> for using the word trans woman um, because that's offensive and transphobic and evil. And then the reviewers looked us up, right? They looked us up and they looked up our previous publications and who we worked for and, you know, my links with sex matters and whatever we talked about politically and kind of just advocating for you know positions but trans women trans women and trans women was the the bottom line we were just evil and what they didn't consider is that we had a word count and transgender woman is two words and trans women is one word but this was you know the the evil position so so it's actually quite capricious that was an editor of the biggest sports journal in the world who had created a bias against us for what I think is a really brilliant argument against the IOC who who didn't then even look at the science who just saw these words who saw us using the word male to describe trans women because they are male and who then just rejected us on that basis. And, and that's astonishing. This institutional capture around science is interesting, and it's obviously happening 
more broadly than science. Jen, I see you nodding along here. Do you have a message for institutional capture or being able to speak up within the IOC? Or? I mean, it's, just, it's just that's a method of censorship. If they're saying that they, you, you, you cannot have your rebuttal published because you're using certain language that is describing that is part and parcel of your rebuttal. That's just another mode of, of, of censorship. And you know, there, uh, you know, I don't want to get into how that's happening well beyond this issue, but it is. And the only thing you can do is keep going because it's ideological at, at this point. And I, I was struck by, I think it was you, um, you know, when it, the, the argument will just keep changing because it's an ideological position, not necessarily a rational one. And the only thing, and you said this so well, um, that can push back against that is more louder voices. Um, Your words to, of to encouragement. To puncture mm -hmm. the, the, the ideology because it's not, it isn't rational. It's, it's ideological and, you know. Let's take another question and then I think what type of, I don't know how we're doing on time. One more question. Do we have time? Hi there. One more. You guys were all so great. But my, I really am so glad, Ross, that you talked about blocked boys, boys who have been blocked. And of course, we're against that. But um, I think that this is the issue that um, is not being discussed, um, the idea that there are a bunch of blocked boys coming, and girls, but that's separate. And um, if we're talking about protecting sport at every level, we're, maybe they're not going to reach elite, but they're going to be, girls are going to be dealing with this at, at every level, at every age. So I, I would like to know more about the differences between boys and blocked boys. I've been seeing boys that I think are blocked at certain events that I go to because I cover this stuff. And um, they they seem to mirror the morphology that we have heard about of the castrati that were castrated for their singing voices. They're tall and thin, and they kind of have a curvature in the spine, but they're very lanky. But anyway, do you have any more information? And can we stop this red herring of blocked pu male puberty, you know, this thing like, oh, me men who have gone through puberty, can we stop can we stop that? I anyway. will let Ross answer, but I don't think there's much out there yet, uh, is there? <laughs> I, I don't know of any. That paper that I shared there was a 2022 study out of Amsterdam, I think. It was the first study that had documented any outcome, any physiological outcome in, in, in block boys, as it were. And I can tell you that, and I'm pretty sure all the sports have had this dilemma, is that because the status quo was the status quo. I mean, when we didn't make the rules, we come into this debate, and this was the argument. Trans women are allowed to compete with the, with the suppression of testosterone. Fine, okay, that's the thing you're gonna discuss. We have all these deliberations, we evaluate the quality of the science, it's very clear that we've gotta go in one direction, but then the lawyers and people start getting fearful, there's gonna be litigation, so on. Okay, so aside from the fact that there'll probably be lawsuit no matter what you decide, because you're gonna have it from, you just have to pick what reason it's for and which direction it's coming from, but fine. The sports had to craft these arguments about why they were gonna change the policy. What's your rationale for saying, no longer will a trans woman be allowed in? And the rationale for that was male puberty, androgenization, here's the evidence, here's what happens when you block it. And it's almost like to create that position, the sports painted themselves into a corner that doesn't allow them to create the position around suppression before puberty. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a proper catch-22 that we had. And until that evidence exists that shows what you're asking for, it's going to be really difficult to like get out of that painted corner and say, actually, you know what, it's the whole of male development from the womb to the point at which they want to play women's sport. That's the challenge for the sports now. So Emma's right. I alluded to it. We'll discuss it in October. I don't know which way the discussions will go. But until there's good evidence, it's going to be quite difficult to change it again. Well, I just would want to encourage, just from my point of view, to stop saying male puberty because if there, it's true that from what I even heard from Linda Blade within the last couple of years, that boys have different performance starting from we seven years old. We have a yeah, session this that. evening. We're going to hear Yay. about it, or the, or the pre-puberty performance and the differences Yay. between boys so, and girls. Yeah, so I, we'll address that later. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
All right, well, let's break for lunch. Um, enjoy an hour and a half. We will see you back here at 1.30 promptly for the psychological war on women. Um, and so we have got some thank you cards that we're going to pass around if everyone could sign and some, some beautiful flowers for Kim Jones and Marcy Smith. Again, I introduced them. Um, <laughs> um, but we really couldn't be more grateful for you guys, the work and the time and the sacrifices that you have had to make to, to put this together, this powerhouse of people um, who are going to be and have been extremely impactful and that will, will only continue. And so we wanted to thank you guys. That was unexpected. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome current college student Olivia Krulchek to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to come here and share my story with you all. It's so nice to be in a room full of so many like-minded individuals. It's like a breath of fresh air, and I love it. Thank you, Kim and Marshy, for this opportunity. So my name is Olivia, and I am a 20-year-old chemistry student at the University of Cincinnati. This summer, I enrolled in several classes with the intention of speeding up my graduation timeline. And one of these classes fulfilled my university's DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements for graduation. My, half of my grade for this course was a project on feminism. My project was focused on the rights and opportunities that women have had in athletics throughout time. And when I received my grade, I was beyond shocked. I received zero credit, zero percent for my work. <laughs> for using the term biological woman, that's why I was failed. <laughs> My professor stated that it was exclusionary, transphobic, and contributed to heteronormativity and therefore failed me. After emailing back and forth with my professor, it became very clear that she simply did not agree with the topic that I chose to write about. I chose to write about the very real fact that men are taking away opportunities from women each and every day that we allow them in our competitions, our locker rooms, and other spaces. I decided to take this to social media where I knew someone would hear me and help me. And I also filed a free speech complaint with my university. <laughs> After weeks upon weeks of nagging the administration, I finally had my grade changed by a different professor. And the University of Cincinnati formally reprimanded my professor for her violation of the free speech campus policy. However, a couple days after my story died down on social media, they reversed this reprimand quietly. It didn't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, my professor got away with the suppression of free speech. And this is an injustice to all current and future students and to women. The University of Cincinnati is affirming that using the term biological woman is transphobic, harmful, and outdated, and that professors will face no consequences for dis failing dissenting opinions in their classroom. I recognize the threat of losing the rights that women have fought so hard for, and I recognize the threat of losing the right to free speech that is so fundamental to our democracy. We've reached the point where students are not permitted to mention the name Riley Gaines without being failed. We're not allowed to differentiate between males and females without risking failing classes that cost us thousands of dollars. It's our duty to fight for what is right, regardless of who we may offend or who might feel offended. It's our responsibility as women to stand up for the generation of girls who will one day become the great athletes and scholars like you all in this room today. 
For all of them, and for the women who before us secured the rights that we risk losing today, we must not sit back and let women become erased. I feel fortunate to go from writing about biological women in sports to sharing a stage with those same athletes today. Holly Levesser is a professional cyclist and Masters national champion. She has won 32 professional races in a sport that has attracted a particularly high number of trans-identifying male athletes. After the sponsors of her cycling team publicly announced that they expected all members of the team to be supportive of these trans-identified athletes, Holly chose to leave the team and now competes without a sponsor. So please welcome Holly. <laughs> Kylie Alons is a 31-time All-American swimmer, two-time NCAA champion, five-time ACC champion, former American record holder, and the most decorated swimmer in North Carolina State women's swimming program history. Riley Gaines is a 12-time All-American swimmer, a four-time SEC champion, an SEC record holder, and female scholar athlete of the year. She's an advisor to the Independent Women's Forum and has postponed other career opportunities to advocate full-time for female athletes. <laughs> Paula Scanlon is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, where she was a member of the women's swim team and a teammate of Leah Thomas. She has recently begun to speak out about the treatment of the women's team at the Ivy League. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of this panel of athletes, Pamela Pereski. She's a social psychologist with a clinical background who authored the guided journal, A Year of Kindness, and served as chief researcher and in-house editor for New York Times bestseller, The Coddling of the American Mind. Her work has appeared in a diverse array of publications, including Psychology Today, The Guardian, and The New York Times. She has taught at several institutions, including Johns Hopkins, the University of Chicago, and the US Air Force Academy, and is a consultant of the Open Therapy Institute. Her current project is titled, Habits of a Free Mind, Psychology for Democracy and the Good Life. Thank you all. Wasn't Olivia amazing? Yeah. She didn't tell you this, but she was very nervous. And um, she also didn't tell you, she was a high school runner and she broke her back and had to quit competing. Um, so this is part of why she wrote about female sports. Um, and also, since we have um, just come back from lunch and I'm sure this is like the doldrums time, how about everybody just stand up and stretch for a sec and applaud for Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also want to say that these four athletes, the other young women here, and Olivia, they're all um, probably you have the same, I, you know, it makes me emotional. Um, they give me hope. Um, Olivia had courage. She had the courage to acknowledge biology and to stand up for freedom of speech. And it's insane that it takes courage for those things. Um, but it does. And it gives me hope that all of the young women here have had that kind of courage. They, they understand that being afraid to speak is not freedom. Being untruthful is not kind and being coerced is not consent. We've heard a lot of things at this conference and uh, including what we heard just before lunch about institutional capture uh, and there's a lot more to come. Um, but one of the things that strikes me is this inverted illiberal story that shows up in different ways in our culture right now, including with women's sports. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about this story. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, one group was subjugated by another. 
fictional and defamatory views about this subjugated group meant they were only allowed in certain spaces and could only work in certain professions. Its members were even blamed for illnesses and misfortunes, leading to public executions, like being burned at the stake. Over time, as understanding truth replaced believing fiction, members of the subjugated group were afforded the right to self-determination. They were afforded their own spaces. There was wide set, widespread support for this, and it was generally accepted that this was both morally right and based in fact. They no longer felt subjugated in their own space. Recently, however, an illiberal ideology has taken hold that turns everything upside down. Now maintaining boundaries, both for safety and for fairness, is considered offensive. This ideology holds that self-determination for this group is a form of bigotry against members of a group who claim the right to determine what it means to be in those exclusive spaces. Instead of widespread outrage at this inverted and illiberal and truth-denying fiction, as we've heard from Ramey and Jen and others, and we'll hear again, female athletes are told to keep quiet when competition is unfair and are required to ignore that little voice that tells them that something is wrong. They're trained to stop listening to their instincts. If they mention feeling distressed about boundaries not being respected, they're told they aren't a good teammate. They're told they could be responsible for a suicide. So I'm gonna show you a slide. On the right is a quote by a female swimmer who was ranked third uh, in the race in which Leah was ranked first. And I want you to think about when Dr. Dina McMillan speaks next. How did this highly ranked swimmer come to believe that her accomplishments and fair competition for female athletes were not only less important than, but an affront to treating people with respect and dignity? Below that is part of an email sent to female swimmers at Harvard that Riley tweeted not long ago. Swimmers at Harvard were emotionally manipulated into believing that if they weren't supportive of including trans-identified male athletes in women's sports, they could be responsible for a suicide. They were told that their feelings of frustration didn't matter. Even winning didn't matter if they didn't have the approved feelings. And they were supposed to keep their mouths shut. On the left, is a sign I saw on Twitter this morning, thanks to John Kay, a, a journalist. It says, please use the space you feel best aligns with your gender and needs. In other words, if trans-identified females feel that their needs, as opposed to the way they conceive of their gender, are best served by using a female space, they're welcome. Trans-identified males who claim woman as their gender are also welcome. But also, a male who identifies as a man but has some subjective need to be in a woman's restroom is also welcome. And yes, it also means that women can use the men's restroom if they so choose, which I guess is good because not only are the lines shorter, it might be the safest place for women now. <laughs> but look at the second line. Who is the audience? Who is being reminded that everyone is entitled to respect, dignity, and privacy? What do you think the reaction would be if a woman complained that a trans-identified male in this female space violated her dignity or privacy by not respecting her boundaries? Female athletes are expected to say nothing when their boundaries are dismissed and disregarded, even when a nude male body is allowed into spaces they once relied on for privacy and even when they are forced to undress in front of a male athlete. If they have a problem with any of this, they're told they are the problem. They should seek help. We're now supposed to pretend that including trans-identified males in female spaces and male athletes in women's sports is a step forward for civil rights rather than a step backwards for women's rights. Women's sports are known to build confidence and self-regard and have until now provided the freedom for female athletes to compete on a level and safe playing field. 
women's sports have historically been associated with women being less susceptible to domestic abuse, except, as Jen Say noted, when female athletes are abused in their sport. After Dr. McMillan's presentation, you'll hear from these four extraordinary athletes whose stories will illustrate how women are being psychologically manipulated in ways that could make them more susceptible. When you listen to Dr. McMillan, ask yourself how it's possible that so many policies prioritize the feelings and aspirations of those trans-identified male athletes rather than feelings and experiences of every female athlete who has trained and sacrificed and persisted in order to compete fairly against other female athletes. Dr. Dina McMillan is a Stanford-trained social psychologist who specializes in domestic violence. She's the author of the book, But He Says He Loves Me, which is in print in 14 countries and is available as an audiobook. Her program, Unmasking the Abuser, reveals the tactics abusers use to lure their targets into toxic relationships and prevent them from leaving. What you will hear from her is disturbing, both because she explains how easily abusers use benign cultural expectations and social norms to victimize girls and women, and because the parallels between female athletes in today's environment and victims of violent abuse are chilling. As she said yesterday from the audience, this gave me goosebumps, how do you get people to deny reality? One step at a time. Dr. Dina McMillan. Thank you, everyone. And as you heard, I'm a social psychologist. A lot of people don't know what that is. Social psychology is the scientific study of power dynamics and influence and per persuasion. Over the past 15 years, I've been using that lens to examine abusive relationships. I recognized that not only do abusers use a number of these dynamics with their victims, they're very skilled at using manipulation on other people those who would try to protect their victims. My work, therefore, prepares people to recognize the patterns of abuse. This helps vi victims leave their abusive relationships, and it allows potential targets to recognize the signs and avoid becoming victims. I also work in the policy space to help society shape systems and structures that can prevent abusers from gaining access to, to potential victims. During my decades of research and work in this field, I've interviewed more than 5,000 people who were victims of abuse and more than 700 abusers. The abusers I interviewed were extremely open. They knew exactly what they were doing. They told me how they'd get away with it. For the most part, they were right. Because the people around them expected them to play fair, to express honest emotions, and to keep their word. And abusers counted on that. The reason I'm speaking to you today is because what's happening in women's sports bears a troubling resemblance to what I see in abusive relationships. Let me be clear that I am not implying that coaches or others who have authority in women's sports are intentionally hurting female athletes. On the contrary, because I know manipulators are masterful at maneuvering others into becoming part of a system that enables their abuse. They lay the groundwork well. As a result of their cunning, those who care about the victim often find themselves going to great lengths to defend the abuser. They either can't admit they've been manipulated, or they fear the abuse will worsen, or even that they'll become targets themselves if they don't go along. As a general rule, men who abuse women take advantage of cultural norms that begin in early childhood and re are reinforced over time. 
These include teaching girls to prioritize being nice over all other qualities, to consider others before themselves, to give everyone a second chance, to make compromises in order to take care of other people's feelings even when it isn't in their own self-interest. Girls are taught early to respect authority and are often punished more harshly than their brothers if they break the rules. Whatever you think about these cultural norms, when girls and women learn them well, it can make them targets for abuse. What I'm seeing in women's sports is particularly alarming. Instead of putting in place policies that protect girls and women from abuse, people in positions of authority and the organizations responsible for women's sports are enacting policies that subject women to some of the same tactics abusers use on their victims. As a result, female athletes are being trained to develop the same mental habits that abusers develop in their victims. This is especially concerning because women who develop the mental habits that allow them to be victimized by abusers are significantly more likely to be re-victimized in other relationships, romantic and otherwise. The ways in which female athletes are expected to include trans-identifying male athletes in formerly sex-segregated spaces and competitions constitutes the preconditioning necessary to become future victims of abusive relationships of all kinds. So even if you think the current treatment of female athletes is somehow justified, even for the time they spend participating in sports, it cannot be justified to train girls and women to develop the mental habits of abuse victims. That can have a lasting and potentially devastating effect. I'm going to share a set of core tactics used by domestic abusers. The similarities between what abusers do to their targets and what's been happening to female athletes will be apparent. The influence tactics used by abusers begin with testing and training. Abusers test their romantic target. They do things that make their target uncomfortable to see how she responds. The specifics vary, but not the goal. Invade a woman's personal space, breach her personal boundaries, and train her to accept it all without complaint, even with a smile. What do I mean by training? At the same time the abuser's testing, he's also psychologically conditioning his romantic target. Every time the abuser does something that crosses a line and she allows him to get away with it, she's rewarded. If she resists or even hesitates, she's punished. He does something to hurt her feelings and make her feel small, dismissed, and disempowered. This is how abusers gain control of their victim's speech and behavior. Targets quickly learn to give in to the abuse and their abusers often convince them that the abusive treatment is for their own good. Victims of abuse even adopt their abuser's justifications for what's occurring. When friends or family are worried, the victim defends it using the scripted explanations they've been taught. Abusers convince their victims that if they feel uncomfortable with anything he does or demands, her discomfort is her problem. There's something wrong with her. When I described all that, did any light bulbs go off? Did you see the parallels between what abusers do in these relationships and what's being asked of our female athletes when they're expected to allow male athletes into their sports and spaces? When we hear girls explaining away the loss of fair competition rationalizing why their accomplishments shouldn't be prioritized, we should recognize immediately that they've been conditioned, indoctrinated, and taught to surrender. Is this what we want for the women in this world? To be easy prey for abusers? To lose out not only in sports, 
but in every area of their lives because they've been conditioned to submit to manipulation and exploitation, to not stand up for themselves, to never say no. I don't, and I expect you don't either. I'm Dr. Dina McMillan. If you want more information on my work, including the strategy and tactics of abusers I discuss here, please contact me on my website, www.drdinamcmillan.com. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, while they're removing the podium, um, I'll just note that I watched the faces of everybody and um, I think it landed. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I have been talking to Kim about this concern for quite a while, but I don't have the background in domestic abuse and, and strategies and tactics that Dr. McMillan has, and so having her here to talk about that has been so helpful. Um, now I'm going to turn to these four athletes who were subjected to those very same techniques and ask, um, and ask what they see. I'm going to start with Holly. Holly is a cyclist, um, as you heard in her introduction, and, um, and um, Holly told me Tell everybody about how you would choose races. About, man, four years ago, I became aware that locally there were males starting to sign up in the female category. And I kind of banded together with three friends where we would discuss it because we all were in agreement. And we basically started trying to avoid this one individual that raced the series all of us were used to racing. Um, over the years, more have popped up. It's become more difficult. But sometimes you can see start lists who's registered beforehand, so we'd comb them. We would look at um, their social media to try to get an idea of what races they may talk about that they were training for. But the whole intention was that we didn't want to race against males. And there were some races where they would hide the, yeah. Yeah, this past December at Cyclocross Nationals, which is a type of biking, um, they actually hid names of males entered in women's races from the start lists. So all of our names were still visible, but you wouldn't know signing up that a male was in your race. Um, yeah. So, and one of the things that you had told me about was the distress that you felt in watching online the, the comments um, about the male athletes' wins that were being like female athletes were cheering them on and t just t talk a little bit about that. Yeah, after, I mean, the most notable name that people know is Austin Killips and the posts on Instagram, if you would go and read them after, you know, a win or a placement that was high, there were so many women that were either in the race or were cyclists cheering him on, applauding him um, his, for being brave, for getting out there. And I just didn't get it. And you know, you'd read down through you know, the 50th comment, and I would start feeling like, what is wrong? What am I, what am I missing here? Like, am I wrong for feeling this isn't right or fair? And I mean, Long term, I didn't think that way, but in a moment, I would feel so defeated and like, is there something wrong with me? And it was like, I would have to go back to the people who knew this was unfair and just, I guess, get support, get re-energized. But 
you start thinking, is there something wrong? Am I the only person that sees this isn't fair? That's partly a function of not enough people speaking up about it. Um, that's, you know, when people don't speak up, there's a, a, a social psychology term, preference falsification. That's when people pretend they, that they have preferences they don't have. So they, they falsely assert having certain kinds of views. Um, so they either just stay quiet or sometimes even will, you know, say, I would guess that some of the people who were posting positive things didn't feel positive, though many of them may have. Um, and then um, your teams stopped paying for your uh, bike maintenance. Yeah, I was part of a local club or team and when I first joined the team, because I was one of the best mountain bikers in the state, they wanted me on their team, so they gave me perks. And one of them was free labor on my bikes and discounts. And this continued um, for years, and we didn't really talk about their arrangement after it was set up. And going into 2022, I noticed that they started getting charged for labor. And I brought it up just, you know, they had new employees thinking maybe this got missed. They don't know the arrangement. And I was told, no, the shop could no longer afford to support me. But they did this without telling me. And I had to awkwardly ask, you know, what's going on? And from there, and what I guess I didn't mention is in 2021, I had been on the podium with a male. I had beat him, which I don't think matters, but had to stand up there. And I did not put my arms up, as is traditional when you're on the cycling podium. I kind of frowned, had my arms down, and there were a couple pictures of that. And so I do know that my team would have seen those pictures, and my belief is that that's what prompted the labor to stop. And I don't know if you then want you me got to keep an email, going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I then, after asking about the labor, several weeks later, got an email telling me that the team's position on transgender racing in cycling, their position would be coming out. So an email comes out to the whole team and it talks about how the team is fully supporting being inclusive. We want to have transgender participation in cycling which is something I agree with, but just not in the female category. Um, we were told that, or yeah, I guess all of us on the team were told that we need to support this. Um, it's, we should not be bullying and singling out anyone at a race. I guess it, it felt very much like it was implied that's what I did. And they just said at the end that they hoped their position was clear and that we would be in agreement. And then you left the team. Yeah, within a couple of days, I decided to quit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't go on racing for something I didn't believe in, even if it meant like giving up all the perks, which I don't even know that I had anymore. <laughs> So th this is a pretty clear example of exactly what Dr. McMillan was talking about. And, um, uh, and, and the messages that women get, you know, this message, your access to fair competition doesn't matter over and over. If, if you think differently, there's something wrong with you. Um, I think uh, this is similar, Paula, to what um, the messages that you got at Penn um, your 
team was um, was told that you, well, you were on the team before Will transitioned to Leah, so you knew that this was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, and then there were 16 anonymous members of the team who um, made a statement that they were not in favor of this. Um, and then there was a big meeting. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, I'm not sure when the, the letter came in regard, in regards to the meeting, but it was uh, led by Nancy, who's sitting over there. So she helped out with that. So we were really appreciative of... <laughs> um, and uh, also just... Donna uh, is a close family friend of mine, and so prior to any of this happening, I, I had talked to her deeply about what was going on. Um, and in this time, no one really knew about it because there was no large-scale competition where it was very obvious that there was a male competing, right? Because swimming is not a super popular sport, especially at the NCAA level. Obviously, everyone watches the Olympics, but no one really watches the NCAA level of swimming, other than, uh, you know, the, the year that, that this happened. But... Um, yeah, and um, what had happened was is our team and the athletic department ignored the issue for a really, really long time, as long as they could. And it wasn't until the midseason meet in December where the media started to get involved, and that was when the athletic department came in and said there was a mandatory meeting for all athletes on the team. Except Leah. Except Leah, yes. So Leah was notably told to not attend the meeting, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and in this meeting, they told us that we would regret speaking to the media if we did, and it would ruin our chances at getting a job. It would follow you for the rest of your life, and that's not something you would want. And additionally, in this meeting, they also provided a member of the school psychological services, and they said, we are here to help you make you okay with this. Here's counseling services so you feel okay with the, um, the idea of having a male on your team. And in this meeting, they also made it very clear to us that Leah swimming was a non-negotiable. They just said, they said those exact words at the very beginning of the meeting. They said, Leah swimming is a non-negotiable. So they said, we're here to help you talk about how to be comfortable with it. But the debate of whether or not this male is going to be on the team, that's not going to happen because we've already decided that this is going to happen and it's going to happen for the rest of the season. And also at this meeting was somebody from the LGBTQ Center, right? Yeah, they brought in some leader from the LGBT. Q Center, I didn't know who they were, um, but they just sat there and told us that it's very important to be inclusive and that the situation is an inclusivity problem. And um, they also then tried to set up follow-up meetings with the team with the LGBT Center. Um, I don't know how many people attended those. I was, I was not in attendance, but they, uh, they did try to do that as well. And then um, you said the athletic director started attending your practices. Yeah, so actually after this, they sent someone from the athletic department to our training trip to come oversee all of our practices. And then they would always come on deck for all of our meets and all of our practices. And prior to this, uh, the athletic department never cared about the swim team. It was never one of their priorities. Um, but they made it very clear that they were watching over us. It felt very much like someone was just there standing there to make it clear that they saw you and they wanted to make sure that the message that they gave in that meeting at the beginning of December was clear and we were constantly reminded of it for the remainder of the season. So much of this is just surreal. Um, how were you informed that Leah was going to be in the locker room with you? We were never told this formally. Um, at the beginning when we first were when it was first announced in the fall of 2019 that Will Thomas, and again, at the time was not named Leah, was going to be transitioning, we were told we would talk about the locker room, that maybe there would be a, a family locker room or an additional space. We were told everyone was going to be comfortable. But once the season started, Leah had a name on the lockers like anyone else did, and it was never up for debate or discussion whatsoever. And anyone who brought it up just said, Leah is a member of the women's team. Leah will have all the privileges any member of the women's team will have. It sounds like a lot of this like, put together was very intimidating. So um, it's not surprising that the athletes who spoke out at all did it anonymously. Um, there was one, one person who spoke out by name. Is that right? I don't recall. 
during the season? Against it or for it? Against it. it. No, no, no one did during the season. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, During the season, nobody did. Um, And so, um, again, like these intimidation tactics, um, they send the message, your thoughts don't matter, your feelings don't matter, fair competition for you does not matter. You have to put yourself behind the male. Um, and now you, you can speak out because you're not afraid. Um, I, another, um, Kylie also mentioned that one of the things that her team was told um, had to do with being a good team player, right? Being a good teammate. And so talk about a little bit what you feared about speaking out. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of the whole idea, the whole lie that we all kind of bought into was that you couldn't speak out about this, you couldn't have an opinion about it, you couldn't say anything about your feelings about having to share a locker room with a male, having to compete against a male, and be a good and supportive and loving teammate at the same time. And obviously now that I'm out of it, I realize that that was a lie, and just just even the fact that there was a lot of silence around this topic that made it even hard for me to share my feelings fed into this idea that I needed to put my team first. I needed to go to the NCAs. I need to get points for the team. We have team goals. We need want to get a team trophy. Like we need to focus all of the attention on that and anything that takes away from that is hurting the team. Yeah, that's similar to what the Harvard students were, were told in that email. And both of you were in the position of needing to change. Um, Riley, you never had to share the locker room, right? I did. You did? I did. Uh, all of you. So. All of, all of them in the position of having to change in front of a male body. Um, and so this is a, a matter of now thinking about something you never had to think about before, trying to get change while covered is what you were telling me. And then Kylie, you found uh, a room, a, a janitor's storage or something room. Talk about that. Yeah, so a little bit of background about swimming is that we wear these racing suits, these uniforms. They are skin tight, paper thin. They can take a really long time to get on. And so when you are at a big swim meet, you spend a lot of time in the locker room. You're changing out of your, in and out of your practice suit to go do your warm ups, and then you're changing in and out of your racing suit because you have to only wear it for your race because they um, can only last so long. And so, yeah, I was faced with this situation, me and Riley both, where we had to change in the locker room where Leah could also be changing. And I changed in there the first day and I was incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly on edge, even when he wasn't in there. And the way that I handled it was to actually change in the storage closet that was behind my team's bleachers. And obviously it wasn't as nice as the locker room. There was a lot of equipment in there and it was dark, but I was at, in that moment, I was just so thankful that I had a private place to change, even if it was a storage closet. And this is a, this, that particular thing really struck me, that, that you were in a position where you felt grateful to have a closet to change in. This, this was very striking, and again, really reinforces for me the emotional manipulation that is very similar to being a, a victim of abuse that you start to become grateful for the days you're not hit, for example. Um, And um, and then at the, uh, talk about the t-shirts, the Title IX t-shirts. Oh, I should have brought it down here. (laughs) Have it with me. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so partially during the meet, uh, I don't remember what day it was, but we were leaving a prelim session and the NCAA staff was handing out all of these t-shirts and, you know, of course picked one up and was looking at it as I was going out of the pool and just, you know, to my horror, it says celebrating celebrating 50 years of Title IX on it, and I'm just like, is this like, is this like a joke? I, I just didn't really understand, um, you know, what the point of handing out T-shirts about Title IX, which was created to give women an par- opportunity to compete at the very meet that they were going against that entire principle. The inversions are everywhere, Riley. Was that the race at which you were first aware that there would be a male in your locker room? Um, This was my first time being directly in that space, but I became aware of Leah Thomas earlier in the season. 
um, and, and how I became aware of Thomas, it's very different than, than Paula, who has, had been on a team with Will and knew this was happening in 2019. So she dealt with this, this process for three years, okay? I didn't find out about this until November of 2021, where um, I was competing for a national championship. I had made it my goal to become a national champion in the 200 freestyle. And about middle of the season, I was right on pace to achieve that by the end of the season. Um, I was ranked a few one hundredths of a second behind the girl who was, who was in second place in the country. Um, but this name, who was leading the country by body lengths, I had never heard of. And that was the first time I became aware of a swimmer named Leah Thomas. Um, a lot of head scratching. I, I had never heard this name. They were a senior. They were from University of Pennsylvania, which doesn't historically put swimmers in that position to achieve. Sorry, Paula. No, to it's, achieve it's a national championship. True. It's completely true. Kentucky doesn't either. So, so there's no there's no slamming there. Um, UK is not known for that. Um, schools like NC State are. Um, but I was just like, who is this person who's leading the country again by body lengths? And in swimming, this is a sport that's measured down to the hundredth of a second. Like I mentioned, I was in third hundredths of a second behind the girl who was in second. Um, so to have this person leading by body lengths, it didn't make sense until an article came out. Um, and in this article, in a blip of a sentence, as if we were supposed to just read right over it, it says, Leah Thomas is formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team and then carried on as if it, it didn't say that. Um, and so I read this and I was so shocked. Um, of course, I was shocked. But really, I felt a sense of relief because then I was able to look up who Will Thomas was because I was curious. There was a sense of intriguement almost. Who is this person? Is this a lateral movement? Did this person go from ranking at the top to now continuing to rank at the top? which is, of course, not what we saw. We saw that the year prior, Thomas competing against the men ranked 462nd at best, meaning he's mediocre when competing against the men, to now dominating against the women. So that was the first time I became aware of Leah Thomas. And again, this is November of 2021, and that national championships wasn't until March of 2022. Uh, so there's a few months in between. But in those months, my experience is pretty different than Paula and Kylie's because I was team captain of my team and I made it clear from the beginning of this that I would facilitate these conversations, not in a way that made anyone feel pressured to agree with what I was saying, but I wanted everyone to know they could freely say how they felt. Again, regardless of if it was in agreement with me or not, but what I found on my team was of the 40 girls, 38 of them agreed with me and two of them did not. Um, and I think that speaks volumes. I think that is much more indicative of, of how the population at whole really is represented. Um, 38 of us were on the same page, which, was, which allowed us to be able to talk freely about it with our coaches, and to which my coaches agreed with me, to which then he was able to talk about it with our athletic director, and our athletic director was in full support of our stance. And so I just made it clear um, that I, I knew I, I was in a position of, of leadership amongst our team, and I would, I would make sure that no one felt silenced. Um, so I felt, I, and I, I think this speaks too of why I kind of felt comfortable and confident in speaking out earlier, is because I had that support. I had that support from my team, from my family. I didn't lose any friends over this. I never felt canceled um, by any means. And when I called my athletic director to tell him that I was going to really ask him. I asked him, you know, like, this is what happened. This is how we feel. How do you feel if we speak out? And again, he knew how, how we felt. And he said, Riley, I love you. I support you. He said, I would support whatever stance you took, but speak your heart. I will never forget him saying, speak your heart. It gives me chills. He said, speak your heart, stay true to your convictions, and don't worry about painting this university in a bad light because we're behind you. And I will never... <laughs> I just think that's a testament of what support and kind of that backing, even though it was minimal, right? All he was saying is the bare minimum, right? It goes back to, we wanted the bare minimum for asking for a safe place to undress. We're asking for the bare minimum. And he gave me that bare minimum of saying, I love you and I'm here for you. This is what every female athlete ought to be able to expect. Like you said, as bare minimum, that you are entitled to your own opinions 
You are entitled to your own thoughts and nobody is going to shut you up. And I, when he told me this, I did think nothing of it because that is what I expected. I thought nothing of him saying, I speak your heart, stay true to your convictions. Really, I hung up the phone. Okay, thanks, bye. I thought <laughs> nothing of it. Not a thing. When did you realize that this was a really unusual kind of attitude on the part of the, the support people around you? When girls began reaching out to me privately by the thousands after this meet, girls who were on that pool deck, Olympians, a lot of really, really, really well-known names, um, outside of even just the sport of swimming, male, female athletes, coaches, coaches would reach out to me privately, me, a 22-year-old girl at the time who had, actually 21-year-old girl at the time who had no idea what I was doing, they were reaching out to me and saying, thank you for doing this. And at first, I, I still didn't realize those messages came in, and I kind of felt honored. I felt pretty humbled by this, you know, like there's a lot of support here. But then came the backlash. Um, then came the name calling. And I kind of looked to those people like, hey, guys, I'm getting a lot of this name calling. Who wants to take some <laughs> with me? And no one would. <laughs> and so that's when I kind of began asking the question of why, uh, right? The, this, this groundbreaking question of why, you know, like why, why not? And then that's when I realized the silencing measures. And, and this isn't to say that I didn't face any. I did. I had to go to media training. I had to learn how to use she, her pronouns through my university. Um, they told, and I'm sure we can get into this in a bit. So, so there were some silencing tactics. Um, but I, I didn't realize how thankful I was for my athletic department and my university and really the SEC at large um, until I started having those conversa conversations and people like Paula began sharing with me what they went through. It, it really speaks to the importance of having a support system that... Um, allows people in positions where saying something, I mean, this is, a, this is an area in which you immediately become very unpopular when you say certain things. And people know this, and not a lot of people are willing to be unpopular, or at least not that unpopular. Um, not a lot of people have the kind of support system, and certainly not, a, apparently not a lot of female athletes, had the kind of support system that Riley had, and especially not at the Ivies, where they were given, you know, lots of daily doses of the opposite message. Um, it's important to recognize that the bullies win when people don't speak up. This has been a, 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 um, a theme this whole this whole conference, Jennifer Say said this, people the, yesterday said it is important to speak up, but the thing that people don't recognize is the more people speak up, the less courage it takes to speak up. And once there is a tipping point, everything goes in the other direction. And all the people here are waiting for that tipping point, right? Because it's, I, I want you to think about what happened to Harvey Weinstein. For years, he was able to uh, get away with all kinds of horrible behavior because when one woman spoke up, she could be dealt with. But at a certain point, one woman spoke up and then quickly another one and then quickly another one and then there were 80 women and he could not do away with them and they won. And that is what needs to happen here. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to throw it out uh, to, to the audience for questions. But the question is, you have all dealt with being told not to speak to the media, not to speak out on this. And Riley, tell us about that experience that you had. Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, we became aware of this middle of my senior season. And all of my three years prior competing at the NCAA championships, which again, it's, it's really the fastest meet in the world, um, short course especially. These are, this is, it's the highest level in college swimming. Um, it's your meet you train all year for. And I think we can all agree swimming is not a sport that garners that media attention, so naturally we wouldn't have media training. Um, 
by my senior year, about two or so weeks before our national championships, um, we had our sports information director come to our practice and say, all of the NCAA qualifiers, you know, come with me. We're doing media training. So I'm like, this is weird. Why? Okay. Um, they must expect some big, pretty big things from us. <laughs> and so I go into this room and she sits us down and she has a slideshow and, and essentially get to the point of it is she's teaching us how to use pronouns correctly or I would say incorrectly. And so I was so shocked by this. Me, again, being 21 years old, a senior in college studying human health sciences, taking all the organic chemistries and the biologies and genetics and, and all of the hard classes, and they're teaching me how to use pronouns. I'm like, this isn't even something you learn in school because you don't have to. This is something you just know, yet I'm a, in, a senior in college and they're teaching me this. And I, I made it very clear, I don't understand why we're here. Um, Ultimately, that's when they had a meeting with only the freestylers, which would be the only people directly competing against Thomas, to reinforce the importance of this. And they told us that if any, any media requests come our way, we had to send it to them. Uh, no, n nothing, any, nothing else. Just if you get any media requests, send it to us and we'll help you. So I was like, okay. And of course, this, this meet did get a lot of media attention where there was reporters and on all sides, left-leaning, right-leaning, everything in between, who were there desperately hoping to get a quote from someone that they and could this take. this was the meet that you tied. Right, yes. Um, desperately hoping they could take back to their publisher and be like, hey, look, I did it. Um, but no one would provide them a quote. Um, but my inbox was filled. They would find your name on the heat sheet. And I, I think after Thomas and I tied in the 200, um, they were like, we need to get a quote from her. And so my inbox was filled. And so... I started forwarding them to my sports information director like she told us to do. And she responded back, she texted me back and she said, thanks, I declined them for you. And I was like, <laughs> that was never the agreement. Um, I didn't ask you to do that. You told us to forward these to you because you would help us respond. Um, and she responded back and said, remember our conversation and remember the name you wear on your shirts or on your swimsuit or on your cap and remember who you represent. Um, and I want to say, I think the first time that I learned, and again, what made this easy, easier, I shouldn't say easy, easier for me, the first time I learned how to, to stick up for myself um, in terms of these higher authorities was during COVID. Um, we were told we had to get the vaccine. Um, we were told if you don't get the, it was, it was very similar tactics. If you don't get the vaccine, then this, or all of these silly things that, that in my head did not up. You can't make me do something. Um, and kind of more out of defiance than anything, I said, no, um, I won't be getting the vaccine. That's not something you can make me do, to which they told me I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to play or swim. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to travel for me, it's especially if I didn't get it. I would spend three weeks out of the water, whereas everyone else only had to spend five days. If I didn't get it, then I had to wear my mask all the time, and, and the vaccinated individuals didn't have to wear their mask. It was all of these fear tactics. But I learned how, right then and there how to say no, and I think that helped me here learn how to say no, you don't tell me what to do. I was a very coachable person, believe it or not. I actually was. <laughs> um, but I do think it's that, a little, that little piece of defiant in me um, that really struck me. Um, these people in authority, they were, they were overstepping their boundaries entirely, and I, I'm pretty fortunate that I was able to see it pretty clearly um, throughout the whole time. And so the media training... Um, I will say at first it was hard when I did begin to speak up like um, the pronoun issue, right? It is because I ultimately I do want to be respectful. I do want to be compassionate. I do want to handle this issue with composure and, and with understanding. But you can do that without lying. And then it, it hit me. And I did a few interviews where I, I you know, the pronoun, it was hard for me to learn. Um, but ultimately I decided it is compassionate to tell the truth. It is kind, all of those terms that we were having thrown at our face on the back of these shirts that they passed out, um, celebrating Title IX, including inclusion and welcoming and acceptance and, and all of these things. Telling the truth is those things. 
lying, that's, that's the exact opposite. Um, so I won't say it wasn't hard, but I, I could see it pretty clearly. Yeah. Um, do we have a microphone for um, people who want to, because I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. I think we do, yeah. Okay, so uh, Lisa, I see a question over there. Wait, the microphone is coming. Wait for the microphone. No, you can't because they want to get it on the video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> coming. I don't know how to do anything without swearing. Um, thank you all for sharing these stories, and Pamela, you're you're really good at this. Aww, um, thank you. I am curious because I'm a lot older than all of you and was raised very hardcore lefty feminist and I'm and I'm curious about what it's like for younger women and who grew up um, assuming rights that women in earlier generations really had to fight hard for everything from you know, not being legally raped by their husbands to having credit cards in their own names. These are only a few decades old, these wins. Um, so I was wondering what, how, if, if any way, this changed your relationship to feminism or how you think about women's rights, and if you thought about those before this. I can start by just kind of saying it's changed my view entirely, and I, I kind of briefly funny, like being kind of funny yesterday, said I never thought I would be described as a feminist, um, because my understanding of, of feminism um, I guess I kind of had a skewed perception before all of this, right? Because I most certainly believe men and women are created equal, but I do believe we're different. And so when I saw the original Me Too movement, um, it, it didn't seem as if it was understanding that we were created differently um, or, or we had differences. And so I never would have thought of myself as a feminist. But now, how I call myself really is a modern day feminist, which just means that women are entitled to respect. Um, there are two sexes and you can't change your sex. Um, that's how I consider it. But I think this is perfectly highlighted in, I mean, we could probably list several examples um, of how the tables have turned, right? From the party who once embraced feminism and to now it's, it is Republicans or the right who is kind of seizing this opportunity to, to protect women's sex-based protections and rights. But even my home state of Tennessee, we were the 36th state to pass legislation that gave women the right to vote. But now, as mentioned by Hadley yesterday, we were the second state to define what a woman is. And so I think even if you look at examples throughout history, we've seen this perception flip. Um, and I think I fall in line with kind of how that perception has flipped. It's like first wave feminism all over again. Um, yeah, we have a question here, Kara. Coming, Kara. I just want to say as I'm walking up to Kara, no matter your generation or where your allegiance is, all hail the defiant woman. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, thank you all. This has been so great to hear your stories. Um, so my question is for Paula. Um, well, when all of this was going on, um, a woman named Amanda Stuhlman, who runs an organization called Keep Prison Single Sex, wrote an amazing, amazing letter. And I can say that because I had nothing to do with writing it. She did everything. Um, but, but she did ask me to sign it. And so I signed it both in my capacity as president of WDI USA and in my capacity as an alum of UPenn Law. So, but, but it was such a good letter because it, it was addressed to... I think it was HR at Penn, or someone in Penn, as well as the district attorney of Philadelphia, explaining all of the reasons at why Thomas ought to have been charged criminally for being in the women's locker room. Now, of course, we didn't get a response to that letter. We didn't expect a response to that letter. But I'm curious, was there ever any talk within Penn, any serious talk of of bringing any kind of disciplinary charges or any kind of repercussions against Thomas? So um, I've never heard about this, so that should be enough of an answer. That was not something that was ever brought to our attention on the team. Um, no, there was never a discussion about this being something that I now, being a year and a half removed from it, understand it being sexual harassment. It is 
the university subjected us to sexual harassment to be in a situation where we are present with a man with male anatomy while we're undressing. It's not comfortable, and it was something that was very challenging for me. Um, I mean, I haven't talked about this a lot, but I, I had nightmares. I'm going to get choked up. I had nightmares every single week that I was there on that team that um, they were inviting a man to come in there and do things to us. <laughs> Sorry. I don't normally get choked up about this, but just the way you're bringing it up. Um, they subjected us to that every single day. We have two practices a day where you have to change out of your street clothes into your suit and out from your suit back into your street clothes twice a day, every single day. And they never once brought any of that to our attention that, you know, we had a claim for feeling like that. It was harassment. And they just told us we needed therapy to get over that. And to this day, it's still something that in the moment, I just told myself I had to get through it. And now being removed from it, it's still so challenging for me to talk about and to think about the fact that they subjected us to that. The fact that they subjected 40 girls to being sexually harassed. And they invited for any man, not just someone who identified as a woman, to be allowed to come into our spaces and to be allowed to do whatever they wanted to us and watch us unchanged for as long as they wanted. And I will say at the NCAA level, um, again, we weren't forewarned. Again, she dealt with this for three years. Um, maybe not in the locker room the entirety of that three years. I dealt with this at one meet. Um, I walked into that locker room. Again, we were not forewarned. We would be sharing this changing space to seeing a six foot four. Wikipedia says six foot one. That's a lie. Um, Thomas is six foot four. A six foot four, 22 year old man undressing with male parts exposed, inches away from where we were undressing. And so I immediately left the locker room and went up to one of the NCAA officials on the pool deck and said, look, I understand the guidelines for the competition, but what are the guidelines for the locker room that allowed a male with male genitalia to be undressing? And this goes back to the testing and training because so nonchalantly, he responds with, oh, well, we actually got around this by making the locker rooms unisex. So first of all, this, this, was, this was my initial thought. One, by admitting you have to change the rules, you're admitting this isn't a woman. You're admitting it, and you know you are, first of all. Um, and second of all, unisex? So any, that, that picture that you had on the slide, that's what, we, that's what we went through. Any man could have walked into that locker room, not just, not just Thomas, any coach, any official, any parent, any pervert who wanted to be in that locker room had full access to it. And bare minimum, we weren't even told about this, this arrangement. Imagine that if, imagine you, you, um, you graduate from college and become a dentist and uh, you go to a dentist convention and at the convention they tell you, in order to be a dentist, you have to undress in front of one of the male dentists. I mean, nobody would put it, imagine any other, any other situation where 40 women or more in this, you know, but 40 women twice a day have to undress in front of a male in order to retain the privilege to do the thing that they're there to do. This boggles my mind. This is not consent. Nobody consented to that. What I, and I was saying this to Ramey the other day. What, what happened to consent culture? I thought that that was where everything was. Um, do we have another question? Yeah, here, we ha here, we have Linda Blade. Okay. <laughs> um, Linda Blade. Thank you, all four of you are just amazing. Um, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm thinking back to when I was in university and I, whew, whatever you had to deal with is, is way more than anything we did in our day. Um, so I have a question and I, a couple questions real quick. So Riley, when you said that that media request was forwarded and then you got that reply, did you ever then go ahead and go back to the original 
request and just go ahead and do it anyway? Yeah, that's, that's the defiancy I was talking about. <laughs> I did. Um, I very quickly let her know that was not my intention of forwarding you the request. That was never something that had been discussed. Um, therefore, essentially, I was ignoring. I'm going to ignore you, I told her. Um, and since then, and I know this is coming from the administration, because since then, she's reached out to me personally several times and applauded me for what I'm doing. So I know this wasn't her, and I know this wasn't her feelings, and I, and I really like her. I know this was coming from the administration for those reasons. Which leads me to my final question. Um, do you think all of that had any impact on the NC2A at all? Like, are, are they going to change, do you think, at all? The NCAA has now taken um, entirely a hands-off approach. So, Cowards. So basically they're showing now, we knew this before, but they're showing now that they're spineless. Um, <laughs> they're taking a hands-off approach, and so what they're doing is they're phasing out. I think there's three or four or something phases to where um, they're going to leave it up to each sport's specific governing body. So swimming would ultimately be governed by USA Swimming and FINA and, and those regulations because the NCAA wants no hands in this. And that tells you again that they know it's wrong. When they want to remove themselves, they know that it's not ethical. They know that it's not fair. And, and that's why they're ridding themselves of the responsibility. If they really stood by what happened, if they really stood by how they acted, they would stand by it, right? just like Target hasn't done, just like Bud Light has not done, who's now introducing these really awesome camo cans and they have these burly <laughs> men on motorcycles riding around. They're not standing by what they're doing because they know it's wrong. And they know that the majority of people, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, the majority of people know this is wrong and they know that too. Um, and Kim and Marshy can attest to this. There was an NCAA... Um, conference where they were announcing their NCAA Woman of the Year, which was an award that I was nominated for. And I was so honored when I was nominated for this because this is the most prestigious award for a collegiate female athlete. It's something that encompasses your athletic achievement, um, but also your academics, which I was the SEC Scholar Athlete of the Year, but also your community service, which is something that I am still incredibly passionate about. And I was also the SEC Community Service Leader of the Year, which means I threw a lot of scholarship money away. Um, but anyways, I was so honored to receive this nomination for NCAA Woman of the Year, to which was not exclusive to just women, because University of Pennsylvania nominated Leah Thomas as their, their sole pick but of, of their whole athletic department for NCAA Woman of the Year. And so we went to this conference, but of course we did not go in support. Um, we were able to, with the help of ICONS and a coalition of other groups, um, it, it was really phenomenal. And again, these are groups who, who lean all along that political spectrum. It was really powerful because I think, and it, that shows how this really is a unifying issue, unlike you would probably guess if you saw it in the media. Um, but we were able to directly hand the NCAA hand to hand. This is the farthest still anyone has gotten to, to conversing with the NCAA about this. Hand to hand, a petition with nearly, I think, 11,000 signatures garnered in just a few days telling the NCAA to stop discriminating against women. And on top of that, ICONS issued a legal demand letter, um, which told them that if they don't stop discriminating on the basis of sex, which again is what the law implements, um, Title IX, then there would be legal action. Um, but at this conference, we, ICONS, ultimately ended up buying a, a booth in this convention hall that they had. I applied with my name. Um, I had been outspoken at this point. Um, denied. I was like, oh, that's weird. I'm trying to give you $2,000. Um, I applied again. Denied. And then, of course, ICONS stepped in, and, and they were able to get a booth. And so um, we passed out pamphlets and, and little bracelets talking about Title IX. And every single athletic director... Because, again, this was a, a large-scale convention. All athletic directors and, and chancellors and presidents of universities were there. And every single athletic director who walked by, we would tell them, you know, why we're here, what we're advocating for, and they would say, thank you for doing what you're doing. You know, keep fighting. You know, this is great. We support you. In, in a whispering tone, right? And as, I, at least this is how I felt, I felt like the first six years or so, I was super encouraged. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is awesome. Everyone agrees. But then as it only continued... 
I began to, I think we all began to feel frustrated. If we're all on the same page, where is the discrepancy? Why are we catering to the minority if we all really feel the same here? And that's when we began asking the question of why. And, and Marcy and Kim, they would say, okay, that's great. Would you be willing to say so publicly? Oh, no. Uh, we can't have lawsuits. Uh, you know, I have a family. I can't lose my job. And then would very quickly turn and, and walk away and alleviate themselves from the conversation entirely. Um, and so I think that shows how this pressure, this social external pressure, isn't just on athletes. Um, it is on the administrators, it is on the coaches, it is on, I think, even the president of the NCAA, Mark Emmert, who pu pro uh, publicly released a statement in the following days of that national championships and said, word for word, and I remember it because it's hilarious, he said, I unequivocally stand in my decision to allow Leah Thomas to swim with the women because it's based in evolving science. <laughs> <laughs> but privately, at this same conference, um, to our group of women, he says, keep doing what you're doing. And now he's stepped down, and, I, and I, I have to imagine that maybe he's realized, maybe his moral compass is returning, and he's ultimately ashamed of himself, is what I'm hoping. Not that I'm hoping he's ashamed, but I actually am. Um, well, he should be ashamed of himself. Yes. I mean, pe this is what I was saying before about people who publicly say the thing that makes them popular and privately say supportive things to the people who aren't. And that has got to stop. We all have to encourage, and one of the ways we have to do this is we have to be the support. We have to put together groups that like this. Icons is so amazing. Uh, but we each individually need to have a group of people who will come to the rescue who will be, when somebody's being attacked, who will be the people who will stand behind them and stand with them and stand aside and say, we are with you. It is psychologically damaging to give women the message that they don't matter. It is psychologically damaging. This is a, an arena that's supposed to develop leaders. And at Kentucky, a leader was able to do what a leader is supposed to do because the leader was given the room to lead. But in these other arenas, in other schools, these potential leaders are being shut down. It is undermining female empowerment and self-confidence and leadership to tell women to shut up. We have got to make it stop. The governing bodies in women's sports have to enact policies that will make it stop. It has to be fair competition. We have to protect women's mental health. We have to protect women's dignity. We cannot subject women in sports or anywhere to these kinds of mental manipulations that make women susceptible to being subjugated again. I'm sorry, I'm like, <laughs> so. um, we are out of time. So um, I just want to thank Dr. McMillan and all of these amazing athletes. Olympic rower and <laughs> orthopedic surgeon to introduce our next session. Thank you. Okay. All right, can you hear me? I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Mary O'Connor. I chair the Icons Rowing Chapter. And first, I want to acknowledge some of my Icons Rowing leaders that are in the audience Val McLean. Ann Simpson and Pat Spratland Edom that you met earlier today. Thank you, ladies, for all your support. We have a larger group, but they're, they're here today. I'm honored to introduce this session on law because law reflects our values. One of my fundamental values is that girls and women have equal status and equal opportunity in our society. That opportunity that women's sports provided me to ultimately be an Olympian has influenced my entire professional career, 
where I am a minority as one of only 7% of women orthopedic surgeons in the country. And when I started my training, I was one of 3%. Rowing is my sport. U.S. rowing blatantly discriminates against women. It allows any male athlete who identifies as a woman to compete as a woman. Restrictions apply in only two scenarios. First, at the international level, where world rowing rules of testosterone suppression for 24 months at 2.5 nanomoles per liter level applies. And the second for mixed boats, namely a boat of both men and women, in which U.S. rowing requires the boat to be 50% male and 50% female. And Sharon Davies commented on this yesterday. This is the only place in the entire policy where sex, where male and female is used. So in what can only be interpreted as the height of misogyny, U.S. rowing requires sex as an eligibility criteria only when not doing so would compromise fairness for men, okay? Because they could then be competing against a mixed boat, which was 50% men and maybe a, f a couple females and maybe some males who identify as women. So that's the only place where sex is specified as an eligibility criteria when not doing so would compromise fairness for men. And we continue to work on pressuring U.S. rowing um, to change that their very discriminatory policy. So I, I want to go back to the law because one law that shaped my life is Title IX. And as a first year student at Yale University in 1976, I started rowing. I come from a time when there were no teams, sports teams for girls in my high school. I am like a Title IX baby. Um, so I started rowing at Yale and we had no locker room at the boathouse. Of course, the men's team did. So in what is heralded as the first stand for Title IX in college athletics, my teammates and I stripped in front of the Yale athletic director with Title IX written on our bare chests and backs. Our captain, I'll show a picture tomorrow from it. Um, our captain started, read a statement that started with, these are the bodies that Yale is exploiting. Our story was picked up by the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune, and the university was embarrassed into action, and we had a locker room the following spring. And I just want to, thank you, but I just want to call out the irony. I stripped with Title IX written on my bare chest and backs because we didn't have a locker room. We got a locker room, and now we don't have locker rooms again because, because because all these women no longer have the right to have their own locker room. So it's very, very troubling. Um, and one of the reasons why I've, I've kind of re-engaged in um, all of this sporting advocacy for women in sports. So law matters. And I'm really delighted to introduce the, the lawyers that we will have in this session. And the first is Christiana Kiefer. She is senior counsel with ADF, the Alliance Defending Freedom. She's a lead attorney on several U.S. federal cases contesting Title IX and women's sports, including Soleil versus Connecticut Association of Schools, which originated in 2017. Christiana will share recent federal court rulings relevant to the recognition of women and provide some insight on what we can expect for these cases going forward including ultimately how and when the Supreme Court of the United States will weigh in, might weigh in, but I think ultimately will need to weigh in. Our second speaker, Bill Bach, was the general counsel of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency from 2007 to 2020 and the lead lawyer in the U.S. ADA's investigation of doping by Lance Armstrong and teammates, which broadened into an international investigation of doping in cycling. Bill has collaborated with expert legal teams around the world and has unique insights into the efforts of governing bodies to ensure a level playing field. 
He has regularly handled cases before the International Court of Arbitration for Sport and served as a sports arbitrator and on boards addressing eligibility and integrity issues for multiple sports organizations. Our third speaker, lawyer Catherine Deves, is here from Australia. Catherine is a lawyer, mother of three daughters. She became concerned at the erasure of sex and policy and legislation in favor of gender identity and what this would mean for the rights of women and girls. In October 2020, Catherine joined forces with women in New Zealand. Where's Ro? Right there. There you are, Ro. Um, and co-founded Save Women's Sports Australasia with no one in Australia, when no one in Australia was speaking up for girls and women. In 2022, Catherine was selected as the Liberal Party candidate in Warringha in the federal election. During the campaign, she was subjected to relentless and vicious attacks by the Australian media and members of her own party due to her gender critical views. While unsuccessful in her political bid, the experience strengthened her resolve as she continues the fight to protect women's sex-based rights. She is now a lead counsel for one of the biggest cases in Australia directly contesting women's sex-based rights. So I'd ask you to join me in a warm welcome for all of our speakers, and we will be starting with Christiana. Thank you so much. All right, well, good afternoon. I have the privilege of representing brave female athletes across the country in lawsuits to defend fairness and safety for women in sports. They are my inspiration in going to work every day, and they are genuinely having an impact on the legal landscape as it pertains to protecting women's sports. But before we talk about lawsuits, I want to start with just a brief orientation about laws protecting female athletes in order to lay just a bit of a foundation. Let's see here. Of course, where else could we start but Title IX? Title IX is our classic U.S. federal law passed over 50 years ago that prohibits discrimination in education and athletics. I want to offer just two quick orienting points about Title IX. Number one. There is no legal ambiguity about the definition of sex in Title IX. Until about a half second ago, sex was universally understood in law to mean biological sex. The statutory language of Title IX itself, not fully captured here, commonly references one sex and the other sex, clearly evidencing a recognition of a binary. And no Supreme Court decision, including Bostock versus Clayton County, which many of you may be familiar with, changes that analysis, all right? Bostock specifically recognized that transgender status and sex are two, quote, distinct concepts. So Bostock did not change the definition of sex in Title IX. Number two, Title IX clearly provides for separation between the sexes where biological differences matter. Typically, if you think about it, no discrimination on the basis of sex would implicate sex blindness, right? That would mean you could not take sex into account. But Title IX doesn't exactly say that. The text of Title IX specifically allows for sex-separated sleeping quarters, human sexuality classes, even father-son and mother-daughter events. And of course, its implementing regulations specifically allow for sex separation in private spaces and of course, most importantly for our purposes here, in sports as well, where competition um, or contact is involved. So at the risk of stating the obvious, it is absurd on its face to claim that Title IX protects on the basis of gender identity. It does not. It is fundamentally incompatible with protecting on the basis of sex. I love this quote from the Supreme Court in the United States versus Virginia. It says, while classifications based on sex are generally disfavored, as I think we would all agree, the Supreme Court has recognized that, quote, sex classifications may be used to compensate women for particular economic disabilities they've suffered, to promote equal employment opportunity, and to advance the full development of the talent and capacities of our nation's people. 
Well, even though Title IX might be clear in its face, that doesn't mean government bureaucrats are. And we've certainly seen some conflicting interpretations from various presidential administrations, such that state lawmakers within the last three years have really stepped up to the plate and started to pass women's sports laws that we affectionately dub Save Women's Sports Laws. You can see here, nearly half of US states now has a law on the books protecting fair competition for female athletes. That's 22 states. North Carolina is currently working on a veto override, and I hope that uh, in the next few weeks they might make state number 23. Now just note, this, these laws apply to scholastic sports. They do not apply to professional. Now, the majority of these state laws are based on Alliance Defending Freedom's model legislation, which ensures three things. Number one, a clear definition of biological sex, in case we had any confusion about that point. Number two, clear protections for the female category, kindergarten through college. And number three, a private right of action, which is essentially legal speak for girls have the right to sue if their rights are violated. Based on our work in this area over the last four years, this type of policy is the most legally defensible. And you'll notice, you heard earlier today, it also is the most defensible in other categories as well, such as the science. Isn't that nice how that all is very symbiotic? But a sex-based female sports protection is unambiguous, it is easy to assess, and it's easy to administer. But perhaps most importantly, in the context of law, it is almost a perfect tie to advancing the government's interest in offering women and girls opportunities in sports. In other words, athletic ability is a sex-linked trait, as you've heard much about. And so categorizing based on sex is a legal proxy for categorizing based on athletic ability, which is critical for winning under an equal protection claim. But conversely, if you categorize based on gender identity, there's no athletic connection there whatsoever. So I frankly think that's frank legally indefensible. It would be very difficult to win an equal protection challenge if a policy said we're gonna categorize based on gender identity because it simply doesn't have that appropriate connection to athletic ability. Think about this, if we have two male athletes, one who wants to compete on the male's team, identifies as male, He's forced to compete on the male's team, not allowed in the female category. We have another male athlete, similar, comparable ability, wants to compete on the female team because he identifies as female. If you have a policy that allows that second male athlete to compete on the female team, you suddenly have disparate treatment between the two. They're similarly situated, they're both male, comparable athletic ability. That makes the policy suspect uh, under equal protection principles. Similar with testosterone suppression. If you've got a testosterone suppression policy, males with testosterone below a certain threshold are allowed on the female team. Well, what about the, the male athlete who has naturally occurring low testosterone? Those individuals do exist. Does that mean as a matter of policy, we're gonna start putting those individuals on the female team as well? I don't think so. But our sports policy uh, lawmakers don't seem to be thinking that through very well. Well. That's a very quick survey of some of the laws. Let's turn out of lawsuits. Just because you have a good law in the books does not mean those legal rights necessarily remain protected. They must be defended. Depending on how you count them, there are currently 12 lawsuits around the United States on the issue of women's sports. I like to think about them in four buckets. Uh, number one, lawsuits by female athletes against sports organizations or their school districts. Number two, lawsuits by male athletes who are challenging these new women's sports laws, demanding access to female teams. Number three, lawsuits by state governments, actually pushing back against government overreach, where administrations are trying to reinterpret Title IX to include gender identity. And then number four, lawsuits in the professional space. I know that is a lot of information. We're going to go pretty quickly, um, so I apologize for that in advance. Number one, lawsuits by female athletes. Of course, the first one filed in 2020. Uh, these are my incredibly brave female athlete clients. Selena Soul, Chelsea Mitchell, Alana Smith. I hope you're all familiar with them and their stories. Yes, absolutely. They deserve that. Think about the incredible courage that it took as 15 and 16 year old girls to be some of the very first in the nation to speak out on this issue and say this is not fair. And they took the incredibly difficult approach of actually suing 
their school athletic associate, their athletic association, their school districts, and the school districts of the male athletes as well. Of course, Connecticut's policy was some of the most radical, I think, in the country. Any policy that allows males into the women's category is wrong, but Connecticut's policy was a pure self-ID, nothing beyond that. And one male athlete actually competed in the men's category for three seasons, turned around two weeks later, and began to compete in and dominate in the female category. Oh, and by the way, he never made it to a state championship event in the men's category, but he certainly vaulted to success, we'll put it, put it mildly, in the female category. The district court in Connecticut, after we filed their lawsuit in 2020, sat on their case for 14 months and essentially waited for the male athletes to graduate, which, of course, in the natural course of things, they did. This, of course, was the same judge who directed us, their attorneys, not to use words like biological male because we needed to use more scientifically accurate terms like transgender female. So we actually, you can, I guess you can see what we were up against in that particular litigation before that particular judge. Nevertheless, the judge, after sitting on our case for 14 months, dismissed it and said, there's nothing here to see, nothing to do, because the males have graduated, your clients have graduated. Well, of course, that's wrong. Our girls lost records. Chelsea Mitchell, the uh, athlete in the middle, she four times was the fastest female athlete in a state championship race. You all know what that means to a high school female athlete to make it to that point. Four times she walked away without the gold medal and without the public recognition because a male athlete crossed the finish line first. So these girls have records that need to be fixed. They need to be rightly acknowledged for their accomplishments. There's been a lot of, yes, exactly. It's been a windy procedural history that I will not bore you with. I recognize it's after lunch. But just in June, the entire panel of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals decided to rehear their case. Basically, we're still at the starting line. Are we going to be able to make their full case under Title IX? Do they have the opportunity to be in court? And I'm delighted to say, thanks to the the support of so many of you in the room filing amicus briefs, talking about their cases online, the public support they received was just tremendous. And we walked out of court in June, really being thankful that we were us and we were not the other side. I think we are uh, optimistic that we will win this, but a win here means we return to the district court to fully litigate their case under Title IX. Just a couple quick notes on this. One, human stories matter. They impact policymaking. These Connecticut athletes, when they first stepped out, utterly terrified, had no idea what type of movement we would see over the course of the next three years. And in fact, their stories really triggered, I probably shouldn't have used that word, uh, their stories really inspired the state lawmakers across the country in that first wave of passing women's sports laws. So you never know how your story and simply being public about it can impact, frankly, the course of history. Second, we should, and I think we will, see more and more of these female athlete filed lawsuits. I hope that as female athletes find their voice and are willing to hold those in power accountable, that we'll get to the point where the school administrators are more afraid of being sued by the entire team of female athletes than they are by one male who doesn't like the sex-based policy. We need to get to that point. The second category of lawsuits that we're seeing, this is really the primary area I'm litigating right now, it's the busiest, are lawsuits filed by male athletes against states that have um, passed women's sports laws. But I want you to recognize, keep in mind that 22 states have passed these laws, only seven so far have been challenged. The vast majority of them are fully in effect and are protecting female athletes today in scholastic sports. The first case that was filed was in Idaho in 2020. Uh, male athlete Lindsay Hecox, uh, who by all um, indications was, a, was very much a prop, but nevertheless filed a lawsuit demanding access to the Boise women's cross-country team. Frankly, did not make the team, even when given the opportunity to try out. My, uh, my clients, Madison and NK, you can see here on the left, are courageous cross-country athletes. They had lost multiple times to June Eastwood, a name that may be familiar to many of you, named Big Sky Conference Championship Woman of the Week, and a really smoked woman in the, like, I think it was the Women's Mile at the 2020 NCAA Championships. Uh, unfortunately, at the district level, the court put the case on hold. And we appeal that to the Ninth Circuit, and frankly, given the makeup of our panel, we do expect a loss. So I think you all ought to be prepared for that. We do expect to lose that particular one. Uh, 
Moving forward from Idaho, two of the lawsuits that are currently being litigated against states with women's sports laws are in Utah and Montana. Those are a little bit unique in that they're under state law, some peculiar questions of law in those cases. I don't think they're likely to be precedential for the rest of the US, so just wanted to flag that ahead of time. Indiana was also recently sued. It is the only case fully resolved, and it's, it's done. Thank you to the many of you who filed expert reports in that case. Um, I know that that made a difference. The law was put on hold at the district level. It was appealed to the Seventh Circuit, and there was a tremendous amount of support at the Seventh Circuit, only to then have the male athlete move out of the jurisdiction, and the case had to be dismissed. So that means it is resolved as a win, not a precedential win, but it's a win and we'll take it. Arizona. You heard yesterday from General Horn, superintendent of schools, about the fact that Arizona was most recently, uh, their state women's sports bill was challenged. Again, kudos to the many scientific experts in the room who have also filed statements in that case. Uh, I did learn yesterday that the court put the, put the law on hold. It did grant the preliminary injunction against us, which is disappointing, uh, but not necessarily, I, I suppose, a surprise. Um, to be frank, it was a poorly reasoned decision and the court used the wrong legal standard, which is something that we're finding to be fairly typical in a number of these cases. Uh, this is why I just want to underscore, when you file the lawsuit, you choose the jurisdiction. That is why it is so important for female athletes to be willing to sue, because when they're willing to sue, we get to choose the jurisdiction and we have a greater likelihood of success when we're able to file in, in courts and in circuit courts that understand the right legal principles that, that are at play here. So just uh, FYI, that one is likely to be appealed to the Ninth Circuit. There are two cases, though, that I want to slow the film down on just a little bit. Florida is one. Florida was sued in 2021. Again, very typical story. Two male athletes in high school who wanted to compete on the girls' team. But this time, the court put the entire lawsuit on hold because there was another case pending at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which governs uh, Georgia, Alabama, sorry, my brain's tired, Florida, Alabama, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was currently pending. So that case was called Adams versus St. John's Board of Education. Adams involved a school board in Florida that created a policy, fairly uh, common sense policy, that was sex separated restrooms and locker rooms. It said, we have these sex specific spaces and if any student for any reason is uncomfortable using your sex specific space, you're welcome to use these single user facilities. But that wasn't good enough. And so a female who identified as male sued the school district demanding change. In December of this past year, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals sitting on banc, which means the entire um, appellate court, held that separating bathrooms based on biological sex passes constitutional muster and comports with Title IX. It was a resounding wow. victory. It's full of solid legal analysis. It's a fantastic win for biological reality and just straight common sense. I must say it was good for my soul to read it. <laughs> You're like, yes, we actually have judges who understand the law and how it works. The plaintiff uh, who chose not to appeal to the Supreme Court, that means that this decision is final. It is on the books. It is the law of the land in those states, and we hope to use it as precedent that we can cite in other litigation as well. So that means taking it back to Florida, that case has now been reignited, and I do do you think ultimately the court will dismiss the case entirely because of Adams? There's no real basis to move forward. If restrooms are protected under Title IX, the analysis is far, far stronger in sports, and I think we win that one. Another case I wanted to slow the film down on just briefly is BPJ versus West Virginia. I've spent much of the last year and a half in this space. This again was a lawsuit by a middle school male athlete who wanted to be on the female team. Um, this beautiful young woman, Lainey Armistead, is a soccer player in West Virginia and she volunteered to intervene alongside the state attorney general to help defend the law. We were before a district judge that was not favorable so this judge initially put the law on hold saying that our side was likely to lose which is not really a very motivating way to start a case, right? It's a little bit discouraging. But we worked hard. We had excellent expert reports, including from Dr. Brown, um, who underwent significant depositions. Uh, we, we, did a, we produced a full record, over 3,000 pages in this record, and we won. 
we changed the judge's mind and persuaded him that it is both constitutional and it is consistent with Title IX to protect the female sex category. So that was a fantastic win. This was the first win in the United States on protecting women's sports. So that was really a, a phenomenal victory. It is currently on appeal, and we actually just learned yesterday that we expect oral arguments on that appeal to be in late October. So you can keep that in mind. Okay, number three, category number three, suits by government officials against executive overreach. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. You're gonna get more on this tomorrow. But obviously, the government has not been able to convince Congress to add gender identity to Title IX. So they're trying to do so via executive fiat. And they've tried to do that a couple of different ways. Number one, through a fact sheet that they issued and said, we're gonna interpret sex to include gender identity. That was challenged by Tennessee and 19 other state attorneys general. I hope that encourages you. In, in 20 states across the United States, they recognize that it is, it is wrong and it is a matter of executive overreach for the government to attempt to do this. So I think you ought to be encouraged that your state governments are fighting for you in this space. And they won. They won an injunction against the Department of Education's reinterpretation of Title IX. And so in 20 states, the Department of Education cannot use that fact sheet. Recently, Texas filed a similar lawsuit as well. But of course, the next legal horizon will be in October when the Biden administration has promised to release its new rules uh, reinterpreting Title IX. We've seen what the proposed rules look like. We ardently opposed them vigorously opposed them, and I have very little reason to suspect that we'll see anything new in the rules when they are released in October. Uh, you should be aware that there are multiple state attorneys general who are ready to file lawsuits against the administration as soon as that happens, and Alliance Defending Freedom intends to as well. So if you have any current female athletes in public schools that are interested in being a part of landmark litigation, come talk to me. Um, no, no survey would be complete without a mention of professional sports as well. This is not a space in which I directly litigate, um, but of course, kudos to USA Powerlifting and others for their courage in um, trying to protect a, a separate female category. The legal issues and the analysis there is, is difficult. Um, we, there isn't a Title IX for professional female sports, and so I think there's a lot of work yet to be done, um, either in our interpretation of public accommodations laws or in passing new legislation legislation that actually does ensure that even these private organizations, um, that these professional sporting organizations rather, are required to ensure that female athletes have protection in their sports. But just in summary of the litigation, I know I covered a lot in a short amount of time. I just cannot underscore enough that as a lawyer, it is much, much preferable to be in an offensive position versus a defensive position. I'm playing defense in the vast majority of these cases but we want to take the offensive position. We want to be the ones filing the lawsuits. We want to be the ones choosing the jurisdiction, choosing the claims that are to be brought. So I'll let that sit with you for a moment. The Supreme Court. This is, well, you can picture the Supreme Court. All right. <laughs> This is the million dollar question I always get asked, when is this issue going to reach the US Supreme Court? It is possible that it could be as early as this next term, which runs October to June. We have three cases right now that are currently at the Court of Appeals level, that is Connecticut, that is Idaho, and that is West Virginia. The thing is, the two cases that are furthest along in the pike um, Connecticut and Idaho, I think, are, are, tend to be a little bit more on procedural grounds. I think it is unlikely that those are going to go directly to the Supreme Court. I could be surprised. I think the best contender right now at the Court of Appeals is West Virginia. West Virginia has a decision on the merits. It has a fully developed record, and frankly, I like our chances. But we'll see. I think it is more likely that we will see a cert petition to the Supreme Court in the October 2024 term. But keep in mind, the Supreme Court does not always take the first case presented to it. Typically, the way the court operates is it allows an issue to percolate among the courts of appeals for a while, it sees a split, and then it decides to resolve that split. But I think there are a couple of reasons why I think the court might actually take the first cert petition on this issue. Um, number one, many of you may remember back in 2017, the court accepted the first privacy case that was presented, the Grimm case. And we were everybody, I think, was really surprised that the court did that. So it, it just signals to me an interest in this issue. Number two, there was a motion that we filed with the US Supreme Court 
I won't bore you with the procedural uh, reasons and, and how we got around to that, but we filed a motion with the Supreme Court in the West Virginia case, and Justices Alito and Thomas wrote a dissent in essence, came back and said, this is an important issue, and it is something the Supreme Court will need to resolve soon. So I think there is some appetite among the members of the court to hear this issue. My preference is to go up on sports over privacy, if we can make that happen. And I do think we have the votes to win. Of course, you never want to count your chickens before they're hatched, but I, I do like our chances at the Supreme Court. In conclusion, well, what do you know? In conclusion, just a couple of brief takeaways. Number one, I do think we win this. I do think we win this. We have strong cultural momentum right now. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you mentioned that Gallup poll, more than 70% of the American public agrees with us on sex-separated sports. Policies that protect the female category are the most legally defensible. And we're starting to see judges use the right legal analysis, which is what we need to win. But Friends in this room, we must have the appetite to fight this for the long haul. Legal wins do not happen overnight. Uh, again, we filed the first lawsuit on this issue in 2020. The first legal win in the women's sports arena was this year in 2023. It can take many, many years to get to the Supreme Court, many, many attempts. That's why we need more and more cases filed to give the court more and more opportunities to do the right thing. Number two, sports and stories impact public policy. Again, I can't underscore how just those three brave female athletes in Connecticut really spawned a legislative and in some sense a public movement here. The more women that speak out, the more sports organizations have the political cover to do the right thing. And the more judges, frankly, they read the newspapers, they read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, they keep a general pulse on what's going on. It makes it uh, easier and easier for them to reach the right decision. Finally, we've got to connect the dots for the culture. Failing to legally protect women based on their sex will have massive negative ramifications for women across so many areas of life, the, the full breadth of, with, with, breadth of which I don't think we fully comprehend just yet. Certainly in the context of Title IX, we're talking about sports and scholarship and privacy, locker rooms, showers, dorm rooms, overnight accommodations but they reach beyond that. Let's think about safety and privacy in domestic shelters, safe houses, prisons. We heard yesterday about the quality of medical care. We're litigating cases on behalf of doctors who want to treat male patients as male and female patients as female. That is up for contest these days, which is shocking. It impacts criminal statistics and news reporting, and the list just goes on and on. So this movement is about sports, but it is about so much more than sports as well, and that's why we've got to win it for the women. Overall, I'm optimistic because we do have truth and we have justice on our side. Thank you all so much. So uh, Christiana just said, um, told you some of what she's been able to do on the defensive. Just think about what she could do on the offensive. We get some, some more legislation passed around the country. Um, Christiana and, and ADF are doing an amazing job, as are each of you in this room, and it's truly an honor to be with you fighting uh, for this great cause, um, the cause of objective truth and human rights uh, for, for women. Um, I'd like to share with you some of the lessons from anti-doping that can and let me just see how I get this to work um, that can and uh, I believe must inform the right to a level playing field in women's sport. But before I do that, I must briefly respond to a comment from uh, Ross Tucker. I'm not sure if Dr. Tucker is here at the moment. Um, he said that, that he hoped it was the last time that, that he and, and Emma give that presentation. And um, I think I need to share the view, probably of all of us here in this room, um, that until the protection of the women's category is secured once and for all, you need to be back here every year <laughs> giving that presentation. <laughs> Second, I, I'd like to uh, start from the point in my presentation made in, in Ross's presentation that the idea in the IOC guidelines that sport eligibility discussions 
must start, quote, with no presumption of retained male advantage, in, in quote, is scientifically wrong. And I'd like to carry that argument forward and show why that presumption must be ethically and legally wrong, as it is contrary to the rationale that a lot underlies the world anti-doping system, a system already in place uh, in terms of legal protections in sport for a level playing field. To that end, I posit that the strongest reasons for protecting a level playing field in women's sport are ethical reasons. And we must speak of the issue of males competing in the female category as an ethical matter, upon which the well-being of sport, children, women, and men depends. Now, I know what you're thinking. He's a lawyer. He's not qualified to speak on ethics. <laughs> So quite honestly, I don't feel qualified to speak on ethics, but I have heard a lot of lies in my career. And one thing I've learned over and over and over again is that a situation is never made better by telling a lie. The truth is always the best policy, and telling someone a lie in a compassionate way is not compassionate. Now those are very simple concepts, I know, but don't they speak to the heart of what's happening today in some sports? A boy is not a girl, a man is not a woman, and males competing in the female category of sport undermines the primary ethical rationale for competitive sport because it's objectively not fair. Women's sport has become the battleground for the soul of sport in America and around the world. The eligibility crisis in women's sport is where truth is more contested, more at stake than any other area of sport. So how do we win this battle? Science is, is important. So is education and activism. But I submit that most important is ethics. Because when you are standing on what you know to be true and upon your ethics, your values, You'll stand, and that's what is needed now, people who will stand. Critics say we cannot defend the women's category in ethical terms. That is too divisive. We cannot tell people they're wrong. It's not sufficiently compassionate, and I respectfully disagree. We've been telling people it's wrong to use drugs in sport for decades. It's time we applied the same ethical standards regarding performance enhancement for competition, fair competition, a level playing field, relied on in anti-doping to protect women against trans cheating. In the global anti-doping system run by the World Anti-Doping Agency, known as WADA, has been discussed, a drug is placed on the prohibited list if there is any possibility of performance enhancement. Not every performance enhancing drug, or PED, works equally on every athlete, and some don't work at all on some athletes. Some individuals are non-responders. But the rule is, if any trace of a banned drug is found in the athlete's uh, sample, the athlete is liable. There's no individual assessment to see if that athlete got an advantage. Individual assessment would render the global anti-doping system unworkable. Yet when it comes to the participation of a man in the women's category, we are told that the man must be individually assessed to see if that particular man has a performance advantage over women. I've been in plenty of anti-doping hearings in which the athlete tries to argue that the drug in his system or her system did not enhance performance. And these arguments are simply not considered regarding liability for a rule violation. What ethical standard makes no individual assessment of performance enhancement ethical in an anti-doping case, but requires individual assessment in the case of a man who wants to compete in women's sport. 
The next slide references WADA's inclusion of tramadol on the prohibited list and shows a study of a group of time trial cyclists demonstrating a modest 1.3% average faster time correlated to tramadol use. This study was then generalized across all sports to put tramadol on the prohibited list. It was not required to be shown that tramadol is performance enhancing in all sports or in all people. Being male gives a sport performance advantage to men over women. And the scientific evidence for the performance enhancement of being male is more robust than the scientific evidence by which any specific drug is currently on the WADA prohibited list. Indeed, drugs are regularly put on the prohibited list with far less scientific evidence than we've seen in, in this room over the last two days, far less evidence than we have for maleness being performance enhancing. Yet some still insist that simply being male cannot be considered a performance enhancer. That individual evidence is required to exclude a, a man from the women's category if the man cho chooses to identify as a woman. What is the basis for that insistence? It is not a science-based requirement nor is it consistent with how other ethical decisions in sport have been made for nearly a quarter century. 24 years ago in February 1999, the International Olympic Committee convened the first World Conference on Doping in Sport and formed WADA as an independent entity with jurisdiction over drug use in sport and with governance comprised of one half from representatives of international sport and one half representatives of from the governments of the world. In 2003, at the second World Conference on Doping and Sport, the first World Anti-Doping Code was adopted. The code sets forth common principles concerning protection of the integrity of sport, fair competition, and a level playing field, using exactly those words. On October 9, 2005, the, uh, that's the code slide. Um, on, 2000, or on October 9th, 19th, 2005, the UNESCO International Convention Against Doping in Sport was adopted, making implementation of the World Anti-Doping Code a goal of governments worldwide. UNESCO calls the International Convention Against Doping in Sport the most successful convention in the history of UNESCO. It is now the second most ratified of all UNESCO treaties with 191 states as parties. Thus, over the last 24 years, the world has exhibited extraordinary consensus, developing a robust international structure for pursuing integrity in sport. That 191 countries have signed on to the code demonstrates widespread international agreement on what makes sport meaningful, on the values that underlie sport, and on how to protect integrity in sport. Some of these values are summarized in the fundamental rationale for the World Anti-Doping Code, which I'll read in part. Anti-doping programs are founded on the intrinsic value of sport. This intrinsic value is often referred to as the spirit of sport, the ethical pursuit of human excellence. Anti-doping programs seek to maintain the integrity of sport in terms of respect for rules, other competitors, fair competition, a level playing field, and the value of clean sport to the world. Notice, there is no shyness here in describing in ethical and moral terms the values of protecting athlete health, fair competition, and a level playing field. These values are described as globally shared, which we know to be true because 191 countries have adopted them. Is it okay to recognize that there are certain moral absolutes that are so universal that their ubiquity is itself evidence 
of an external source for those values? In his book, The Abolition of Man, British scholar C.S. Lewis describes the universal moral law widely accepted across cultures as the Tao, which he found in such varied sources as the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Old Norse Velaspa, the Bib Babylonian Hymn to Samas, the Hindu Laws of Manu, and the ancient Chinese Analects of Confucius in the writings of Cicero from ancient Rome, and an Islamic, Jewish, and Christian text demonstrating its universality. Perhaps recognition that there has come an emergence of a worldview that says there are no absolutes, I will define myself, and I can decide what others must give me through my power to demand and to threaten and to coerce, will drive us back to a worldview based on univer universally shared ethical standards, such as found in the codes, respect for rules, other competitors, fair competition, a level playing field, and the value of clean sport to the world. The code's universal adoption and acceptance tells us there is widespread agreement that the value of sport to society depends on integrity and ethical values. And it tells us to have ethical sport, we must protect the health of athletes. And that includes not putting them in a situation where they are induced to use PEDs to keep up. For in science provides data necessary to detect doping, but science is not what motivates the global anti-doping effort. For 24 years, the world has been fighting drugs in sport, and the fight has unstintingly been described in ethical terms. Shared ethics, common commitment to universal principles, gives the global anti-doping effort the potential to succeed. Likewise, shared commitment to universal ethical principles is the key to protecting the women's category of sport. But with respect to males in the female category, there has been an unmistakable shift in the ethical conversation regarding what constitutes a level playing field. A friend of mine recently sent me a tweet probably thinking it would cause me to either laugh or cry. So here it is. Lance Armstrong dominated men's cycling by taking drugs, and we called it cheating. If Lance Armstrong took drugs to transition and dominated women's cycling, we'd call it progress. Part of the irony here is recognition that some who view using drugs to boost athletic performance as cheating, do not regard it unethical when men take testosterone-generated bodies into women's sport and gain an advantage over women. Through humor, the tweet describes that what we need in sport is not so much better science, it's better ethics. It's not so much understanding what drugs are being used by who, but more basically, what is fair competition? What is a level playing field? Why do they matter? It is ethical to treat like circumstances alike. And Christiana just described how that's part of equal protection analysis too. That's a legal principle, not just an ethical one. But it's unethical not to do so when someone is harmed. To the extent it treats performance enhancement obtained through male advantage differently and less strictly than performance enhancement attained through doping, a sport is not acting ethically. The good news, however, is that those who think it fair for men to come into women's sport and dominate simply because they have declared themselves female is rather small. You have seen and others have talked about this Gallup poll in which the question was asked, do you think transgender athletes should be able to play on sports teams that match their current gender identity or should only be allowed to play on sports teams that match their birth gender. 69% said only on teams that match their birth identity. This is up from 62% in 2014 and 
in 2021, and I think that's probably the result of the work of a lot of people in this room. Only 26% think transgender athletes should be able to play on teams that match their identity. Why do nearly 70% of Americans believe transgender athletes should play on teams matching their birth sex? Americans and the world likes fair sport. Americans and the world don't like cheating and they view males participating in female sport as cheating. In 2014, this Harris Interactive survey um, of 2,000 U.S. adults found that 89% agreed more action needed to be taken to prevent the use of performance enhancing drugs in professional sports and 88% said more action was needed to prevent the use of PEDs at the Olympics. Americans and the world loathe unfair advantage in sport. In that survey, over 50% of adults saw, do saw doping as the greatest offense, and this of course was before the current transgender moment, they saw PEDs as the greatest offense that can be done by an Olympic athlete or team. 53% said that athletes who use PEDs are basically just criminals. Friends, yeah, <laughs> cheating is wrong, right? Friends, we will best protect the women's category of sport if we are willing to talk about what we know to be ethical and fail, fair. Males competing in the women's category is not a winning issue with the public. Why? because the public is made up of a bunch of ogres that do not want people with gender dysphoria to be happier? No. It's for the same reason that 191 countries have signed onto a code that says cheating is wrong because it undermines fair competition in a level playing field. We share common ethical values that under, underpin our understanding of true sport. And if a sports administrator chooses not to implement those widely shared values, they are not putting their sport on a path for success with the public. Why is the public so sensitive to cheating in sport? One reason is that there's more than a 50-year history of PEDs in sport. It's very clear to sports fans what steroids do. Doping females, as this slide indicates, with a male sex steroid turned an impoverished country smaller than the state of Tennessee into an Olympic powerhouse, winning 10 of 11 individual gold medals in swimming at the 1976 Olympic Games. The effects of PEDs are most dramatic in women's sport because of the very low le levels of testosterone in women and doping of East German women showed persistent PED use provides long-lasting and, after a time, permanent performance enhancement. Another unfortunate fact about East German doping was that it took another 23 years for the IOC to bring WADA into being, and it took numerous additional scandals for that to take place. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and until the 2000s, as WADA and national anti-doping agencies came into being, the IOC outsourced anti-doping duties to sports organizations that largely lack the capacity, expertise, and in some cases, the, the will to do much about doping. The result, generations of athletes who dreamed and sacrificed, but lost their podium moments to cheating. You see any parallels? In 2021, the IOC sought to sidestep another controversial issue by putting individuals, um, by, or I'm sorry, by putting individual sports in charge of so-called tra transgender eligibility issues. Now, the only thing I, good I can say about this is that the IOC guidelines do identify as priorities in drafting these rules the key ethical standards of ensuring fair and safe competition, and quote, a level playing field where no athlete has an unfair advantage over the rest, 
These are the same standards found in the World Anti-Doping Code. So sports administrators ask how to avoid a legal challenge. I think it's the wrong question. As others have said, legal challenges are in inevitable. For instance, in the U.S., if you adopt policies that allow men to keep, compete in the women's category, a sport receiving federal funding might be sued under Title IX, depending on their uh, con uh, connection to the government. Alternatively, a national governing body could be challenged under arbitration procedures available under the Olympic and Amateur Sports Act for, quote, not providing equitable support and encouragement for participation by women um, in programs that are conducted on a, na a national basis. Given legal challenges are inevitable, the key question every governing body must ask is what is the best decision we can make for the long-term good of the athletes in our sport? As the World Anti-Doping Code demonstrates, the answer to that question will be found when a sport prioritizes safe and fair competition and a level playing field. You are here listening and in, in online uh, watching because you care about the future of sport. You know the importance of ethical sport to your children, to your friends, and to your own life. I have seen unethical sport up close. I've spent hours interviewing sports champions, some ha household names and others not, who decided to dope because they were convinced the only way they could compete in their sport was to use drugs. If males are permitted in the women's category, I wonder how many young girls will be tempted to use steroids or EPO to compete to try to level the playing field to keep up. Many cyclists quit the sport after realizing they could not compete without using drugs. By allowing boys to compete in the girls category, how many young girls will decide not to continue in what has become an ethical sport? What is a sport's duty to its athletes? I ask that question not just about female athletes. I ask it on behalf of today's transgender athletes. Some of the leading health institutions in Europe, like the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, state minors should not be encouraged to take hormones that lock themselves into irreversible physical changes. I'm going to read you a quote from the policy of the Astrid Lindgren Children's Hospital at the Karolinska Institute regarding puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for minors. Quote, these treatments are potentially fraught with extensive and irreversible adverse consequences such as cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, infertility, increased cancer risk, and thrombosis. That's blood clots, and that can be fatal as unfortunately a lot of young boys taking EPO and young women found out. This makes it challenging to assess the risk benefit for the individual patient and even more challenging for the minors or their guardians to be in a position of an informed stance regarding these treatments. So I appreciate that World Aquatics World Athletics and the UCI recognize the importance of a level playing field in women's elite sport, but the policies of these organizations allow men to compete in the women's category if they began puberty blockers and the use of feminizing hormones by age 12. So what of the young boys who will be incentivized by those policies to use powerful puberty blockers and perhaps even seek surgery to make life-changing physical alterations at age 12 or earlier because their sports policies say that when a child must transition to compete at the highest level is age 12 or earlier. Is this aspect of sports policy 
consistent with the highest ethical standards, or is it merely designed to win a court case? The slide here has set sad headlines resulting from sports failing to protect their young athletes. And Jin Se talked about that earlier today. Horrors resulted when ethics were set aside, when the truth was not told. What will the headlines be 10 or 15 years from now? Will one who is just a child today be lamenting? Perhaps telling Congress, or maybe just through tears to a counselor, they were encouraged to transition at age 10 or 11 so that they could become a champion runner or swimmer or cyclist. Decisions made from a strong ethical foundation have a way of working out well, but those founded in expediency do not stand the test of time. Sport operates on globally accepted ethical values. Men competing in the women's category violates those values in a sport that enforces anti-doping rules but then permits men to compete in the women's category is schizophrenic, a house divided which cannot long stand. Conversely, a sport that upholds integrity, fair competition, and ethical values is a treasure of great worth and lasting value. Ethical sport is worth fighting for. Icons women, keep fighting for it. You are in the right ethically. Therefore, I believe you will ultimately be in the right and people will recognize it legally and in sport. You will win. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I want to say thank you to Kim and the ICONS team for making it possible for me to travel halfway around the world to state the obvious. <laughs> but uh, I do want to start by saying I've had a few people come up to me um, and ask if I'm all right. I think uh, some of you here would have seen what happened last year. And I do want to reassure everyone uh, that my experience in advocating for women's sex-based rights has galvanised me, and I have no intention of backing down. So even when I was a candidate in the Australian federal election, a political neophyte, I became the most reported on candidate, second only to the sitting Prime Minister. And despite their best efforts of my despite the best efforts of my detractors to discredit and intimidate me into silence, they scored a massive own goal. Gender identity ideology is now in the Australian public discourse and the critiques are now being ventilated. Unfortunately though, gender identity ideology is still in the zeitgeist in Australia. We had Zali Stegel, my political opponent, uh, and the first Australian to win an Olympic medal at the Winter Olympics. She called parents transphobic for having the, for, who had concerns about their daughter's sport. Uh, we have the Premier of the State of Victoria who raised the trans flag above Parliament in response to the Let Women Speak rally where we, were, um, where we had young men dressed in black cosplaying as neo-Nazis who showed up to derail our rally. And in defiance of public sentiment, we have sports bureaucrats introducing transgender elite policies that is contrary to pretty much everyone else, saying that if men keep their testosterone to 2.5 nanomoles for two years, they are entitled to compete in elite sport. So, when I hear Christiana speak, I'm like, we've got a bit of a ways to go in Australia. Um, but in Australia, we have a saying, this doesn't pass the pub test. 
meaning if you asked an ordinary Aussie down the pub their opinion on a particular issue, they would say they don't agree with it or they don't believe in it. Men intruding into women's sport certainly does not pass the pub test. A collision of rights has arisen between biological females recognised as a distinct sex class in law and biological males who wish to identify into that sex class. And the extent to which these interests com conflict, sex must have primacy. Because we, the moment we abrogate sex rights in favour of gender identity, then we deny the basis of human existence. And in international law, which is the uh, scope of my uh, discussion here today, women have sex-based rights that are predicated on having a female physiology, not some simulacrum of feminine appearance or any fantastical legal fiction that allows a male to be recognised as a female in law or a mere utterance or declaration. So in 1979, the UN adopted CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It's a beautifully drafted instrument, and back then when men were men and women were women, and, and this wasn't a problem. <laughs> but women were granted explicit rights, protections and entitlements to eliminate sex-based discrimination, with discrimination described as any distinction, exclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex. The purpose was to achieve human rights equality between women and men, focusing on women's legal and civil rights, particularly in terms of human reproduction. 189 countries are presently signatories and have ratified. The United States and the nation of Palau, while signatories have not ratified, and non-signatories include the Holy See, who has a grand total of about 30 female residents, Iran, Somalia, Sudan and Tonga. In Australia, we thought it was so important, we actually even enshrined it in our Sex Discrimination Act in 1984. All signatory states are required, are committed to take appropriate measures, including legislation, to ensure the full development and advancement of, of the rights of women and extends to many aspects of life, including sport. So sport is not expressly protected as a fundamental in international law as a universal human right. Veronica Ivey, are you listening? Uh, there is no specific legal right to sport and certainly no one has the right to compete in sport wherever, with whomever and in whatever category they desire. But under CEDAW, women have the right to the same sporting opportunities that men have, whether at a community or elite level. So I know a lot of the, the discussion is around elite sport, but as we know, community feeds elite, and this is where 99% of sport is actually played. So here we have Article 10G. This is, um, and the declaration is right there, uh, and also uh, 14C, which uh, describes the, the rights that women have to access sport on an equal basis. So denying natal males eligibility to compete in female sports is not a human right. It's not a human rights violation. These men are not being denied opportunities, nor are they being discriminated against. They are being treated comparatively to other males. They are not being excluded from sports. They are eligible to play in the male category or any open or mixed categories. Granting males the right to compete in female sports is unequivocally incompatible with this right. When men can avail themselves of that right, its purpose is completely subverted. So CEDAW is one of nine core instruments that create the international framework for human rights and equality law. The civil, political, economic, social, familial and cultural rights protected under these instruments are universal, inalienable, indivisible and interdependent. All these rights are equal in importance and none can be enjoyed without the others. Responsibility is on signatory nation states to respect and protect and fulfil these rights. 
And these nine instruments refer to sex multiple times. They refer to mothers, to maternity, females, pregnancy and lactation. And thus strongly reinforce not just the legal notion but the incontrovertible truth that female physiology is basal to women's human rights. But despite this, there's a relentless campaign to repudiate sex in favour of gender identity. But unlike women's rights, gender identity is not expressly protected in international human rights instruments. It is not explicitly recognised in international law and it has no explicit treaty protection. But its proponents argue that when protected characteristics are listed in human rights instruments, so for example, you'll have uh, race, religion, culture, etc., sometimes it says other status. And they try to argue that gender identity falls into other status. However, this is, this is arguable because there is no consensus on gender identity within the cohort of United Nations member states. Only 10% of these nations allow some form of gender, allow some for, legal form of gender identity recognition. So the conflict of rights is far from settled. Reem Al Salem, who is a special rapporteur for violence against women and girls, she speaks to the legitimate concerns of women when she asserts the harm done to women by gender identity ideology. She was highly critical of Scotland's proposed gender recognition law, which would allow unrestricted self-identification. And we all know how that ended up for Nicola Sturgeon. But contrast that to the United Nations independent expert for sexual orientation and gender identity, Victor Madrigal Borlaz. He shamefully advocates for the removal of sex from law and policy and dismisses those who fight for sex-based rights as hateful. So shout out to LGB Alliance in the UK who stood up to this. So for the moment, the status quo remains. There is no fundamental human right to self-identification on the basis of self-perceived gender identity. And insofar as rights for gender identity exist, states have the right based on international human rights standards to include restrictive measures as long as they are for a legitimate aim and a proportionate response to that aim. I would argue that restricting eligibility of female sports categories to natal females for fairness, safety, dignity, privacy for women could certainly be argued to be legitimate and proportionate. But trans activists are nothing if not creative. In 2006, the Yogyakarta Principles were published. In 2017, a supplement called Yogyakarta Principles Plus 10 were published as well. But this is a document of demands. It's a demand that primacy be given to people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities above all others. Above all others? It's a specious document. Its proponents purport it to be a universal guide to human rights and insist it binds with the international legal standards with, with which all nation states must comply. But it is not. So don't believe them when they say it is. It's not. It is drafted and signed by a group of individuals in their private capacity, lawyers, human rights activists, trans rights activists, including, yes, Victor Madrigal Borlaz, uh, who I mentioned before, and there was also Professor Robert Wintermute, who has now come out and since admitted that women were not consulted, nor were, was the impact on them considered, and for that he has paid a heavy price, even being at the centre of a mob at McGill University when he speak, went to speak about human rights. So the Yogi Carter principles exist for denuding law and policy from se of sex and gender, including any record of a person's sex or gender. And we, we can imagine the impact that that will have uh, on data collection, on women's rights, on children's rights, when it, every space, every service is just a free-for-all. So the impact of these principles on any other group was not considered which is highly unusual in human rights, where there are usually endless conversations and debate on how to balance the competing sides. 
These principles have not been negotiated and certainly have not been agreed to by any nation states. There have been multiple unsuccessful attempts to have them ratified through the United Nations as a human rights standard, all of which, I think I might say, have fortunately been rejected by the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council and other bodies. Even an Australian Senate committee said the principles have no legal force, either internationally or within Australia. So proponents of gender identity have attempted to circumvent this wholesale rejection by inserting their aims into non-binding United Nations documents. So in 2009, the principles were relied on to justify a general comment which was published by the Committee on the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This is a non-binding but important and expert pronouncement on covenants. And this specifically stated that gender identity is recognised as a prohibited ground of discrimination. In 2010, CEDAW Committee issued a general recommendation, number 28, Again, a non-binding guideline that provides ways for states to implement the convention um, and it extended the definition of discrimination to include discrimination on the basis of sex and gender. So, the quote's up there. Here we see gender acknowledged as sex-based social roles and sex stereotypes that arise from biological differences that disadvantage women on the basis of their female sex as distinct from men. Further, reference is made to gender identity, but only insofar as it again pertains to women as distinct from men. So in 2016, the United Nations Council had a mandate that was introduced for the international expert for SOGI, which has given a position to our friend Victor. Uh, so this is for the protection of um, protection against violence and discrimination based on SOGI. CEDAW's committee, again in 2019, called for the elimination of discrimination against women and girls in sport. You would sound hopeful, but this was actually in response to the Casa Semenya decision and the 2018 uh, International Amateur Athletic Federation's regulations that prevented natal males with differences of sex development from competing in the 400, 800 and 1500 sprints. The resolution is arguably misconceived because a policy that advantages males to the detriment of females is incompatible with CEDAW. Again, with the European court ruling that just recently happened earlier this month, a group of UN experts, including our friend Victor, uh, in support of, was issued in support of the Semenya ruling. But again, the basis is that Semenya is a woman and is a female, that he is just a female with different sex characteristics. And it, the implication being that it is racist or sexist to say otherwise and they urge sports organisations to review eligibility for these men to be able to compete in the women's category. And finally, in 2019, the Human Rights Council uh, issued a resolution that pur purported to affirm women's fundamental human rights. But the resolution, which mentioned sex only three times and only in relation to sexuality, made mention of gender 37 times. So I must reiterate that gender identity is not recognised in the core international human rights instruments. It remains highly contested without evidentiary basis or majority consensus. So when a male asserts rights on the basis of gender identity, and even when he claims to be legally female because he has changed his identification documents, it is not the same as him being biologically female. I can't believe I have to say that. But insofar as his rights conflict with the rights of women, biological sex must have primacy. However, gender identity has managed to intrude into some national and state laws in some jurisdictions. In Australia and New Zealand, sex has been displaced by gender identity in federal government sports policies. New Zealand unanimously passed sex self ID, unanimously passed sex self ID, and it's been passed in a number of Australian states. 
In Australia, sex self-identification was inserted into our Sex Discrimination Act when gender identity was inserted into that federal law by our first female Prime Minister. She is held up as a feminist icon, but this is one of the last things she did. She completely undermined the right of women to be recognised as a distinct sex class in law. And it's created a conflict between sex and gender identity that is now being litigated in our Australian Federal Court in the case Tickle versus Giggle. Yes, I didn't make that up. I don't think you can make that up. But it is legitimately called Tickle versus Giggle. So these are the facts. We have a natal male who goes by the name of Roxy Tickle. He's altered his sex marker on his birth certificate. Uh, he wanted to go onto the Giggle for Girls app. However, the CEO, Sal Grover, saw his onboarding selfie. She identified him out. She removed him from the app. So he tried to take her to the Australian Human Rights Commission to conciliate uh, the dispute. Uh, she declined to conciliate, so then it went to the federal court, and that's where we are right now. Um, so she, he, so Tickle is asserting that he was discriminated against on the basis of his gender identity, and Sal Grover is asserting that women and girls have the right to a female-only space uh, online. And Sal created that space because she was a screenwriter in Los Angeles. Uh, she was a victim of uh, what turned into the Me Too movement. She came home and she just wanted to have an online space where women and girls could be without being harassed uh, by men, being sent you know, dick pics, being able, to find, <laughs> being able to find a flatmate, being able to find a job uh, without that male intrusion. Uh, so we are now seeing this case in the federal court. It might possibly run to the high court because there, uh, the facts of the case have raised a constitutional question in that we are asserting that gender identity is actually not constitutionally valid. The Sex Discrimination Act in Australia it takes its legislative power from the fact that it has enlivened the CEDAW Convention um, and because CEDAW does not address... It's silent on gender identity. So the question arises is where does gender identity get its constitutional validity? So we are hoping that it does go to the High Court so this question can be resolved once and for all. Shut up, Sal. Yeah. <laughs> so the implication for women's spaces and services in Australia will be profound. Will sex or will gender identity have primacy? The presiding judge said, and I quote, the difference in the applicant's case and the respondent's case is stark and wholly irreconcilable. One will ultimately be found to be right and the other to be wrong. So women's human rights are inalienable, universal, indivisible and interdependent. Now more than ever, those rights for women are being marauded and abrogated. Women's freedom of association, that is, their right to define who can or cannot participate in female-only sports, is under attack. Women's freedom of expression, that is, their right to discuss their concerns about natal males participating in female-only sports, is under attack. Women's freedom of speech, that is, their heroic refusal to comply with radical ideologues, concerted attempts to control language, is under attack. Women's human rights, our right to self-determination, our right to consent, as was so beautifully articulated by the young women here earlier today, but our right to consent is under attack. Once cherished principles of fairness, privacy, dignity, safety and inclusion for women in sport are being sacrificed to affirm the identities of, let's face it, rather mediocre, if not aged out or overweight male athletes. <laughs> Women's freedom of thought, freedom of belief, and freedom of conscience are all under attack, simply because women will not surrender the truth of biological sex. The corpus of international human rights instruments indefatigably supports female-only sports categories for women and girls. There is no justification for allowing natal males to compete in women's sports. 
So it's very simple for sports administrators, policy makers, legislators to pass the Australian pub test. All they need to do is repudiate the demands of a loud, dangerous minority, preserve the consensus of the majority and defend the existing sex-based human rights of women and girls. Thank you. Thank you to our legal panel. Appreciate that. We are running out of time, though. <laughs> so I'm going to ask if there's any way I could get Lorraine Moeller, Jen Sees, and maybe Helen Joyce to meet us out in the lobby. There's a local news station that would like to speak with you. Um, and then let's, why don't we take five minutes just to let everyone stand up. We have our last session, um, and it is Beyond the Elite. This is what everyone's really interested in hearing about the pre-puberty performance differences, the importance of grassroots sports and allowing women to compete fairly all throughout the course of their lives. So please join us back in just about five minutes to get that started. Yes. Okay, with this, I would like to welcome Megan Burke to the podium to give our introduction for the Beyond the Elite panel, Megan is an NCAA champion and American record holder. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Kim and Marshy, so much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I am so honored to be here today and stand on the same stage as all the wonderful speakers who have stood here the past few days that are here to empower, advocate, and to educate, help you know, saving women's sports. Um, I also I really thought I was up on all this information and the past few days I have learned so much and my mind is blown. And so it's been so amazing so far. I also would like to thank all of you in the audience because everyone has a very busy life and it really means a lot to all come together and take time to be here and to help save women's sports. So um, like Kim said, I was a track and cross country athlete at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. But my love for sports started when I was around four years old. Growing up, I played everything. I played soccer, I played basketball, swam, tennis, gymnastics, although that wasn't my uh, strong suit. Not very flexible. Could never get those splits down. Um, I enjoyed competing in most of all of them but I fell in love with soccer and started playing competitively and traveling in fourth grade. I look forward to my practices. I look forward to laughing to my, with my teammates. And our, my team and I were always focusing on winning and how we could do that. And winning seemed very important back then. It still was to me in college as well. But now when I look back on that wonderful soccer team, I think a lot of less about the wins and I think more, much more about how sports shape my youth and my life. Playing soccer gave me teammates that were my best friends. It gave me a, an immense confidence where I never questioned myself. It taught me time management. It taught me really how to work hard and how to accomplish goals when you, are, when you really set your mind to it. The list goes on and on. Ultimately, my junior year of high school, I quit soccer to focus on running. It was truly one of the saddest days of my life because I was giving up those teammates and I was letting go of something that shaped me and I loved so much. But running then awarded me with new goals. I was a 15-time state champion here in Colorado. And it gave me new friends. It gave me a chance to compete with my actual sister, which is something I hold really dear. Um, it awarded me a full scholarship to Carolina. And college sports gave me another level of toughness and grit that I didn't know I had. And it continued to shape me with important lessons and values. Sports has without a doubt made me perform better at almost all things in life, especially my most important role, being a mom. I have two little girls, Caroline and Isabel. They're watching right now, so love you both. Being a mom is the most rewarding job, but it's also one of the toughest. And you know what equipped me with the tools to help me manage motherhood? Sports. You know what helped me breastfeed, 
not chest feed, breastfeed. You know what helped me breastfeed for a year with both of my girls and wake up for eight months straight almost every night? Sports. Athletics has defined so much of my life, and to see what is happening right now in women's sports and spaces saddens and infuriates me to my core. Girls deserve to gain all the benefits that sports can provide. If one little girl is displaced or discouraged by a male, that is one too many. We can't strip our girls from the wonderful outcomes that sports bring. And don't just take my word for it. Many studies prove that sports are extremely beneficial to, to girls. A report by the nonprofit group ROX, which stands for Ruling Our Experiences, stated the following. It doesn't get any more straightforward. If you want to raise happy, healthy, successful girls, make sure she plays sports, especially in high school. The organization surveyed over 10,000 girls in America from grades 5 through 12 for their Girls in Sports Impact Report and found girls who play sports are more confident, have higher opinions of themselves and their bodies, have stronger relationships with other girls compared to those who don't play sports. And did you know that approximately 94% of the women in the C-suite participated in athletics? It's pretty impressive. As an athlete and a mother of two little girls, I will not allow males to take over our sport and turn our women's and girls' category into a unisex category. I refuse to let Caroline and Isabel be cheated out of any spot on the team, out of the feeling of winning or the pure joy that sports bring or the pain that I saw those girls in today of being forced to change in the locker room with a man. No. Even at the age of six, I have seen the most wonderful moments in my daughter Caroline while she is playing sports and competing. The confidence I see her building in one swim meet or the camarader camaraderie she has with her soccer teammates in one game, I haven't seen anywhere else. I would be absolute, it would be absolutely devastating to see those lessons taken away because a male was unfairly playing in her category. Like Riley said yesterday, what about us? What about the little girls? No one gets to steal sports from them. This is why it is extremely important to get loud and protect youth sports and make sure none of our girls are discouraged from playing. In the words of Jennifer Say, we need to say the thing. We need to say the thing in the youth programs as well. We need to say the things at the soccer games, to the parents on the sidelines, to the youth coaches. Currently here in Colorado, most youth soccer teams are assigned based on how you identify, not the child's sex. And sadly, this has been happening to like my friend's children in first and third grade. Um, it's time to act and not only to save women's sports, but save our little girls' sports, too. Together, I know we can make this happen. So much has happened in the past three years through you guys and through icons, so I know this movement will keep going, but we need to make sure the youth are protected as well. And um, that, you know, women before us fought for this, and it is shocking to me that my girls might not get the same opportunity that I had, which was a full scholarship to the University of North Carolina, which was playing on teams and getting lifelong friendships and benefiting in so many ways through sports. So I know we'll all come together and fight on this, and I'm excited to introduce the speakers for our last session today, who have joined us to focus on the importance of making sure we don't overlook the vast majority of women in the world. It is so important that women and girls are not taught they need to reach elite status in, in order to deserve fair treatment and equal opportunity to sports. Dr. Greg Brown will share his scientific exper expertise on pre-puberty athletic performance. He is the leader in kinesiology and sports science, as well as a fellow in the American Academy of Sports Medicine. Dr. Brown specializes in I was struggling with this before. <laughs> Anatomical and physiological factors affecting human performance. I think just saying it together was hard for me. I don't know why. 
Following Greg, we will hear from Olympian Mara Yamauchi, who traveled here from Britain to join us. Mara has competed in two Olympics and won a Commonwealth Ga Games bronze medal. After a storied career in sports and diplomacy, Mara has been focusing on grassroots development and advocacy for female athletes. She is the author of Marathon Wisdom and Elite Athletes Insight on Running and Life, published last year. Thank you, Greg and Mara, for being here. Greg? All right, make sure now to use the click right. Megan, thank you for that introduction. Everyone, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Um, I feel like a teenage fanboy at an MTV Awards or something like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Colin Wright. Oh my gosh, there's Cher. Holy cow. And I'm just so shocked and it's so cool. And then I'm up here on the stage in front of you and I hope I don't wet myself. So, you know, we'll pray that that doesn't happen. Um, I really want to thank Kim and Margie, thank you. This is the problem. I go blank on things a little bit. Um, but thanks so much for this opportunity. This is really cool. Um, and again, to get a shout out for Emma Hilton and get a shout out from Christiana Kiefer. I'm just beside myself with excitement here. I'm so beside myself, it's like there's two of us up here. Now, I will tell you, as an academic, I have way too many slides. Um, because I have to put what I'm thinking on the PowerPoint or else I'll go off on a tangent and maybe I start talking about hemoglobin and the importance of hemoglobin in transporting oxygen in the bloodstream and then next thing you know I'm talking about World War Z and the zombies in The Walking Dead and can zombies run or walk and how long they can go without a meal and so I've got to keep it very organized and concise on my PowerPoints here. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about myself that helps me feel more comfortable with speaking with everyone. Um, so my wife, Amber, there, she is, she's a rock for me. She's my inspiration. I definitely married up. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be where or who I am. And she's also really good at helping me come back to reality. Um, talking last night about how sometimes I get in these deep dives looking in the research on this, my wife will come up and say, let's go for a walk. All right, so it's really nice to have that. Um, my oldest son, Kelton, there, he's 26. He's in the Nebraska National Guard. That picture was as his troop was deploying to the Middle East just this last January, so he's still over somewhere where it's hot and sandy and dry. Um, and then my youngest son, Connor, and his wife, Stacy. And I'm really happy to say that I'm going to be a grandpa in January. So. All right, now I'm going to do something a little goofy here, so I hope you'll humor with me. I know we just had a little break, but I'd like everybody to stand up. All right, this will only take a couple seconds. Just stand up. All right, put your hand over your heart. All right, now take a step to the right. Take a step to the left. All right, you can sit back down. So now you can go home and say, wow, Greg Brown uplifted us, touched our heart, and moved us. All right. Um, so as you heard a little bit about how I got involved in this, um, basically, 2019, I saw a news report that Selena Soul was suing the Kinetic Interscholastic Athletic Association, and she's being represented by Alliance Defending Freedom. And I basically got on the ADF webpage, found a contact, this thing, sent in a contact, said, hey, I'm an exercise physiologist. I know that sex matters in sports. I know it makes a difference. Can I be helpful? I'm sure that they Googled me and looked me up to make sure I wasn't some crazy person. And I'm only 99% not crazy, I guess. But anyway, um, and then they contacted me back, and I met with Roger Brooks and some other folks with Alliance Defending Freedom. And so I wrote an expert declaration for Seoul versus CIAC, which led then to an expert declaration for Hecox versus Little in Idaho, which has led to expert declarations in West Virginia, in Tennessee, in Arizona, um, going to various states to testify on behalf of protecting women's sports. And so it's just kind of expanded from this little contact to being this whole other life, it seems like. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Ten years ago, if you'd have told me I'd be doing this, I'd be like, no, you're kidding me. And here we are. All right, so here's one of the problems that we see. And this has been talked about a little bit. Um, I appreciate Councillor Bach really bringing this up and others bringing it up today. Um, that's the title of an article by David Handelsman, Sex Differences in Athletic Performance Emerge Coinciding with the Onset of Male Puberty. It's the title of the article. 
Um, you can see that was published in 2017. You can see two other quotes from other articles there, another one by David Handelsman, another one by Joshua Safer. Um, and Joshua Safer is an advocate for the other side of this, um, very adamant in that, but stating, in essence, that there's no difference in boys and girls in athletic performance until puberty. All right? And so we have those statements there that lead to this, as was mentioned, whether it's World Athletics, whether it's UCI, whether it's FINA, saying, oh, if you suppress puberty before age 12 or 10 or stage 2, whichever comes first, then a male can compete in female sports. I am convinced that that's wrong. All right, that is absolutely wrong. Now, one of the things I would like to point out first off is these figures are from Handelsman's paper. And so if you look at um, running or jumping, all right, at age 10, the average boys are 3% faster than the average girls. And you can see it jumping at age 10. The average boys are jumping about 5.5%, 6% further than average girls. And I don't know if the average boy is faster than the average girl. Doesn't that indicate that boys are faster than girls? Now, I understand statistically, right, when you're analyzing the statistics like this and looking at the variation and the huge differences after puberty. I can understand why statistically maybe those smaller differences before puberty don't come out as statistically significant, right? And yes, I'm an exercise scientist. We use statistics to make our decisions and everything. But one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, statistically significant versus practically significant, right? There is a difference, right? We know in sports that a 0.01% difference can mean the difference between a gold medal and no medal. So this 3% difference between boys and girls can be huge in sports. All right? Um, sorry, I want to hold off on this for just a second. So one of our challenges, though, we have with looking before puberty is honestly a lot of sports before puberty, they're recreational. They're local. Um, it's developmental. When was the last time you saw a newspaper article or something on the local television station about the state eight and under track and field champion? Right? You don't see it. People don't put the interest in it as much as they do, especially once we get to the high school level when kids are competing and scholarships are on the line and state championships are on the line. So there's not as much information about, out there about sports competition before puberty. Again, it's very local. Um, I don't even know if a lot of elementary schools keep records on which four-year-old was the fastest in the mile run. Right? So those are our challenges with that. But again, Handelsman has this information. One area we can look fitness testing, all right? All of us have done this in school. We hated it, right? In the United States, you do fitness gram. In Europe, it's the uh, Eurofit. Different places have their fitness testing that we do. Um, so if we look at some information here, this, this is German children, about 900 German children. And you can see the nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds. Notice the boys are consistently performing better than the girls on measurements of muscle strength, muscular endurance, running speed, aerobic performance, the girls are better, doing better in flexibility, right? Now, the differences are small. Yeah, we're looking 2 or 3% difference in, you know, the 50-meter sprint. The 1-kilogram ball push, upper body strength, much larger difference there, 17% or so. Triple hop, 4% difference. But again, consistently, the boys are outperforming the girls. Now, people are going to look at this and say, oh, well, that's just Germany. Oh, that's just one particular paper. That is a legitimate concern or legitimate, legitimate criticism. So let's look at this one. This is from a paper where they evaluated in 30 different European countries. 2.2 million fitness tests, all right? So this means every one of these different fitness tests, there's hundreds of thousands of children measured in this. There's a definite statistical power once you start having hundreds of thousands of observations. More observations in this one paper than all of the studies on transgender individuals combined. <laughs> and I just spilled my Pepsi. I need a napkin, dang it. Or several napkins, but. Coming. Thanks. Thank you. If it had been a Coke, I wouldn't have spilled it. Coke is too precious. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mara, this is going to be sticky. Just a warning. All right. So the, here we're looking again. This is 30 European countries, hundreds of thousands of children in each of these tests. And again, the boys are out 
forming the girls in measures of muscular strength, running speed, aerobic endurance, muscular endurance, the girls are outperforming the boys in flexibility. Well, people may say, oh, well, that's just Europe. Okay, well, let's come to another paper here. All right, so this is a paper from Tomkinson. This is looking specifically at 20 meter shuttle run. 50 different countries, 1.1 million children across 50 different countries, and you see the outline there, that's not just Europe. That's not just North America or South America. You've got Oceania, you've got Australia, you've got Asia, you've got Africa included in this. And consistently, the prepubertal boys, age nine, age 10, were three or 4% faster in the final lap than the girls were. Now this is a 20 meter shuttle run. In the United States, we know it's the pacer test. Other places, it's the beep test. But the boys were going like 20% more laps, all right, which is still three to 4% faster. So I'd say we've got some good school-based data that boys have physical fitness advantages over girls. Another criticism of this, well, that's school-based fitness testing. We all know how that goes. If your friends are walking, you're walking, right? And if your friend's counting the push-ups, maybe they add push-ups, maybe they subtract push-ups because they don't like you that day, something like that, all right? So here's a, another very interesting paper. Now, this paper was published in 2005. So this is not like it's brand new data. The previous paper was 2013. All right, so this is in about 700 Danish children. And I think if we look at gender roles, Denmark is pretty egalitarian on the gender roles, right? So if we're gonna minimize social influence on physical fitness, Denmark might be the place to look. Well, what they did is they had these boys and girls come in and they did a VO2 max test on them where they put them on the treadmill, graded exercise test with the metabolic cart. That is a lab standard for measuring aerobic fitness, right? These six to seven year old boys, the absolute VO2 max for the boys was 11% higher than the girls. Absolute VO2 max, part of it is representative of body size. We expect a larger person to have a larger oxygen consumption because they have more tissues that need to be fed. So if they took that VO2 max and measured it relative to body mass, which is typically how we're going to compare individuals. If you do a fitness test and you want to see how you compare normatively, we look at VO2 max relative to body mass, milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute, still an 8% advantage for the boys. All right? So even account for differences in body mass, the boys have an advantage. Now in adults, we're gonna see that more like 25%. But still an 8% advantage matters. Now if they took that relative to fat-free mass, so now we're gonna try and control for differences in lean body mass, the boys still had a 2% higher VO2 max. All right? So we've accounted for differences in muscle mass and there's still a male advantage in VO2 max. The other thing that was interesting with this study is they put accelerometers on the children and had, the, had them wear the accelerometer, which is a very objective way to measure physical activity. And they found for boys and girls, the boy, you know, if they got the same amount of physical activity, the boys were fitter, which would indicate, again, some kind of biological advantage where, in essence, for the girl to have the same VO2 max, she's going to have to exercise a whole lot more than the boy does. So again, we see this evidence of male advantages for physical fitness. All right? And lest you think that I'm cherry picking these studies or something like this, this is not a comprehensive list. This is a quick search through PubMed, 21 different papers that I came up with, dating back, I think I went back to 1985 on this, but you can go back into the 50s and find physical fitness testing between boys and girls showing that boys do better on tests of muscular strength, muscular endurance, aerobic fitness, girls do better in flexibility. And again, so I'm not cherry picking, and this is from ac across the world, right? Um, now people are going to criticize that and they're going to say, well, that's fitness testing. And as we heard Ross say, yeah, VO2 max is not the end all be all. Muscle strength is not the end all be all. We have all been there when we're like, I know I'm better fit than that person. They still beat me. At least I say that to myself when I lose like a local 5k or something like that. Right? So that is a valid criticism. I do think it's interesting that we look at adults and say, oh, males can outperform females. And here's the fitness testing data that substantiates that. So when you take children and say children have physical fitness testing advantages, people dismiss it as that there's not competitive advantages, but whatever. All right, so this is from the Nebraska 2023 USA Track and Field Junior Olympics. And so I've got the events lined up there on the bottom. I've got the medal count set up on the top. You can see it split for eight and under and the nine and 10 year old group. Now they didn't compete head to head, but if they did, taking the boys times or the boys distances compared to the girls time and the girls distances, not a single girl in the eight and under group would have gotten a medal. I think this is an important point that we're getting to here. If those eight and under girls didn't medal, how many are coming back the next year? 
for that track and field competition. All right, if we look at the nine and 10 year old girls, okay, one gold medal out of eight, all right? And three silvers and two bronzes. Out of 24 total medals, the girls would have gotten six. That indicates to me that there's an advantage there. Now, people might look at that and say, well, that's just Nebraska, right? <laughs> um, Nebraska's marketing campaign for the state two years ago was Nebraska. Honestly, it's not for everyone. <laughs> all right, so let's go to Arizona. All right, so we've got this challenge going on in Arizona right now. So same event, this is the Arizona 2023 Junior Olympics. All right, look at the eight and under group. Okay, we would have had a girl getting a bronze medal in the 200, a bronze and a silver in the 400. Otherwise, eight and under, no girls getting gold medals, most of the medals going to the boys. Look at the nine and 10 year old group. Again, there would be a tie in the long jump for a gold medal. The only gold medal a girl in the 10 and under, or nine and 10 year old group would have received. Otherwise, three bronzes. So again, it looks to me like we're seeing ad evidence of a competitive advantage, or maybe we should say category advantage, John, all right, for males. Well, again, people might say, well, that's just Arizona, all right? I don't know what Arizona's marketing motto is, all right? So let's go to the 2023 USA Track and Field National competition. Now, a caveat here, right? how many people are going to take their seven or eight or nine year old child across the country to compete in a track and field competition? So this is one of our challenges with the children's medals and everything, but we still look at this, and yes, we see a little more representation for girls in the medal count, but still, out of 24 medals, the girls would have gotten five in the eight and under group and would have gotten five in the nine and 10 year old group. We're seeing the boys would have gotten 80% of the medals that's indicative of me that there's some kind of pattern here. I'm not sure I can figure out what that pattern is, but there's something, right? Well, people might also look at that and say, well, those are just individual years and doing the medal count, maybe that's not a scientific analysis of it. Again, a valid criticism. So um, I took the USA Track and Field Junior Olympics from Nebraska from 2016 to 2023 calculated the average throwing distance. I just put it together to kind of simplify the graph for shot put and javelin um, for boys and girls. Average boys were throwing 55% farther than average girls. That was statistically significant. The t-test on that was p less than 0 0.000000, right? I, there, you go to scientific notation to get that, all right? Same thing for the nine and 10 year olds. And the furthest throwing boy was 30% further than the furthest throwing girl, right? Both, and that was in the eight and under, and look in the nine and 10 year olds, still 10% more for the furthest throwing boy than the furthest throwing girl. Of course, you've got an N of one versus an N of one, so N of two total, you can't do stats on that, but still numerically different, all right? Well, what about jumping? And again, the same thing, we still see that the average boys were jumping further than the average girls in the eight and under group and the nine and 10 year old group, all right? And the furthest jumping boys were jumping further than the furthest jumping girls. Here again, you might say, well, that's Nebraska. It's not for everyone. So I d went to athletic.net, got the data for all of the top 10 boys, top 10 girls in all of the running events they did. So 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 meter, 800 meter, 15 and 1600 meter um, for five years. And again, lined them up, analyzed them statistically. The average boys in those top 10 were faster than the average girls. The fastest boys were faster than the fastest girls. Statistically significant when you look at the group. And again, 9% faster overall through all those running events for the fastest boys, 6% faster for the fastest boy in the nine to 10 year old. Starting to see something here, all right? We see the physical fitness testing, we see the individual years. Now we're starting to see statistically there's a difference between boys and girls before puberty, all right? And so if we look at the USA track and field youth records, all right, I'm gonna call out the media on this one. Every one of these bills that has been brought up in the United States in a legislative meeting, somebody in the media should have been grabbing this. This is on the internet, this is simple to find. And you look at this record, the boys are faster than the girls in every event. The boys are throwing further than the girls in every event. These are the records, right? But instead, somebody's not doing their job in getting this information out. All right, now, lest you think this is only a United States thing, all right, so we can also look at it, Australia, all right? See the same pattern in Australia. The numbers might be a little bit different, 
But again, the boys are faster than the girls. The boys are running and, or sorry, jumping and throwing further than the girls when you look at the records. I'm sure you can find this in other countries, in other places. It's harder to find. A challenge with these records, I don't understand, the records from Australia hasn't been updated since 2016. The records from the United States haven't been updated since 2019. I understand the challenges with verifying all this stuff, but I don't know, conspiracy theory in me is starting to raise you know, some questions on why they're not updating these records. Um, I want to thank boysversuswomen.com, great website, Jake Teeter there. All right, um, and so this is a graph that he has put together pulling data from all over the place. I mean, he has compiled dozens of different sources of international data and combined it all to look at the average male advantage across 11 track and field events before puberty through 80 years old. And you see consistently at every age, males are outperforming females, right? Um, you see a little dip there where the difference gets smaller and that coincides with what they call peak height velocity, which you might call the gro um, growth spurt. Typically, girls hit peak hike velocity. They're growing the fastest at age 11 and a half. That's when you'd actually see body height come close to normal between, or close to equal between boys and girls. But then at age 12 and a half, boys are at peak hike velocity. And then you see that acceleration, just that turbocharging of the difference between males and females. But again, we see it, we see it in Nebraska, we see it in Arizona, we see it in the United States, we see it in Australia, we see it worldwide. Boys have athletic advantages before puberty. Looking at USA Swimming, Right? Which again, swimming, I, I'm not as much on my swimming science as I should be. Actually, Kim probably knows more of swimming science than I do. But again, look at the USA Swimming records. Now, USA Swimming only lists records for 10 and under, but the boys have the records in 18 out of 22 events by roughly 2%. Girls were faster in four events. Again, when you see one sex has the record in 82% of the events, you should think something's going on there. Maybe sex matters. And so, yes, some girls are faster than some boys. It's unquestionable. But on average, the fastest boys are faster than the fastest girls. The average boys are faster than the fastest girls, right? Yes, some girls are stronger, you know, shown in jumping distance or throwing distance than some boys. But on average, the average boys are outperforming the average girls. The fastest boys are outperforming the fastest girls. All right? Now, these differences are smaller than before puberty. No question about it. We're talking a three, five, maybe 10% difference, much smaller than when you're looking 10, 20, 30, 40% differences after puberty. But the differences are there and the differences are consistent. And again, in athletics, small differences really matter. The question is, why are these differences present before puberty? One question, does it matter? One of the attorney generals from one of the states that I've worked with said to me from a policy standpoint, it doesn't matter why that difference is there. There is a male versus female difference. That's what matters. Explaining it physiologically isn't the important thing. I don't know enough about the law to say that that's correct or not, but okay. So before puberty, men have about 10, or sorry, boys, before puberty, males, boys have about 10% more lean body mass than girls. Lean body mass, which is largely muscle mass, that's the engine that drives athletic performance. The skeleton, that's the frame and the body work. The heart is the fuel pump, right? It all comes together. The lean body mass is really the big engine. If we see a 10% difference in lean body mass favoring the males, we would expect they should have an athletic advantage, all right? There are slight differences in the pelvis shape between boys and girls at eight years old. Slight width difference in the, um, Sorry, I have to remind myself there, the ischium and the acetabular regions. So basically the ischium is the part you sit on, the acetabular regions, that's the hip socket. Differences between boys and girls that would favor boys for better running mechanics or faster running mechanics. I shouldn't say better, right? It's all good, it's just some are faster, right? Favor for longer jumping performance. There are slight but still present differences in lung size, lung function, there's debate whether how much lung function influences athletic performance, but the higher VO2 max in boys is supported by a higher maximum minute ventilation, right? And slight differences in cardiac function favoring boys before puberty. So we can explain those differences physiologically. Now, of course, people are gonna come back and say these are social factors, right? Well, if they're social factors, how is allowing trans girls into girls' sports going to alleviate those social factors? 
I don't know how allowing a male body into female sports is going to suddenly erase social factors that disadvantage female bodies. All right? And so I wish I could take credit for that top quote that female athletes are not simply smaller or less muscular males. Um, that was McManus and Armstrong in 2007, or sorry, 2010 on their paper, Physiology of, Le of the Elite Young Female Athlete. Um, but it, it, the, those differences are present before puberty, all right? And then I think we all know this, but it's kind of crazy we have to say this. Boys and girls are different before puberty. It's not like at puberty suddenly a boy grows testicles and a penis, right? And a girl grows a vagina. They're there beforehand, all right? Puberty doesn't make a girl grow a uterus, all right? Changes how things work a little bit, but the anatomical differences are there, and so are the physiological differences. Smaller, but present. Which brings up the question of puberty blockers. And again, I think this was well addressed earlier. I do have two particular studies I want to point out on puberty blockers. Um, but the bottom line on this, we have no idea how puberty blockers affect physical fitness or how they affect sports performance. The research hasn't been done. I'm, I don't know that I could do the research, honestly. I, I don't think I could ethically for myself, let's take an 11-year-old block normal healthy puberty and see how it changes their push-up performance. Just couldn't do it. All right, so the first paper, this is actually from 2018, this is Claver, and they looked at trans girls, trans women, basically over eight years of puberty blockers and then the cross-sex hormones before treatment. Now notice that about 14 and a half years old is when they started puberty blockers on these children. Um, the trans girls, trans women, male bodies had more lean body mass. They were on puberty blockers for two years, and you see a reduction in lean body mass, but still had more lean body mass than comparable girls, comparable females. At age 22, so basically eight years of puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones, the male bodies still have more lean body mass. And lean body mass is very important for athletic performance. And then Ross mentioned this paper earlier today. This one just came out this year, um, where they looked at growth in body height from the start of puberty blockers to, the, to age 22, basically. Um, so the white line there, that's showing the projected growth, which it's an estimation, right? You put some factors into an equation, you get an estimate of how they should grow. And then the yellow line there represents the measured growth. This particular paper, and this is the only one we've really got on this in trans girls, there's an accompanying paper looking at trans boys that shows basically the same thing. It looks like puberty blockers slowed down growth in height. But once they were then put on, in this case, estrogen, growth accelerated. And so by age 22, they were the same height as they would have been, at least estimated, without any puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. Right? Um, I think it was in Jurassic Park, right? Life finds a way. <laughs> I think life finds a way, right? Um, now, again, can we say conclusively, oh, well, lean body mass, improved sports performance? Well, yes and no. Right? I mean, we know lean body mass is an advantage. We know body height's an advantage. And the bottom line is we don't see the erasure of the male advantages in lean body mass and body height. Right? Those are not eliminated. So really three closing points here. The first one is that there are important biological differences between males, boys and men, and females, girls and women. And those differences are present before puberty. Right? Second important point, the sex-based differences give males inherent athletic advantages, right? even before puberty. And the current evidence indicates that having a transgender identity with or without puberty blockers, testosterone suppression, estrogen administration, cross-sex hormones doesn't seem to erase the male athletic advantages. Therefore, female sports should be for females only. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. And again, Mara, I'm sorry about the spilled Pepsi. And thank you, everybody. I'll turn the time over to Mara. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I want to thank Kim and Marty for inviting me to speak at this conference, and I want to thank everybody in the room and everybody listening online uh, for everything you're doing to defend fair and safe sport for, for females. Um, as an athlete, I've faced many challenges 
like trying to run 26.2 miles really fast. Uh, <laughs> but I have to say the challenge I face right now is the biggest yet, namely keeping a room full of conference goers who are thinking about a delicious meal and alcoholic <laughs> drinks, uh, awake and paying attention. Uh, this is going to be quite difficult for me, but bear with me, I'll do my best. Um, so by way of brief introduction, um, I became a full-time elite athlete in distance running at the age of 33, which obviously is very old uh, by elite athlete standards. Um, before that, I spent many years as a grassroots level athlete, so through school, teenage years, as a student, and then while I was working as a diplomat. So my development pathway from beginner to elite was very long, 24 years in total. Um, I had a dream to become an Olympic athlete or a, a world-class athlete when I was 11 years old, uh, watching the LA Olympics. And it wasn't until 24 years later that I stood on the start line of an Olympics in Beijing in 2008. So I hope that shows you that the development pathway is tough, it's long, it's important for reaching elite level. Um, my personal best in the marathon is 2.23.12. And <laughs> um, to follow on from the Jamaican goddesses in running that we heard from Ross about, um, in 2009, when I ran that time, I was ranked second in the world in women's road running. But in that year alone, the number of males who ran faster than me was at least 1,300. So I hope that fact in, a, in and of itself shows you why the female category must exist. Um, one of the things which gave me a dream to be an elite athlete when I was watching the LA Olympics was Daley Thompson winning the decathlon. Uh, he's chief turf of the male athletes in the UK. Thank you, Daley. <laughs> um, so he was my hero, and I had posters of him on my wall. And, um, but strangely enough, it was him that nearly derailed my development pathway before it even got going, because after he won his gold medal for the second time, he came to Oxford, which was where I was living, to sign autographs. So I went along as an 11-year-old by myself, and I had very short hair, and I waited patiently, and I got to the desk, and I said, can I have your autograph, please? And he said, how are you, young man? <laughs> <laughs> and so this was nearly 40 years before the, the verb misgendering even existed. <laughs> uh, so this was my first experience of misgendering. And I sobbed all the way home. Uh, <laughs> but I, I forgave him. And uh, daily, if you're listening, you're still my hero. So, yeah, anyway, I got over the misgendering. And bizarrely, here we are, Daly and I are now on Team Turf trying to help defend the female category all those years later. So the key message I want to emphasize today is this, that women and girls... Can you still hear? Yep. <laughs> women and girls uh, deserve fair and safe sport um, at all levels, not just at elite level. So that means grassroots level, junior, recreational, but also master's level. We haven't heard much today about master's level uh, sport, but this is really critical. It's not just about elite level female athletes. Um, and in order for females of all those ages and abilities to have fair and safe sport, there must be zero males in the female category. Females are different to males, as we all know, we're not hobbled males, medicated males, surgically or in any other way, altered males, and we're certainly not a level of testosterone. Um, we're simply a different sex to males, and therefore we must have a female-only category. Having spent my entire life doing sport of various kinds, it's always been very clear to me um, that the female category must be exclusively for females only, at all ages and all levels. I've therefore found it really quite shocking to hear several times the argument that goes, we must have fairness at elite level, but lower down we must prioritize inclusion. I've heard this from at least five very senior people in athletics who live and breathe athletics every day. 
what, what this argument says in reality is, yes, fairness does matter because we think we need it at elite level, but, but only for a tiny number of women who are good at sport. For women who are not that good at sport, they must accept some discrimination because the, female, the feelings of men are more important. And this is just completely wrong. Um, so let me just explain why I think it's wrong. The first reason is the development pathway. So as I said, it took me 24 years. It's a years, sometimes decades long process, um, pro progressing from beginner to elite. Um, I was part of a short film recently called The Inclusion Delusion. And if you haven't watched it, I strongly encourage you to do it. It's on YouTube. Um, and in that film, I said, no elite athlete is born elite. We all start as beginners, as children, and work our way up to the top. Um, and this, this journey takes a huge amount of hard work and sacrifice. Um, so I mentioned the dream I had at age 11. After that, I did many different sports as a child, never at elite level, um, although I did go to a swimming club until I was 15 years old. Uh, my parents woke up on countless early mornings to take me to swimming training and gave me many opportunities in sport. I didn't start running seriously until I was 18. And then I had to put running on the back burner for 10 years because I wasn't good enough to earn a living as an athlete and had to work instead. So I spent 10 years working and training, trying to progress my training to a level where I could stop working and earn a living as an athlete. Over many years, um, I made sacrifices, missed milestone family events, and, and had to forego other life goals to focus on training. Um, and of course, it wasn't just effort by me. Many people, including my family, friends, and others, helped me along that journey. When I towed the start line of my first Olympics, I was 35 years old, so quite old by athletic standards. And during all that time, 24 years, I could have been pushed off or fallen off that development pathway for any number of reasons, even though back then I was lucky enough to enjoy female-only sport, unlike girls and women today. There were, there were numerous occasions when I thought I'd reached the end of the road with that development pathway and I would just have to give up, but I, I persevered and eventually made it to Olympic level. Um, I just want to give you a few examples of how the development pathway can be so hit and miss. So I earned my first GB vest in 1997 uh, for the European Cross Country Championships. And I earned that place by a fraction of a second uh, because I dipped ahead of arrival on the finish line at the trials race. I got selected and she missed out. At the Europeans, I came 38th, which was nothing special. But being on a team with, with other good British athletes and good European athlete, around European athletes, that really opened my eyes to what I had to do to reach the top. My first attempt to qualify for a global championship in the marathon uh, ended in failure. So that was the April 20, 2004 London Marathon. I was trying to qualify for the Athens Olympics, but I finished seventh out of all the Brits, and I, I didn't get the qualifying time, so I didn't make it. But I crossed the finish line and thought, I just know I can do better than that. If I just keep trying, I can do better than that. So at my second attempt, I snuck in by eight seconds. I qualified by eight seconds. Um, and because of that, managed to go to the World Championships in Helsinki of, of 2005. Um, you've probably, you might have heard of an athlete called Paula Radcliffe. Yeah. <laughs> um, luckily for me, I was on her team. She finished first, and I finished 18th in that race. But since she won it, we managed to get a team bronze medal. <laughs> Um, also in that year, uh, 2005, I was the first athlete at the trials for the World Cross Country Championships not to be picked. Um, but then at the last minute, there was a withdrawal from the team, and I did get picked. So I was the last and slowest member of the team. But on the day, I managed to be the first Brit to finish. So this was a massive confidence boost. And again, it was an opportunity to hang out with elite athletes and, and, le and learn from them. Uh, in 2007, just before the World Championships, which was held in Osaka in Japan, I got the flu, but I managed to recover just in time um, and finished ninth in that race. 
Uh, but finishing ninth meant, meant I was the first athlete not to win any prize money. So this is, this is what it's like trying to earn a living as an athlete. You can be the ninth best athlete in the world and win nothing after running 26.2 miles. Um, in an event like the marathon, a lot of your income can be dependent on two or three days per year. Uh, obviously, if you have a kit sponsor, that is through the year, but competition is a big part of your income. Just before the Beijing Olympics, which is when I finished sixth, I had a bone stress response and I thought my Olympics was over. Uh, I had to rest for several days, which just before the Olympics is quite stressful. Uh, but I managed to race, thankfully, but it was very touch and go. Um, so I hope these examples show you how precarious it is. When you watch the Olympics or the World Championships or a big event, it all looks so fabulous and glamorous and the athletes look amazing and you know they do amazing things but actually there's so much hard work behind the scenes and so much of it is just precarious and you know when athletes fall off that development pathway we never hear about them again that's it we just don't see them so that brings me on to males competing in the female category which obviously destroys the development pathway for females uh, we saw recently that Hannah Arendsman quit cycling altogether after being shoved, like, deliberately, like, literally and metaphorically uh, by male Austin Killips at the U.S. Cyclocross Nationals. Um, and then at the Tour of the Gila, Killips won part of the women's prize money, which for the first time was equal to that for the men. So as a result of that, one or more female cyclists won less prize money because of his inclusion in the female category. So their path along the development pathway is more difficult with less money. Um, every time a male competes in, the, in women's sport, he takes from not one but many female athletes things of value which otherwise would help them to progress along that pathway, such as medals, points, qualifications, and so on. Uh, but also less tangible things like self-confidence and a feeling of self-worth. Right now, female athletes are being impeded and obstructed and pushed off that development pathway by males. I want to give you an example from the recent World Para Athletics Championships. Obviously, this is elite level, um, but it illustrates very well how the effect of males in the female category uh, on, on female athletes... So Valentina Petrillo from Italy ran in the uh, 200 and 400 at this championships in the T12 category for visually impaired athletes. Uh, he's a 49-year-old male, and I've read in the press that he's a married father of two as well. Um, and in the 200, so he won bronze medals in both events. In the 200, uh, Indonesia's Ni Made Arianti Putri did not advance from the semi-final into the final. Um, sorry, did not advance from the heats to the semi-finals. And Spain's Melanie Gámez did not advance to the final. In the 400, Brazil's Lorraine Gomez did not advance to the final. And Morocco's Fatima El Idrisi finished fourth and did not win the bronze medal. These are all direct consequences of Petrillo's inclusion in the female category. In addition to that, most of the women in both events finished in a worse finish position in the heat semis and finals. Furthermore, the, if Petrillo had been competing in the category of his sex at birth, he would not have qualified for these championships. The men's qualification in the 400s was 54.5 seconds. His PB is 58 point something, so he would have been three and a half seconds which is a long way in 400 meter running outside the qualification standard. And in an interview with the BBC a few years ago, he said, it's better for me to be a slow, happy woman than a fast, unhappy man. And I mentioned this to a family member a couple of days ago, and he said, actually, it's the opposite of that. As a woman, he's fast, and as a man, he's slow. Um, so this is another example of Black is white, up is down. You know, it's, it's complete 180 of, of the truth and reality. He also says, I don't feel like I'm stealing anything from anyone. 
Um, but those, those female athletes I've just listed have, have had that things stolen from them. Um, so coming back to my development pathway, if at any point in those 25, 24 years it took me to reach the Olympics, I'd had to face unfair competition against one or more males. I'm certain that, like Hannah, I would have quit, not just the pathway, but sport altogether. So to anyone listening um, who is enabling males competing in the female category, I ask you this. Where do you think elite female athletes of the future are going to come from? We've already lost Hannah Rensman and countless other women who none of us will ever have heard of. So do you want all women on the development pathway to elite level to quit before you protect the female category and remove males from it? Another point I want to make about the development pathway is that it must have, you must have fairness and, and safety for female athletes across all sports. So I only began running really seriously at age 18 when I went to university. I didn't do anything of note during my childhood, never competed at even county level, never mind regional or national level. Instead, I did a lot of other sports, including swimming, hockey, netball. And doing these sports laid the foundations uh, for my later career as an endurance runner. So for me to stay on that pathway uh, to Olympic level required all of those sports to have fair and safe competition. If any of them had allowed males into the female category, I certainly would have quit. And this isn't just about competition. Um, the swimming pool where I did all my training is called the Ferry Centre in Oxford, and it's now under pressure from the City Council, which passed a trans-inclusion motion a few months back, uh, that it must have gender-neutral changing rooms. So as a small girl going to swimming training many times a week, if I'd had to set eyes on a naked male in the changing rooms without my consent, as Riley and the other swimmers have had to, I, 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 just, I certainly, or, or even just the knowledge that at any moment a male could walk in and there was nothing I could do about it, I certainly would have quit. And beyond the actual experience of being naked around males, the message this sends that you and your safety, privacy, and dignity don't matter would have had a really appalling effect on me. I'm certain of that. I just don't understand why we're forcing women and girls in sport to share spaces where they're vulnerable with males, given that we know that males are responsible for over 90% of sexual and violent crimes. Um, so we now have a situation where some sports have protected the female category, while others haven't. And girls and young women who enjoy sport or have aspirations to go far in sport and their parents will be watching carefully to see which sports protect them and which throw them under the bus. And why would any talented, sporty young woman in the US now, deciding which sport to focus on, choose cycling, in which there are over 50 men competing in the female category? I know that the UCI has now acted to protect the female category, but we're yet to see what USA Cycling will do. So sports which enable these men are literally killing their own sports for women. And keep in mind also that mothers uh, are key to deciding what their children do and how family budgets are spent. So if you push mothers out of sports, their children, um, both boys and girls, will leave too. So eventually, these governing bodies will be killing, killing their sports for men too. And I, I really don't know why any governing body would want to do that. So the second main reason why I think the, the female category must be female only at all levels and ages um, is this. In saying sport must, only, must be female only, only at elite level, um, what you're effectively saying to women and girls is, if you're good at sport, okay, you can have fairness, but for all others, tough. If you weren't so bad at sport, you might have got fairness. <laughs> but because you aren't very good, you have to earn fairness, unlike all the men and boys who, of course, get fairness at all levels. Uh, suck it up and just train harder is what we've heard before, and yeah, that's... You know, if you train harder, you might become good enough to deserve fairness. Um, um, if you haven't already seen it, I strongly recommend a 
little film called Train Harder by, <laughs> by um, Francis Aaron. His Twitter handle is at Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S, double A-R-O-N-U-K. It's his pinned tweet. He's got a little video about train harder girls. It's, it's very good. So what kind of message does this send to women and girls who are not elite? Uh, I hope you'll agree with me that it's an appalling one. It says that the feelings of men and boys are more important. You and your sporting activities have no value. Any aspirations you may have to reach elite level will be obstructed by men and boys because the governing bodies can't get their acts together to provide fair and safe competition for you. Men and boys, unlike you, will get fairness at all levels simply because they are male. We all know that without fairness, sport is nothing, and yet all over the world, sports bodies have thrown away fairness for females below elite level. I, again, this is something I just cannot understand. Um, beyond the message this sends to women and girls, there are practical issues also which make this a nonsense. So I want to give you an example of an event which shows this. Earlier this year, in the UK, we held a, an event called the English National Cross Country Running Championship. So cross country running, national championship. And in the senior women's race, there were 773 finishers. And in the men's race, there were 1,473 finishers. So if you haven't seen the start of a cross country race, it's quite something I recommend you have a look. It's, you imagine 1,400 men on one start line setting off running and 700 women, it's, it's quite something. So at the front of these races, they're elite athletes. I won this race in 1998, just after I raced for Great Britain at the European Championships, which I mentioned earlier. But at the back, they're absolutely not elite. Um, so, so where do you draw the line? You know, you, you can't. Elite and non-elite athletes are competing in the same race. In this year's senior women's race, a male finished well inside the top third, pushing more than 500 actual females down the finishing order into a worse result, and most of them will be non-elite. Do we say that this is fine because this male wasn't near the front, or do we say that over 500 non-elite women um, being bumped down is okay? Some of the women behind this male would have been elite masters athletes, and do they not matter? Uh, many women in this race wouldn't aspire to elite level. They race for enjoyment, for their clubs, and every one of those 772 women suffered unfair competition because of that male's inclusion. So now I want to talk about parkrun now. This is a, a good illustration of what happens if you allow gender self-ID uh, at grassroots level. So the Brits in the room will know what park run is, but for everybody else, it's a five-kilometer run in parks all over the UK, held every Saturday at 9 a.m. It's free, and it's run by volunteers, and it also exists in some other countries. Officially, it's not a race, but it has measured courses, timekeepers, official results in descending order of speed, records, categories, age grade percentage scores, and other trappings of competition. It's not licensed by UK Athletics. It's an extremely successful and much loved uh, grassroots phenomenon in sport. And massive numbers of non-elite women join it every week. But Parkrun allows gender self-ID. So this means that any male can just register as female and off they go. They have four categories, male, female, another gender identity, and prefer not to say. So, so here, here are some of the effects of this policy. So at least, at least two outright and 18 age group female course records are held by males. Many of these records are out of female hands forever, I, I estimate. One of these female age group records is faster than the men's equivalent record. <laughs> um, one of these trans-identifying males recently ran 10K. This is not at Park Run in a separate event. Nearly two minutes faster than the female winner in the same age group 
of the World Masters Championships 10K in March this year. Um, and many of the females who would have held these records um, are elite or former elite athletes. And all of them have been erased from being recognized as the real holders of these records. Males can retroactively change their gender to female at Parkrun. So by doing this, males could take female records with the click of a mouse. And there's nothing, not even training harder, that females can do about it. Um, an unremarkable male recently switched his gender from, from male to female, and on entering the female category, scored an impressive 90% age grade score, but for the same time in the male category, it would have been a fairly average 70%. Uh, this shot him up to the top of the park, that park runs age grade league, um, in much the same way as our friend Leah T Will Thomas shot himself up from mediocre male to winning an NCAA title. Um, but this, importantly, this park run policy now negatively affects males as well because the age grade league is a joint male and female league. So everybody gets a, an age grade percentage score, which is relative to the world record in your age group. Uh, so if you're very good, you'll be in the 90%, less good, 80%, and so on. Um, but it's a mixed league. So one of these males who is, who, who is participating in the female category is at the top of four age-grade leagues at different park runs. And in one of them, he's bumped down one of the UK's best ever athletes, who is a man, two-time Olympian, five times World Masters champion. So this man has been bumped down the age grade league by this male participating in the female category. Um, the notion that fairness matters at elite level but not lower down is also shown to be a nonsense if we look at age. Because in some sports, such as ice skating, swimming, and tennis, female athletes under 18, so minors, are the elite athletes. So do they get fairness because they're elite or not because they're minors. You know, you can't answer it. Similarly, for masters athletes, when I came sixth in the Beijing Olympics, I was a masters athlete. I was 35. Um, the other British woman, only one other British woman has finished sixth in the Olympics, and that was Priscilla Welch at the 84 Olympics, so a competitor of Lorraine's at that event. And she was 39 on that day. She held the British record and won the New York Marathon when she was 42. Kira D'Amato has just broken the US half marathon record at age 38. So if we say our oh, masters athletes don't deserve fairness, we're going to be throwing away achievements of elite athletes. So I want to talk a bit more about masters athletes now because I think they're the group who perhaps suffer most from males in the female category. Um, Many find themselves able to spend more time and energy on themselves after their children have left home. Um, but they'll never be elite, as in kind of open elite athletes at senior level, but many aspire to be elite masters athletes, and they're very competitive. But because many males who, tran who transition are in middle age, um, female masters athletes, as their rivals, really suffer. I know of numerous female masters athletes in the UK who've lost medals, records, podium places, better finished positions, and prizes to males in their category. One female masters athlete who's had to race against men for eight years contacted me last year on the point of quitting. And interestingly, she had spent time studying start lists of races to avoid races that men were competing in, exactly the same as what we heard from Holly earlier. Um, with my encouragement, she complained and thankfully has stayed in athletics and has become a vocal defender of the female category. But furthermore, female masters athletes have to train and compete despite the symptoms and effects of menopause, which of course no ma male athlete ever has to deal with. And if they want to take HRT with a minuscule amount of testosterone in it to relieve their symptoms, they can't because testosterone is banned in and out of competition under the WADA code. And WADA does not allow, as this is my understanding, WADA does not allow therapeutic use exemptions for testosterone for females. 
Um, but yet, the males who, who identify as women and compete against them can, quote unquote, forget their testosterone suppression medication uh, because there's really no robust testing system in place. In this context, I discovered recently that Kristen Worley, the Canadian athlete that we heard, from, uh, heard about from Linda Blade, managed to get a TUE, so born male, had surgery, then got a TUE for testosterone to compete in the female category. And yet, female athletes are not allowed TUEs for testosterone at all. Which, I mean, how do you square that one? I don't know. So in the UK, um, it is master's level female athletes who've suffered most from males in the female category in running. And thankfully, UK athletics banned post-puberty males from the female category at the end of March this year. And we thought that would be the end of it, but males have continued racing in the female category. Um, some of them, I think, are under the transitional arrangements which UKA provided, uh, which said that if they had been in full compliance with the previous testosterone expression rules and had entered races before the 31st of March, they could still compete. But here we are, we're nearly at the end of July. Last Wednesday, so three days ago, a male finished third in the female category. Sunday, a week ago, a male won a female category event. This is all recreational level running in the UK. I want to give you an example now about the numbers. So we hear that, um, you know, at elite level, it must be fair, but lower down, let's be inclusive. But the number of athletes competing at elite level is absolutely minuscule compared to the total number of female athletes competing. So let me give you an example. At this year's London Marathon, organizers said that the elite championship and good for age categories, so championship is the, is the good British athletes, good for age is the good masters athletes, that those categories were held under world athletics rules and that meant no trans identifying males in the female category. But when you look up the results, the championship and good for age runners are all just lumped in with the mass race. You can't distinguish uh, who were championship athletes and who were good for age athletes. They're all just lumped in with the mass race. And um, a trans-identifying male, Glenn Frank, calls himself Glenique when he feels like a woman, ran in the female category in London. So we know that this was in the mass race. We know from his participation that any man who says he's a woman is welcome in the female category in the mass race. Um, and London Marathon defended this as, and I quote, a unique celebration of inclusivity and humanity. So if you do the maths, so, sorry, so that means that only the elite women had male free fee, fair competition. There were 13 elite female finishers, and in the mass race, there were 20,197 finishers. That obviously includes Frank and any other males who were there. So if you do the maths, you arrive at a number of females who enjoyed fair competition on that day of 0.06%. <laughs> so, <laughs> how anybody justifies that, I, I just don't know. Um, we all know that girls and young women drop out of sport at alarming rates, especially teenage girls. Um, and this isn't just about sport, it's about physical and mental health, about the cost to all of us of promoting good public health. Um, and forcing women and girls at non-elite level to suffer unfair and unsafe competition simply makes the situation worse. So I hope that going forward, and if, any, if anyone listening is, has the power in a governing body or are an event organizer, have the power to uh, make rules about categories, I strongly urge you to ensure that it's going to be female only at all levels. Before I finish, I want to just address two or three points that we've heard in the last couple of days. So the first is, um, and in fact we saw it on one of um, Greg's slides just now, that the, the male-female performance gap increases with age. So once you're into the 40s, 50s, 60s, the gap is getting bigger. So when you hear things like, uh, 
the male-female performance gap in running is 10%, it's, in swimming it's 10 to 12%. It, that, that gap actually gets bigger with age. Um, and also, a friend of mine did some analysis on the London Marathon results this year and discovered that at elite and, and near elite level, the gap was 10%. But below that, the gap widened massively and it got bigger the slower the athletes were. So we heard from Ross Tucker that he doesn't want to do his presentation for a third time. <laughs> So um, it would be wonderful if he and Emma didn't have to do it again this time next year. Um, but I think we all want them to come back. So I, I would love it if they would address the increasing male-female performance gap, uh, which increases with age. The second thing I want to mention is we've heard a lot in the last couple of days about the physical effects, um, you know, the physical aspects of sport. Um, we haven't heard much about the psychology of sport. And, you know, mental preparation is everything in sport. And I, I spent a lot of work preparing myself mentally for racing to the point where I had a sports psychologist working with me and I wrote, with her help, a detailed pre-race routine of what I would do at every, every moment. And the, the time before a race, whether that's the 30 seconds before a race or the five minutes or an hour or 24 hours before a race, this time is so important for preparing yourself mentally. And over time, I developed a, a plan which worked for me to prepare myself mentally for what was coming, and it served me very well. When I hear about what Riley Gaines and her friends went through, you know, that time before a race, when you're supposed to be preparing yourself mentally, these young women had to think, am I going to face a male penis in the female changing rooms? You know, this does two things. Number one, makes them have that worry and that anxiety before a race, which they should never have had to deal with. But two, it distracts them from doing what they should be doing, which is mentally preparing for the race. So... Maybe that's another topic for next year's agenda. <laughs> so finally, before I finish, I just want to mention one, another topic which I think has not d had the attention it deserves, and this is coaching. So in, in the context of gender ideology. So let me give you an example. Supposing you're the coach of a women's soccer team or rugby team, and you discover that your, your team is going to have to play a team with a male on it, what do you do? Do you just go ahead and play the match as if nothing is different? Do you boycott the match? Do you speak to your athletes? If you speak to them, what are you going to say? If one of your female athletes gets injured, are you liable? So I think co there's a huge amount of, this, of gender ideology which affects coaching. Another thing I've noticed is trans-identifying males, well, certainly Killips and Petrillo, wear dangly earrings while they're competing. So as a coach... You know, is this, is this what elite performance is about now? <laughs> um, and Leah Thomas, one of, one of Leah Thomas's performances, I'm not sure if it was Ross or Emma, but one of them did analysis of his split times in one of the events. And it was absolutely obvious from these splits that he was sandbagging and then sped up in the last 50 meters, I think it was, of a 200. You know, what does this mean about coaching? You know... Are coaches now supposed to coach athletes to sandbag to make it all look normal? If you're the coach of a female athlete up against these, these male athletes, you know, how do you prepare your, your female athlete for that? And if we look at the Rio 2016 800 meters, there are three, you know, three athletes should have been on the podium and weren't. What about the coaches of those athletes? They have never been recognized as being the coaches of Olympic medal winning athletes. No, there's a loss, big loss for them as well. So I hope um, uh, Ross mentioned also um, that in cycling, um, it's, uh, everything is about power to weight. And I was thrilled to hear Catherine Deves talk about overweight males earlier. Because <laughs> ha having come from a sport where your body weight is everything, um, you know, power to weight is everything, to see overweight males 
competitive and winning in female events just makes me so furious <laughs> because this is not elite performance at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, pe people say, oh, you're fat shaming if you say overweight males. No, this is about physics. This is about carrying a mass over a certain distance. It's about elite performance. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's another agenda item. Okay, I'll stop there because I'm sure you're all very hungry. <laughs> Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go up now. I don't have anything more to say. I just want to say thank you for all paying attention and listening and being part of today. I look forward to welcoming you back to, for breakfast tomorrow at 8 for a shortened day that we will not go over because people have planes to catch. So thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay.